Novel title, Modern Weapon Cheats Travel Through a Fantasy World by Author, Tomahawk. Raw Source, https colon slash slash n 7244 bl slash volume 04 volume 04 chapter 01. On that day, in a dimly lit chamber at the headquarters of Prabem on the mainland, Operators oversaw and organized the incoming status reports from various units by manipulating consoles. Strategic Bombing Squad, Ground Invasion Force Deployment Complete, the final launch sequence of Kerovno's Staff of God, on low orbit has been completed. Master, your orders, Catherine, confirming that all preparations necessary to initiate the counteroffensive were in place, pressed Kent for action. From this moment forth. We commence Operation Vermilion. Kent, who had been sitting with crossed arms and closed eyes, snapped them open and issued the command. Instantly, the soldiers numbering in the hundreds of thousands who were participating in the operation sprang into action. All units, receive orders, Operation Commencing. Repeat, Operation Commencing. Commence Operation Maneuvers. All gates open. Sequential launch of SRBMs. IRBMs, ICBMs from launch port number one onwards. Simultaneously with the commencement of the operation, hundreds of ballistic missiles, each loaded with either conventional or special warheads, were launched from underground silos in Paribem, soaring into the sky. Confirmation of all ballistic missile launches, estimated time to target impact, approximately 10 minutes, the sight of countless ballistic missiles erupting from the underground, soaring into the sky evoked images of Armageddon, the final war confirmation of mass projectile separation from care of nose, rocket booster ignition, error correction, right 0.2 degrees, no abnormalities in entry angle or velocity, time to target impact, 20 seconds, following the ballistic missile launches, a mass projectile measuring 10 meters in length, 50 centimeters in diameter, and weighing 500 kilograms, made of a tungsten and titanium alloy, detached from Karavnos floating in low orbit, equipped with large propulsion rockets, aimed at the Empire's fortress weapon, gaining momentum as it descended. As the mass projectile entered the atmosphere, its tip ignited in a fiery red due to friction with the air. However, coated with the same heat-resistant tiles used in space shuttles, the projectile's tip continued its descent without melting from atmospheric friction. Huh? What's that? What's wrong? The sentries of the aerial fortress noticed the descending object from the sky, but by the time they realized it, it was too late. The mass projectile, accelerated to Mach 10 by the propulsion force and the planet's gravity, struck the aerial fortress, which was moving within Imperial territory. Piercing through the magical barrier that the aerial fortress had constantly deployed, the mass projectile's impact on the fortress's main body generated an immense shockwave comparable to a nuclear explosion, instantly destroying the upper structures of the aerial fortress. Having shattered the upper structures in one blow and leaving the aerial fortress in a semi-destroyed state, the mass projectile continued its descent, embedding itself into the ground with a deafening roar and scattering shockwaves carving a massive crater into the earth, transforming the surrounding area into a wasteland. With just one shot from the mass projectile, the aerial fortress lost all its functions and became nothing more than a floating island. Thirty seconds after the projectile hit, due to the fatal damage sustained by the fortress's support base, the fortress itself couldn't withstand its own weight, splitting in half from the center, continuing to collapse and explode on a smaller scale as it fell to the ground. The moment it touched down, the magic reactor exploded. In a tremendous explosion, the aerial fortress vanished without a trace, along with the thousands of crew members aboard, leaving no remains behind, erased from existence. Mass projectile, target hit. Confirmation of target destruction. Second round from Cerberus, detached. Rocket boosters ignited, 15 seconds until impact. Upon confirming the destruction of the airborne fortress by the mass projectile, the next round was immediately launched, and mass projectiles descended towards new targets. With astonishingly threatening force, the mass projectiles continued to mercilessly dismantle the Empire's fortress weapons one after another. Confirmed separation of warheads, re-entry bodies passing through the atmosphere. As Cerberus, the new weapon, 
steadily achieved success in combat, ballistic missiles with conventional and special warheads began re-entering the atmosphere, raining down on fortress weapons under construction across the Empire. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. All rounds hit the target. The sight of re-entry bodies streaking through the sky, trailing beams of light, seemed to embody a kind of divine majesty. Gee God, W what the hell is this? What's happening? I don't know, but run. If you don't want to die, run. But where can we run? Imperial soldiers, suddenly under attack, could only flee in confusion as re-entry bodies rained down from above, each explosion claiming more lives. By the way, as the ballistic missiles rained down almost throughout the entire empire and exploded upon hitting their targets. Occasionally, unfamiliar scenes were observed. Confirmation of detonation of MA rounds. Currently unable to discern abnormalities. While conventional warheads on various ballistic missiles simply exploded upon hitting their targets, the new type of bomb developed by Parabem scientists utilizing theories of magical runaway reactions and constructed from scratch as an alternative to nuclear bombs, the Matter Annihilation Bomb, or MA Bomb for short, upon detonation, emitted a pitch black flash along with a jet black fireball, which proceeded to disintegrate and annihilate all matter engulfed within it. Although the size, damage radius, of the fireball was relatively small, with a diameter of 50 meters, it not only disintegrated and erased all matter within its reach but also, at the moment the fireball vanished, created a vacuum, due to the disappearance of air, causing a tremendous storm-like blast as air rushed in, inflicting secondary damage to the surroundings. MA bomb's effect is significant. 60% of enemy fortress weapons destroyed. We will continue the assault. Thus, Thanks to the effective performance of the new weapons, all confirmed fortress weapons within the Empire were destroyed within a single day. Confirmation of the Vermilion Operation's commencement. We will now initiate bombing against the Empire. Roger. Upon receiving the orders for the Vermilion Operation, the Strategic Bombing Squadron, consisting of B-52 Strata Fortress, B-1 Lancer, B-2 Spirit, C-130J Super Hercules, C-17 Globemaster 3, C-5 Galaxy, to 22M, to 95, to 160, and 124 100 Ruslan, and 225 Mraya, and others, penetrated into the Empire's airspace. Following the attacks of Cerberus and various ballistic missiles, thorough reconnaissance by Parabem's reconnaissance unit, disguised as adventurers, travelers, and merchants, meticulously identified the locations of military bases and facilities. With this information, the strategic bombing squadron, hovering over their targets, meticulously opened their bomb bays. Bombs loaded within the bomb bays or attached to pylons beneath the wings, as well as large bombs loaded in cargo holds, were sequentially released. Within moments of the bomb drops, the seeds of death sown upon the ground blossomed into crimson flowers, unerringly claiming lives below. The sprawling crimson blooms on the ground swiftly consumed the soldiers of the Empire, who had been living their usual lives. In the blink of an eye, the soldiers were overwhelmed by the fiery red petals, churning out casualties incessantly. Military bases and facilities subjected to carpet bombing by various bombs such as unguided bombs, guided bombs, guided by reconnaissance units on the ground, napalm bombs, etc., were annihilated in an instant. Furthermore, the military facilities were obliterated by large bombs dropped from transport planes, tactical nuclear weapons, and bombs such as BLU-82-B, also known as Daisy Cutter, with the explosive power mistaken for a tactical nuclear explosion, and GBU-43-B, MOB, Massive Ordnance Air Blast Bomb, nicknamed the mother of all bombs, which is said to have four times the power of the MOB, and Russia's at BIP Thermobaric Bomb nicknamed the father of all bombs, possessing historically unprecedented destructive power as a conventional weapon, blowing enemy facilities into smithereens in a single strike. Confirmation of complete destruction of enemy facilities. We will now return. HQ, understood. Sigh. It's over safely. But enduring continuous bombings from hundreds of bombers and transport planes for two weeks straight must be quite a trial for the enemy. A pilot, Having completed the bombing of enemy facilities, quietly expressed sympathy for the enemy who would now face days of hardship ahead. Within the Imperial Fortress, 
located closest to the fortified city of Nassist. Preparations for the impending invasion were underway with meticulous care. Weapons, provisions, and magical artillery were steadily transported into the fortress in anticipation of the upcoming battle. Hey, have you heard about the plan for the next battle? Yeah, I heard. It's something about a mage named Rinya, a favorite of His Majesty the Emperor, devising the strategy. That's the gist of it. But you won't believe the strategy they've come up with. It's absurd, relying solely on sheer numbers and determination. And they expect us to scavenge everything we need from the enemy. Ridiculous, isn't it? Well, looting enemy resources during a war is expected, but relying solely on that seems insufficient. I mean... Calling it a strategy based on sheer numbers and determination? Hardly seems like a strategy at all. Exactly. As the soldiers stationed in the fortress conversed during their idle moments, a lookout stationed on the tower noticed something. Hey, something's coming towards us. What? What is it? What's going on? In response to the lookout's warning, all the soldiers in the fortress simultaneously looked up at the sky. What in the world? Their gaze fixed upon a massive object hurtling towards the fortress. Hey! Isn't that bad? If it hits here, run for it. As the soldiers finally grasped the severity of the situation, a gigantic object hurtling straight towards the fortress, it was already too late. The moment the object, tearing through the air, struck the fortress, a deafening roar engulfed the area. The accumulated weapons, soldiers, and structures were blasted into smithereens, enveloping the fortress in a cloud of dust and debris that soared high into the sky, shrouding everything in its wake. Once the dust settled and the smoke cleared, a colossal crater marked the spot where the fortress once stood, leaving behind nothing but rubble and ruin. Report from the spotter aircraft. First round hit. The fortress has been obliterated by the direct hit of the shell. Good. That's a promising start, but it don't let your guard down. Hasten the loading of the next round. Yes, sir. Near the fortified city of Nassist, within the former Canary Kingdom territory, lay a network of railway tracks. On these tracks, a group of railway guns resounded with thunderous gunfire. Among them was the railway gun that had just pulverized the fortress with its formidable firepower. It was none other than the Dora, the world's largest railway gun constructed by the Third Reich during World War II. Adjacent to Dora were Gustav, its counterpart, and Paris gun a railway gun used by the German army during World War I. Furthermore, a short distance away from the tracks stood the P-1500 monster, an ultra-heavy tank armed with an 80 centimeters railway gun similar to Dora. Hurry up with the next round. What's the target and ammunition for the next shot? The next target is a fortress 70 kilometers ahead. Load guided shells. The 80 centimeters railway gun, extensively modified and improved by Paribim boasted an increased firing rate, while previously requiring approximately 1,400 personnel for operation and 4,000 support staff, advancements such as assault armor, powered suits, and unmanned artillery support systems had reduced the workforce to a mere 1,000 individuals. Additionally, with the introduction of GPS-guided rockets developed by Parabem's Ministry of Technology, the maximum firing range had extended to 250 kilometers. The ammunition used by the 80 cm railway gun consisted mainly of three types, the newly developed guided shells, conventional high explosive shells, and concrete piercing shells. The weight of the shell was a staggering 4.8 tons, with a maximum range of 48 km, containing 700 kg of explosive material. Upon detonation, it created a crater with a width and depth of 10 meters each. It was this shell that obliterated the fortress in a single strike. The bitten shell, on the other hand, boasted a range of 38 kilometers, with its main body made of nickel chromium steel and a nose cone crafted from aluminum alloy. With an explosive weight of 250 kilograms, it had the power to penetrate concrete walls up to 7 meters thick. In addition to these, older generation relics such as the railway guns, which had been upgraded, relentlessly bombarded the fortresses and strongholds of the Empire's defense line. Thus, with the barrage of heavy artillery shells, particularly from the 380cm cannons, the Empire's fortresses and strongholds were easily blasted away, one after another. From the second command post to HQ, approximately half of our units have already crossed the borderline, 
and the remaining half hour progressing as planned. Hey, hurry up. No dilly dallying. We need to reach the designated point before sundown, about 20 kilometers ahead from the location of the railway guns pounding the area, at the borderline with the Empire, M110 203mm self propelled howitzers. 2S5 Gvozdika 152mm self propelled cannon, 2A3 condensator 2P self propelled guns armed with 406mm cannons, 2S7 Pion 203mm self propelled cannon, and even the Carl self propelled mortars lined up to bombard the fortresses and strongholds. Meanwhile, on the ground, troops invading the Empire's territory raced through escorted by transport helicopters laden with soldiers and weapons, along with combat and attack helicopters providing support to ground forces, flying in formation, forming an extensive convoy. Ground troops carved tracks into the invasion route designated along the highways with 120,000 military vehicles, including tanks, armored vehicles, and self-propelled artillery, not relying on Kent's abilities but including vehicles produced by Parabem. The total force amounted to 300,000 troops. Additionally, apart from Parabem's 300,000 troops, approximately 30,000 soldiers and knights from the former Canary Kingdom's army also participated. Whoa, incredible. Amidst the advancing large units, a particularly conspicuous vehicle traversed. Hey, you lot, get out of the way. Quickly. Do you want to get crushed? Why, yes, sir. We apologize. Drawing the attention of the soldiers. The vehicle was a behemoth known as the Land Battleship, weighing 900 tons, with a length of 40 meters, width of 15 meters, and height of 14 meters, armed with a twin 28 centimeters turret as its main weapon. It also boasted two twin Bofors 57 millimeters cannons as secondary armaments, and three MK.15 Mod.31 CRAMs equipped with RIM 116 RAMs developed for close defense against aerial threats. Integrated into the close in weapon system, CIWS, serving as its close range defense. Functioning as the frontline command center for this counter offensive operation, the RAT was armored throughout with composite armor similar to that of the M1 Abrams. Its frontal and side armor reached a thickness of 300 mm, with even the top armor of the hull being 170 mm thick. Despite its formidable defense due to such thick armor, the rat's mobility was hampered by its immense size and weight. However, many soldiers viewed it as a reliable asset, with high expectations for its performance on the battlefield. Master, the battle report is ready. Show it to me. At the end of the first day of Operation Vermilion, as Kent breathed a sigh of relief, Catherine arrived with the battle report. Hm, no casualties on our side. And the enemy suffered heavy losses. The first day ended in our complete victory. As Kent's gaze fell upon the battle report, a smile involuntarily spread across his face. Targeting the entire empire simultaneously, Parabem's preemptive strike inflicted devastating losses upon the imperial forces within just one day. Key targets for the subsequent invasion, including the aerial fortresses and other fortress weapons, were utterly destroyed by the mass bombardment from above. Additionally, facilities producing magical weapons and automata suffered extensive damage from ballistic missiles and strategic bombings, with approximately 60% of all production facilities lost. Furthermore, fortresses and strongholds near their, former Canary Kingdom's, border were annihilated by artillery fire from railway guns and self-propelled guns, resulting in the disappearance of weapons, ammunition, and supplies amassed within and ultimately recording casualties of 100,000 dead, 300,000 missing, and 300,000 injured, both severely and lightly. The Elza's Magic Empire, a harsh realm of desolation and desert expanses where one third of the territory, comprising the imperial capital and the surrounding three seas, is engulfed in scorching heat by day and bitter cold by night, owing to its unforgiving climate. However, despite dwelling in such barren lands, the empire managed to expand its territories and thrive, thanks to the bountiful waters of the Nall River flowing through its domain and the immense inland seas known as the Three Seas, Zulo Sea, Killer Sea, and Tail Sea, resembling three dumplings skewered on a stick, which receive the blessings of the Nall River's abundant waters. By relying on magic, the empire overcame the challenges of its desolate terrain. Yet, 
Ominous clouds loomed over the very lifeline of the Empire's prosperity. The three seas, what shall we do? The enemy's massive fleet crossed the Firel Strait three days ago. If we don't act swiftly, they'll advance through the Nice Strait and enter the Killer Sea, in the port city of Unest, where the Imperial Navy's third headquarters is responsible for defending the Zulo Sea, the only sea among the three seas connected to the open ocean. A gathering of aristocrats, admirals, wore grim expressions as they deliberated on the course of action. However, even if we wanted to, locating and attacking the enemy within the vast Zulu Sea is no easy feat. Yes, indeed. For now, we're concentrating our fleet near the Nice Strait and our naval bases here, preparing for the enemy's arrival. But whether we can win, our only hope lies in our new armored ships and amphibious and airborne magical weaponry. But if, by any chance, we were to lose here, the only thing awaiting us is purging nobles of the Empire, tasked with annihilating the Parabem fleet in the Zulu Sea by direct order from the Emperor himself, pondered over how to defeat the formidable Parabem fleet. Say, won't our greatest and strongest fleet, the Invincible Fleet, which is tasked with defending the Imperial capital facing the Tail Sea, come to our aid? That's impossible, isn't it? You're aware, aren't you? The Invincible Fleet is directly under His Majesty the Emperor's command. If the Invincible Fleet were to come to the Zulu Sea, it would be after we are already dead. Realizing that their current forces alone stood no chance against the Parabem's massive fleet, the nobles acknowledged the grim reality and fell into silence. But still, even if our fleet here is a decoy, can't we divert more forces? That seems impossible. We must first crush the main enemy force advancing by land. Besides, fortunately, the areas around the Three Seas haven't suffered much damage, but we've heard reports of serious casualties elsewhere due to enemy ambushes. If we request reinforcements further, the nobles in the Imperial Court may suspect us of cowardice, causing unnecessary complications. Ah, indeed, we'd want to avoid the meddling of those raccoon dogs infesting the Imperial capital. A week had passed since the commencement of Operation Vermilion. Normally, the Empire would have resumed its invasion against the now defunct Canary Kingdom and the Demonic Alliance. However, due to the damage inflicted by the surprise attack of Brabem, launching an invasion seemed impossible. Instead, the Empire focused on forcibly conscripting troops across various regions to gather forces and counter the advancing ground invasion units that were successfully occupying several cities, exactly as Brabem had planned. What's that noise? As the nobles spent idle time in fruitless discussions, unable to formulate a plan, a loud, intrusive sound began to emanate, disrupting the atmosphere. Where's that noise coming from? It's grating. The nobles gathered in the conference room of the third headquarters, all furrowing their brows in unison in response to the increasingly loud and irritating noise. From outside, at that moment, a noble seated by the window drew the curtains blocking the sunlight, intending to investigate the source of the noise outside. Ark. As the noble peered outside, a long cylindrical object came into view, hurtling towards the window at subsonic speed, instantly crushing the noble's head upon impact followed by the detonation of a cruise missile, the BGM-109 Tomahawk, that had penetrated the conference room, annihilating all the nobles inside. Subsequent strikes from additional Tomahawk missiles caused the complete collapse of the third headquarters building. In the Combat Information Center, CIC, of the aerial battleship Eyes, which had been outfitted with modernized upgrades, voices of soldiers resounded as they launched Tomahawk missiles from the armored box launchers installed during the modernization. Tomahawk has hit the target. Target destruction confirmed. Input parameters complete. Preparations for the next round of firing have been completed. No signs of enemy counterattacks, it seems. All right, cancel the next Tomahawk launch. The remaining targets will serve as practice for the air squadron. Expedite the launch of carrier-based aircraft. Understood. Countering the onslaught of countless transport ships, Commander Sato Suzumu of the 1st Independent Raiding Fleet, tasked with clearing the way for the main fleet, swiftly shifted tactics from launching Tomahawks armed with submunitions at Ernest's naval base to airstrikes by carrier-based aircraft aiming to provide combat experience to pilots with no prior combat exposure. If we can sow even a little chaos in the enemy's command structure, it'll be worth it. 
Commander Sato had initially planned a surprise attack on the third headquarters to disrupt the command structure of the enemy navy while clearing the way for the main fleet. However, he hadn't dreamt of the significant success achieved by the previous Tomahawk attack, which had decimated most of the nobility responsible for defending the Zero Sea. Departure orders are issued. Hurry, launch the prepared aircraft sequentially. Roger that. Electromagnetic catapult ready, deck crews, affectionately known as the Rainbow Gang, dressed in attire indicating their roles, swiftly extracted stove, short takeoff vertical landing, F-35B Lightning is, armed with a variety of ordnance including MK-82, MK-83, MK-84, general purpose bombs, CBU-103, CBU-105 cluster bombs, etc from the weapon bays and three pylons on each side of the flight deck located at the rear of the ship's size and Hyuga. The outermost pylons were designated for air-to-air -air missiles, specifically AIM-9X sidewinders. Additionally, GORE-22-825mm cannon pods with stealth capabilities, an external mounting option, were affixed to the lower fuselage pylons. They were then promptly launched into the sky via electromagnetic catapults. Let's also conduct artillery training while we're at it. As he watched the F-35 BS soar into the sky and form formations over the fleet, Commander Sato muttered to himself. Thus, following the proposal of Fleet Commander Sato, the first independent raiding fleet bid farewell to the 30-strong attack squadron launched from the Eyes and Hyuga and increased fleet speed, setting course straight for Ernest. At last, it can finally fulfill its role as an aerial battleship. Yes, indeed. Historically, it met its end without ever seeing any real action. As Commander Sato conversed with his staff on the Bridge of the Eyes en route to Ernest, he expressed his thoughts. The fleet formation of the first independent raiding fleet, advancing with white caps in their wake, consisted of the aerial battleship Eyes as the flagship, sister ship Hyuga, the heavy cruiser Zoba and Kinu of the Oba class, the light cruiser Ijizu of the Nagara class, and the destroyer escort Congo and Kairishima of the Congo class, missile escort ships equipped with the Aegis system, along with five destroyers and three replenishment ships, totaling 15 vessels. Commander Eagle Eye on reconnaissance duty reports citing hundreds of military vessels departing from the port. Is that so? Wait, hundreds? Upon hearing the report from his subordinate, Commander Sato reflexively nodded slightly, but upon understanding the report's content, he turned back to his subordinate, show me. As the reconnaissance UAV Eagle Eye, with its high utility and long range, capable of high-speed movement and vertical takeoff and landing, transmitted the astonishing footage captured from Ernest's port, Commander Sato couldn't help but express his admiration. That's quite a number. They're really going all out. While watching the footage captured by Eagle Eye, showing a multitude of warships departing from Ernest's port one after another, Commander Sato wore a troubled expression. Yet somewhere within, a hint of satisfaction was evident. The enemy fleet includes numerous armored ships believed to be steam-powered. Besides wooden sail battleships, the attack squadron has arrived over Ernest, Commander. They're requesting permission to commence bombing on the port facilities of Ernest, as their bombs are not intended for anti-ship use. Understood. Acknowledge their request and relay it. Well, with this many of them, I wonder if we can handle them on our own. Ha. Huh. It seems we've stirred up a hornet's nest. Commander, perhaps we should request reinforcements from the main fleet? Please wait a moment. Despite their numbers. The enemy's ships are limited to wooden sail battleships equipped with cannons with a range of at most a few hundred meters and likely armored ironclads. We should be more than capable of dealing with them on our own. Exactly. I share the same opinion as the artillery staff. We cannot afford to miss this golden opportunity. As Commander Sato pondered whether to request air support from the carriers in the main fleet, the aviation staff proposed their views which were supported by the artillery and torpedo staff. Indeed. So, what's the plan? Well, our opponents might be lacking in skill. But it's a fleet showdown. Hurrah. Summoned by Kent and having had no chance to shine until now, the artillery and torpedo staff officers flashed smiles akin to children given a perfect opportunity. With just a single statement from Rear Admiral Sato, 
the strategy of the first independent strike fleet was set, pivoting towards the annihilation of the enemy fleet that had departed from Ernest's naval port. The enemy fleet seems to be heading west towards the Kunai Strait. The reconnaissance, steadfastly stationed over the enemy fleet, continuously transmitted visuals to the first independent strike fleet to the west. It's going to be a pursuit battle. Yes, but wait, are those ships in the air too? As Rear Admiral Sato and his staff officers observed the footage from Eagle Eye, the ships that had been sailing on the sea just moments ago suddenly unfurled large wings from their sides. Defying gravity, they ascended from the sea surface, rising into the sky. About a third of the enemy fleet ascended from the sea to the air, while the others, lacking the magical furnaces necessary for flight, struggled through the waves, desperately navigating the sea. We've received a transmission from the attack squadron, seeking permission to engage the enemy aerial vessels, grant permission for the attack. However, instruct them to return immediately after expending their sidewinders and machine guns. Depending on the situation, we might need them to sortie again. Understood, sir, as the attack clearance was given to the now unburdened attack squadrons. A swarm of F-35BS immediately launched an assault on the airborne enemy vessels. The Eagle Eye reconnaissance cameras captured scenes of sidewinders piercing armored ships, crimson flames erupting from their hulls, and battleships being riddled with holes by machine gun fire, swiftly plummeting into the ocean. Not much of a challenge. Indeed, it almost feels like we're bullying the weaker ones. In comparison to ordinary ships confined to the sea, the naval air hybrid vessels, capable of both sea and air operations, moved at approximately twice the speed when airborne. Yet, for the F-35BS currently launching attacks, this merely meant that their targets were sitting ducks. Thus, the pitiful ducks in the sky couldn't escape, being systematically shot down by the F-35BS. Enemy fleet spotted the lookout, peering through a large binocular, shouted loudly. It's finally time. Yes, several hours after the enemy fleet had departed from Ernest's naval port, the first independent strike fleet finally laid eyes on them. Now, prepare for naval bombardment. Naval bombardment ready. Although they had the enemy within range for a while, the first independent strike fleet had decided to eliminate them with artillery rather than waste expensive, high-performance missiles, summoned using cancer abilities, effectively at no cost. As soon as they spotted the enemy fleet, the fleet dispersed its formation and began individual engagements. First, the light cruiser Ijezu and five destroyers, Okizuki, Shimakaze, Suzatsuki, Hatsuzuki, and Shinzuki, accompanying the first independent strike fleet, engaged in fierce bombardment while increasing speed charging towards the enemy fleet like unleashed hunting dogs. Following them were the heavy cruisers Oba and Canoe. Enemy fleet at 12 o'clock, distance 10,000. Target, enemy battleships, ammunition, type 3 shells. Prepare for main battery firing, as the distance to the enemy fleet closed to an effective range. The captain of I is quietly issued orders. Prepare for main battery firing. I, sir, fire. Prepared for any eventualities. The eight warships apart from the three supply ships left behind for contingency, along with their escort vessels Congo and Kairishima, rapidly closed the distance to the enemy fleet. Eyes and Hyuga embodied the regal presence of battleships, commencing a simultaneous salvo of their massive main batteries, with a thunderous roar. The two 35.6 cm twin gun turrets on the bow unleashed flames at their tips followed by billowing black smoke engulfing the entire ship. Although shrouded momentarily in dense smoke, Eyes and Hyuga, sister ships, soon emerged from the smoke, revealing their imposing figures. Prepare for the next salvo. Let's finish this swiftly. Understood. While the Type 3 shells soared through the air, the crew hastily reloaded with the standard Zero Type shells. Commence attack with the first and second anti-aircraft gun groups, as the 835.6 cm shells flew towards the enemy fleet, followed closely by the 12.7 cm twin anti-aircraft gun rounds with an acquired angle, the countdown to impact began. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, impact now. With the heavy cruisers and below already engaging in assault, 25 battleships and armored ships were sunk. 20 were ablaze, and 30 had suffered various damages. Meanwhile, the Type 3 shells, designed for ground attacks, burst in the air, 
blocking the escape route of the fleeing Imperial fleet, raining down superheated shrapnel upon them. Hard to port, full speed ahead. We won't make it. Abandon ship, like meteors descending from the sky, the bright red fireballs, landing on the battleships and armored ships, immediately ignited parts of the vessels, swiftly engulfing them in flames, sealing their fate. Especially vulnerable were the wooden hulled battleships, which, once ignited, were beyond salvation. All guns, open fire. Individual targeting. Individual targeting. While Eyes and Hyuga surged forward at full battle speed attacking vessels from both sides, unlike the allied ships, which split into groups of four, avoiding the enemy fleet, they boldly penetrated the heart of the enemy formation, utilizing their originally equipped, improved 25mm triple mounted machine guns, SILs. in addition to the twin and single and two heavy machine guns mounted on the port and starboard sides and the bridge, as well as anti-tank missiles pulled from the arsenal such as the FGM-148 Javelin. They silenced the enemy ships in the midst of the sky ablaze with muscle flashes from anti-aircraft weapons. The 35.6 cm twin guns roared, occasionally reminding others not to forget their presence, as the Zero-type shells found their targets at point-blank range. Though not all shots hit, the shockwaves of the impacts, coupled with towering water columns, caused the battleships to list and capsize silently, sinking into the depths. It's done. Yes. Disappointing. Having unleashed the storm of iron like a typhoon, Eyes and Hyuga sliced through the center of the enemy fleet, leaving behind the wreckage of ships waiting to sink in flames. Now, let's return to our original mission, agreed. Having sunk 179 enemy ships without a scratch, the first independent strike fleet, satisfied with their victory, calmly resumed their volume 04 chapter 03. The gate known as the Gate of Ballard in the fortress city of Ballard stood wide open, with white flags erected throughout the city walls and castle, fluttering gently in the wind. White flags. Surrender, perhaps? Clad in type 3 forest camouflage fatigues with green and black Duran paints smeared generously on their faces, and with their trusty Type 89 rifles by their sides. The Parabem soldiers melted into the forest, murmuring as they observed the unmistakable signs of surrender. Sigh. Another bloodless surrender, huh? It feels anticlimactic. Fool, whether it feels anticlimactic or not, it's better to avoid unnecessary casualties and accept their surrender. Besides, who would want to fight us after seeing our strength? Well, yeah, but... Hey, Oki, you have a radio, don't you? Instead of wasting time chatting, report this to headquarters immediately. S sorry. To HQ from 1st Recon Squad, repeating, to HQ from 1st Recon Squad, requesting acknowledgement. Under the fierce gaze of their superior, veins pulsating on his forehead. The communication soldier hastily cut off the conversation with his comrades and reached for the manpack radio in a fluster. This is HQ, go ahead. The target fortress city has raised numerous white flags and opened all gates, over. HQ, acknowledged. Continue surveillance. First Recon Squad, understood. Continuing surveillance. Hidden in the forest just outside the fortress city, reconnaissance soldiers peered through binoculars confirming the multitude of white flags atop the castle and walls along the invasion route. After reporting this information to HQ, they continued their surveillance as ordered. A bloodless surrender, huh? How many times has this happened now? Well, prepare for the full deployment. 4th Infantry Battalion, lead the way into the city and negotiate with the Lord, and don't let your guard down. Surrender could be a ruse. Yes, sir. Understood. Following the information from the reconnaissance team, the Parabem Marine Corps 5th Division and Army 4th Division, except for a few rapid response units, began moving towards the surrendered enemy fortress city, maintaining combat readiness in the rear. But when things go too smoothly like this, it makes me uneasy. Ha <laughs> ha, that's just you worrying too much, is it, though? Yeah. It is. Let's just relax a bit more. Prepared for combat and leaving behind their constructed field fortifications. The Parabem soldiers chatted amicably while riding in vehicles during their movement, showing no hint of tension. As the Vermilion operation began and the merciless, one-sided attacks by the Parabem forces commenced, the Elza's Magic Empire swiftly lost nearly half of its military bases, 
Additionally, gathering troops near the border for a counterattack proved disastrous as the Empire lost one-fifth of its total forces in just one day. Unable to cope with the overwhelming Parabem forces advancing like an avalanche, the Empire found itself unable to defend against the invasion. As a result, the Empire split into several groups of divisions, marching through the Empire's territory, occupying numerous villages, towns, and fortress cities. Most notably, due to the avoidance of attacks on anything other than purely military bases and facilities to minimize civilian casualties, towns and fortress cities along the invasion route still retained a considerable defense force intact. Therefore, the Parabem forces, refraining from attacking, prepared for combat in the towns and fortress cities where they were welcomed, conducting extensive training in siege warfare and urban combat. However, in reality, Faced with the overwhelming Parabem forces, the lords of these areas quickly surrendered, fearing the consequences. Of course, not all lords surrendered willingly. Some with determination attempted futile resistance against the Parabem forces despite having few troops. However, their futile efforts were swiftly crushed, resulting in a dismal outcome. It's a welcoming atmosphere here too. Entering the surrendered fortress city after giving up resistance, Lieutenant Haruto Kairishima of the 7th Mechanized Infantry Battalion, Parabam Army 4th Division, formerly a member of the Self-Defense Forces and a division primarily composed of weapons and equipment from the Self-Defense Forces, glanced back from the interior of the lightly armored wheeled vehicle, observing people welcoming the incoming Parabam soldiers with open arms rather than hostility, lining the main street and waving enthusiastically. Oh, didn't the lieutenant know? This area used to be a small country that was conquered by the Empire ten years ago. So, to the people living here, we're somewhat liberators from tyranny, you could say, and they've probably heard rumors about our occupation policies to liberators. Huh. Well, it's grateful to be welcomed. But, just like the villages and towns we've passed before, this place doesn't seem very lively. Despite the welcome, as they passed through the urban area and entered the courtyard of the castle in the center of the fortress city, Haruto, gazing at the scarlet circle flag of Parabem flying atop the castle, continued the conversation. It can't be helped, Lieutenant Kairishima. When heavy taxes are imposed for war funds, and moreover, when a large number of men are taken away, it's natural for the liveliness to disappear and for things to deteriorate. I see. Excuse me. Lieutenant Kairishima, the battalion commander is calling for you. He wants you to come urgently. Understood. I'll go immediately, says Yumiya. I'm counting on you. Yes, sir, understood. Another summons from that woman, responding to the summons from the battalion commander. Haruto, with an irritated and displeased expression, raised his eyebrows at Lieutenant Akari, says Yumiya, his deputy, and entrusted the matters of the 5th platoon under his command to her following the soldier who came to fetch him. Oh dear. Lieutenant Kairishima is being summoned by the battalion commander again. He's definitely the battalion commander's favorite, huh? Ha ha ha, being popular is tough, huh? I envy him. Indeed, indeed. He truly lives up to his nickname as the Hari Machine, attracting numerous beauties and unconsciously captivating them. That's our platoon leader for you. It's never boring watching him. Ha ha ha. What's so funny? You lot, as the soldiers of Haruto's 5th platoon laughed, using Haruto as their amusement, Lieutenant Suzumiya, reaching for the holster containing a 9mm pistol, approached, huh? Um, I mean, Vice Captain, is it amusing that my captain is being summoned by that woman? And no, not at all. Then shut it and keep quiet. Yes, ma'am. What are they making such a fuss about? Anyway, as Haruto headed towards the commander's quarters, he could faintly hear his subordinates chatter from behind. Excuse us, Commander. Lieutenant Kairishima is here. I see. Well done. You may leave. Very well, then. She stood in the fortress city, where a large amount of equipment had been transported in, gradually beginning to function as a command post. Despite her actual age, she appeared even younger with her childlike face and short black hair and with a body so slender and small that it raised questions about how she became a soldier. Standing at only about the height of an upper elementary school student, Lieutenant Ishizuko Tobuki, known in the shadows as Lilai Colonel or Little Captain, 
had attracted enthusiastic support from some soldiers with peculiar tastes. When she noticed Haruto's arrival, she handed the documents she held to a soldier beside her. I've signed it, so I'll leave the rest to you. Understood. So cute. Handing over the documents to the soldier resembled a daughter helping her father. Yet Kotobuki was unaware of the amusement it brought to the surrounding soldiers. So, Colonel Kotobuki, what can I do for you? She's always so petite. As Haruto inquired, with disrespectful thoughts lingering, Kotobuki inexplicably frowned. Kairishima, have you been thinking something strange lately? Like about my height? Eh no, nothing of the sort. This is bad. I forgot how sharp this little one's intuition is. With a half-hearted tilt of his head and a glare from Kotobuki, Haruto sweated, regretting his mistake. HMPH. Well, never mind. You were probably just mesmerized by my dynamite body you pervert, trying to get through this situation somehow, Haruto fixed his gaze ahead, standing motionless, as Kotobuki, with a triumphant smirk, laughed defiantly, dynamite body, more like a flat one, right? Pfft. His own retort struck a chord, and Haruto couldn't help but burst into laughter, H hey, Kairishima, you laughed just now, didn't you? Eh no, I didn't laugh, don't lie, I heard you loud and clear, as Kotobuki, who would go berserk and beat up anyone who teased him about physical matters, started to get angry. Haruto panicked and quickly redirected the conversation. S so, Colonel Kotobuki, what can I do for you? HMPH. Well, I'll let it slide for now. But I'll definitely confront you about this later. With a grumble, Kotobuki tossed the documents to Haruto. All the details are written in there. Take a look later. Alright, it's a mission, then? Yeah, that's right. In short, your platoon is to scout the village halfway up that mountain. Kotobuki pointed outside the window towards the mountain as she spoke. So, is it a reconnaissance mission? No, reconnaissance is just a side task. The main objective is to distribute supplies to the villagers and win them over. I see, as per our strategy. Yeah, that's right. The Parabem army had been implementing various strategies to prevent rebellion and unrest in the regions under their control as well as to win over the populace. Among these strategies, the most prominent was the distribution of supplies, specifically, food. Currently, due to the repeated invasion operations across the empire, food prices had skyrocketed. Thus, the Parabem army's free distribution of food had successfully captured the hearts of the people. Understood, Colonel Kotobuki. We'll head out. With that, Haruto turned to leave. Wait, wait just a moment. Halting the retreating Haruto with a sharp command, Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka grabbed his sleeve tightly. I've told you before, haven't I? When there's nobody around, address me casually. A eh, and also, let's stick to the usual. No, today you better behave properly. This is an order. After confirming that all the soldiers who had been around had disappeared, Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka discarded the facade of a soldier and blushed fidgeting with embarrassment as he looked at Haruto with upturned eyes. Um, ah, Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka. Even if there's nobody else around, in a situation like this, 56. Ah, uh, I mean, Kotaka, 56, I said. Haruto, unwilling to address him informally, looked up at Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka with a resigned expression, resembling nothing less than a grade schooler reluctantly obeying. Fine, I get it. 56. HMPH. That's better. You should have done that from the start, you fool. Having coerced Haruto into calling him by his nickname, Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka smirked satisfactorily, muttering curses under his breath. Now then, let's. HMPH. Give me a break. I'm not a lilikan. Ugh. Haruto sighed deeply in his mind as Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka leaned forward, pushing his pale pink lips towards him. Growing impatient with Haruto's reluctance to comply. Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka urged him on. I guess I have no choice. Unable to escape with his sleeve being grabbed, Haruto reluctantly bent down. MMM. Forward again. As Haruto's lips touched his forehead, Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka let out a small, sultry sound, glaring at Haruto with dissatisfaction. That should do. Now let it go. HMPH. Well, I suppose that's enough for today. But, next time, say it properly, got it? Ha ha ha, understood, laughing it off. In response to Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka's declaration, Haruto walked over to his subordinates with the operational documents in hand. 
Upon returning to his subordinates, as Haruto approached, he was greeted by sub-lieutenant Suzumiya, who came trotting up quickly, her dark eyes staring at him intensely, sniffing the air as if trying to detect something, that woman's scent. Why, hey, why, but let's leave that aside for now, the road, not being paved, is tough. En route to the village, Haruto, riding in an armored car with additional armor, held onto his Kevlar helmet, tightly secured to his head, as the vehicle rattled violently up and down. For this reconnaissance and supply distribution mission, they mobilized one Type 82 command and communication vehicle, two Type 96 wheeled armored vehicles equipped with remotely operated and manned gun mounts RWS, one light armored mobile vehicle, one Type 73 large truck loaded with food, spare ammunition, and fuel. In addition, Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka, having secretly arranged it, forcibly obtain one Type 89 armored fighting vehicle from another unit, totaling six vehicles under Haruto's command, along with 35 soldiers from the 5th squad. Squad leader, I see it. Seated between the rear seats of the lead armored mobile vehicle, the machine gunner peered out from the turret hatch, banging on the ceiling to alert everyone that the destination was in sight. At last, finally reaching their destination. Haruto breathed a sigh of relief as the ordeal of traversing rough terrain came to an end. Everyone, disembark, and stay alert. Having arrived in the village with their peculiar vehicles, Haruto's group found the villagers seemingly frightened, as they had all hidden inside their homes, leaving the village eerily deserted. Parking their vehicles in the square at the center of the village, Haruto's group armed themselves with Type 89 rifles and Minami light machine guns, assuming a defensive posture. Um, excuse me, but, who are you, do you need something from us? Peering out from a small hut-like house, an elderly man cautiously stepped forward, observing Haruto's group's expressions as he spoke. We're from the Puribom army. Are you the village chief here? Why yes, I'm the village chief. But, despite being taken aback by the sudden appearance of an unfamiliar armed group, the village chief managed to speak, albeit with some difficulty. I see. So, do you know who we are? Probably not. Despite asking the question himself, Haruto thought that the villagers probably didn't know who they were. You mentioned Paribam. I believe they're the enemy country we're at war with. Surprisingly, however, the village chief was aware of Paribam's existence. Unexpected. How does information spread even here in the mountains? Do merchants come regularly? If you're aware of us, then this should be simple. We, the Paribam army, have occupied the fortress city of Ballard and its surroundings. Today, we're here to inform you of that fact and, well, it's work. Work. You say, right. Work, says Yumiya. It's about time, and the timing is perfect. Get ready. Understood. You lot, lend a hand. Ha. Following Haruto's instructions, sub-lieutenant says Yumiya, along with her subordinates, efficiently unloaded the boxed food from the Type 73 large truck. Um, well, it's rather difficult to say, but just recently, we were subjected to additional taxation by the Empire's tax officials. S so, um, there's nothing left in the village anymore. I see. So, um, well, Lieutenant Suzumiya and his team were unloading boxes from the truck, and the village chief, who misunderstood that they were there to collect taxes, food, wore a despondent expression, stuttering hesitantly. It seems there's a misunderstanding. Huh? We didn't come here to collect taxes. Then, what for? As the village chief, still not fully grasping the situation, was flustered, Haruto smirked and delivered the news that would bring relief to the villagers. We've come to deliver food supplies. What do you mean by that? To the puzzled village chief, Haruto chuckled in response. Ha ha, just as it sounds. We're here for food distribution. It's an order directly from His Excellency. The Chancellor, upon learning that people like you are struggling to make ends meet, his kindness ordered the distribution of food to everyone living under occupation. T then, what about those boxes? Aren't they tax collection boxes? Oh, those? Those are your lunch boxes. It's lunchtime after all. Ahead of Haruto's gaze were stacks of empty UGRE, unitized group ration extended, boxes that Lieutenant Suzumiya's team had unloaded along with trays warmed by heaters utilizing a chemical reaction with salt water. That's right. I hadn't asked yet, but how many villagers are there in total? About 150 or so. More villagers than I anticipated. Well, 
We've brought plenty of food, so it should suffice. Then gather them all here right away. It'd be a waste if the food gets cold, wouldn't it? Why yes. Immediately. Finally understanding the situation, the village chief dashed off joyfully to gather the villagers upon hearing Haruto's words. We have plenty, so line up in an orderly fashion. Initially suspicious of Haruto and his team's offer of free food distribution, the villagers hurriedly fetched wooden utensils from their homes and lined up for the distribution once they realized it was indeed happening. We could only prepare such simple dishes this time, but if the road leading here gets improved, we can prepare better ones next time, so please look forward to it. Watching the villagers happily receiving the food supplies. Haruto told this to the smiling village chief beside him. No, no, not at all. To us. This is a feast. Is that so? Yes, really. We never dreamed of having such a feast while we're still alive. Thank you very much. Glad you liked it. By the way, may I ask you something? What is it? Why do the villagers go back to their homes to eat before coming back for more? Wouldn't it be easier to eat here since there's seconds available? Some of them have been making several trips back and forth questioning why the villagers, after receiving their meals, would return home to eat before coming back for more. Haruto asked the village chief, who responded with a flustered expression. W well, you see. Um. That's because. It's a custom in the village not to display the scene of eating to others, it's considered indecent. That's why everyone eats in their homes before coming out. I see. Though Haruto outwardly seemed to accept the explanation, inwardly, he harbored doubts. Given the suspicious nature of the village chief's response, let's put it to the test. Kirimijima sama Where to? Oh, just a little detour. In order to verify the truth behind the village chief's explanation, Haruto took action. Suzumiya. Yes, what is it, Captain? Among the food supplies we brought, there were several apples, right? Can you give me one? Huh? Ah, sure. Here you go. Receiving an apple from Lieutenant Suzumiya, who looked puzzled, Haruto approached a girl in line for distribution, holding the apple. Hey, miss, what is it? Wanna eat this too? With a smile, Haruto offered the apple to the girl. Is it okay? Yeah, of course. But would you mind eating it here? Huh? Okay, I got it. I'll eat it here. Just as suspected, the earlier explanation seemed fabricated. Upon hearing the girl's response without any hesitation, Haruto gained confirmation that the village chief's explanation was indeed a lie. And just as Haruto was about to confront the village chief about why he felt the need to lie, he witnessed something unbelievable. Ah gulp mmm, delicious. Thanks, big brother. That can't be true. Can it? The girl to whom he had given the apple a moment ago had swallowed the entire apple in one go, an act impossible for a human being, resembling the way a snake would swallow its prey whole. Upon hearing the loud sound of the girl swallowing the apple, the members of the 5th platoon realized what had happened and froze, while the villagers all paled simultaneously. Miss, are you okay, Annis? Are you okay? You need to spit it out quickly at home. To swallow something so big. Q quick. Take her home. Despite swallowing the apple whole, the girl seemed nonchalant about it. Upon hearing Haruto's questioning and reaching out to the woman who had picked up the girl, something unexpected happened. Stop. Take Sam and Anis and run. There's nothing we can do now. Ensure everyone returns alive. Thinking that Haruto would harm his beloved daughter and wife, the father urged the two to flee, attempting to divert attention away from the village's secret. Why yes, responding to the call. The men of the village suddenly turned hostile towards the soldiers of the 5th platoon. Stop it, all of you. Even the desperate cries of the pale village chief went unheard by the enraged men. Bam. Yelp. Uck. I it hurts. Wah. Captain. However, a gunshot that pierced the leg of the young man who had attempted to attack Lieutenant Suzumiya, followed by his agonized scream, caused the other men to freeze in shock, their eyes widening. Everyone, don't move. Those who act on their own are not guaranteed safety. With Haruto aiming a 9mm pistol and other firearms at the men of the 5th platoon who had turned hostile, the villagers completely lost their will to fight. Now then, shall we hear the explanation? Of course, you'd better explain. Yes. With Haruto's firm declaration, indicating there was no room for refusal, the village chief reluctantly nodded. Volume 04 Chapter 04 then, can I talk to you? The three soldiers. Haruto, Lieutenant Suzumiya, 
and two bodyguards, gathered at the village chief's house to have the situation explained to them. The three soldiers gathered at the village chief's house to have the situation explained to them. Listen, yes, I understand. The village chief nodded slightly at Haruto's words, but was struggling with whether or not he should tell the truth about everything. These people, unlike the humans sent in when the Empire took control of this land, they didn't steal the village's food or assault young girls. No, on the contrary, they treated us to such a delicious feast for free. So, here, I'll bet on these kind-hearted people, let's be honest about everything. However, there is no certainty that the village's attitude towards us will not change even after knowing our secret. I'm sorry, but, in the worst case scenario, if these people find out our secret and try to harm us, everyone, let's kill them. Like nine years ago, the village chief gathered his thoughts in an instant, made up his mind, and opened his mouth. Now that it has become like this, it will be impossible to hide it any longer. Therefore, I will say it clearly. We. We are the descendants of the snake people who have lived in this land since a long time ago! Exclamation mark. Well, the snake people, the snake people, are, I'm sure they're closely related to the Lamia, and they don't look much different from humans, but just like snakes, they can remove their jaws at will and widen their mouths, and they have stretchable bodies, was it a race with? The village chief made up his mind and honestly told the truth without concealing anything. He clenched his fist in his lap as hard as he could, and closed his eyes tightly. He felt fear and anxiety in response from Haruto and his friends. Even though I was tormented by this, I just waited patiently. I see. So, picture? What's the matter? Continue quickly. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, we are the snake people. Oh, I heard that. Aren't you going to kill us? Why do we have to kill you? Dot, that? Am I misunderstanding something again? When they were both silent. Haruto realized that the village chief had misunderstood something again, and realized that Parabem did not kill beastmen and demons for no reason like the Empire did. After explaining, I asked him to continue talking, I see, I was, I'm glad, I'm really glad, I didn't end up killing you guys. However, we made a huge misunderstanding. Actually, here we are. I rely on a merchant who comes over from time to time for information on the current situation. But the merchant says that the Parabem army is merciless, and he clearly says that to beastmen and demons like us. That's what I thought. I apologize for the inconvenience. No, don't worry about it. It's great that the misunderstanding has been cleared up. However, the snake people, you beast people were able to live in this land that was well controlled by the Empire. Well, it's been about ten years since the Coltrane Kingdom, which was relatively tolerant of beastmen and demons like the Canary Kingdom was destroyed by the Empire. I wonder when they'll find out that I'm a serpent man and get killed. I didn't feel like I was alive. However, the only people who came to such a remote village were the tax collectors, so if I kept the secret a secret for just that moment, everything would be fine. By the way, this is a side note, but nine years ago, there was a time when a tax collector found out that we were snake people. At that time, I was the tax collector and the men of the village swallowed the tax collector's attendant hole to protect the secret. Well, but, at that time, everyone had a swollen stomach and couldn't move for about three months. Ha ha ha. So scary! Exclamation mark. When Haruto and his subordinates heard the story of how humans were disposed of by swallowing them whole, they became fearful of the village chief and the villagers outside who were laughing and talking. I I see. That was difficult. By the way, why didn't you leave this land? You could have abandoned this land and gone to the Canary Kingdom before the Empire attacked. Haruto asked the village chief, who seemed to be harmless from his gentle appearance, but was actually quite ferocious and frightening feeling a little hesitant. I can't leave even if I want to. The village chief's face changed from his smiling face earlier, and now he had a complex expression that was a mix of joy, anger, and sadness, and muttered to himself, what does it mean? Our family needs to keep an eye on him to make sure he doesn't leave here. That person watching? I don't know what's going on. Tell me more. Yes, that person is Hydra Sama who can be called a god that our family has worshipped for generations. Hydra. You mean Hydra? An immortal monster that has nine heads and spits out flames and poison, right? W why did you do that? No one else except us should know about Hydra-sama. Are you serious? 
The village chief is surprised that Haruto knew about the existence of the Hydra, which is supposed to be known only to members of the family, and Haruto hides his surprise that a creature that was supposed to be a fictional monster actually exists in this world, there wasn't. Well, don't worry, we have a lot going on too. H ha, Haruto tells him not to make any more pointless inquiries, but the village chief reluctantly backs down. Gohan, keep talking. Yes. So, Hydra-sama has been acting strange for about 20 years. Is it strange? Well, he was originally a kind and intelligent person, but... He lost his sense of self after being exposed to the miasma and began to attack anyone who came into his sight indiscriminately. In other words, became violent fell into demons and turned into a monster? Yes, that's right. Right now, he's been sealed away in a cave a little far from the village. However, if something were to go wrong and he was released into the world, a terrible disaster would befall him. That's why we need to keep watch to prevent that from happening. That's why we couldn't leave this place. I see, is there something like that? Well, well, I guess I got caught up in a troublesome case. There is a legendary monster. Should I report the situation to the main force and ask for instructions? After Haruto finished listening to the village chief's story, he was troubled by the fact that the problem was more than he expected. Well, for now, this is the end of the questioning. Tell everyone that they don't have to worry about their lives and reassure them. Yes. When Haruto learns of the situation and tries to contact the main force and ask for instructions, he receives news telling him the worst. T village chief, T that's tough. A man with a different complexion appeared with the force of breaking the door, accompanied by Haruto's subordinates, proof. What happened when you changed blood phase? What happened? Oh, that's it. I couldn't see my son-in-law, so I was looking for him with these people, and we found footprints heading towards that cave, maybe. But I thought we were going to be killed, so I thought, that person, to ask for help, huh? It doesn't taste good. Follow me right away. If you mess with the sealing technique, Hydra-sama will come out. Is this a joke? As Haruto listened to the conversation between the villagers and the village chief, a cold sweat trickled down his forehead. Tokushiro, say Iyama. Head to the cave with that man. Roger. Understood. Old man, we're counting on you for directions. R. Yeah, this way. Following Haruto's instructions, the two soldiers dashed towards the cave with the father of the missing boy. This is getting troublesome. Kobayashi, ensure all members are prepared for combat. We're heading to the cave as well. Roger. Says Yumiya, you take five people and guide the villagers to safety. Also, report the current situation to the main unit at Ballard, and request support for information. Yes, sir. Haruto quickly assessed the seriousness of the situation from the expressions of the villagers and the village chief. He rapidly issued instructions and decided to head straight to the cave. Make sure to bring extra ammunition, and don't forget the Type 4 protective masks. While giving orders to his subordinates, Haruto pressed 30 rounds of 5.56x45 NATO ammunition into the box type magazines attached to the Type 3 bulletproof vests. He then tossed three MK3A2 offensive hand grenades into the pouches of the Type 3 bulletproof vests and grabbed two Type 06 rifle grenades. That should do it for ammunition. Everyone, check your advanced combat gear systems for any malfunctions. After replenishing the ammunition, Haruto moved on to check the advanced combat gear systems, which digitize infantry individual equipment to enhance combat capability and survivability. No issues here. We're good to go too. I can see clearly. The soldiers confirmed that their electronic devices were functioning normally. Preparations are complete. With that, Haruto, having finished preparing for combat in just a few minutes, gave orders to his waiting subordinates. Barrett and Payload, provide support from the top of that cliff. R, take one observer with you. Understood. Understood. Haruto directed two soldiers equipped with Barrett M82A1 anti-materiel sniper rifles and M109 payload anti-materiel sniper rifles, along with one observer, to the cliff between the village and the cave, where they could cover both areas. As for those with minimis, your task is different. If combat breaks out, provide rear support. Your movement is slower, so don't rush to the front. Understood. Haruto instructed the soldiers carrying the M240 machine guns, except for those with minimis, to focus on providing support, 
This was because soldiers equipped with the Iron Man system, a backpack containing 300 to 500 rounds of ammunition connected to the machine gun via belt links, had to prioritize support due to the significant loss of mobility caused by the weight of the equipment itself. When the time comes, you guys are our trump card. We're counting on you. The responsibility is heavy indeed. This is a significant responsibility isn't it? Leave it to me. When it's time to act, I'll do it. Encouraging the soldiers carrying 84mm recoilless rifles like the Carl Gustav M3 and Type 01 light anti-tank guided missiles, Haruto patted their shoulders and then issued orders to his subordinates once again. All right then, let's hurry. Everyone, Captain. Please wait a moment. Hold on. What's wrong, says Yumiya? Is there an issue? MMPH. This is like a charm. Please come back safely, Captain. Well then, as Haruto, taken aback by the unexpected kiss from Lieutenant Suzumiya, was left dumbfounded watching her leave with a confident stride, his face turned crimson. He he he. Arg. Dot. Everyone, pick up the pace. Stop grinning and run. I'll give you a good smack. Come on. Noticing the presence of his subordinates grinning and finding amusement in the situation. Haruto shouted in anger, ha ha ha, yes, sir, still chuckling at Haruto's crimson face, the soldiers, burdened with heavy equipment, began running towards the cave, damn, when they come back to the village, I'll definitely have a word with them, swearing silently to himself, Haruto brought up the rear of the formation, captain, please come back safely, watching Haruto's retreating figure as he dashed along the mountain path, Lieutenant Suzumiya clasped her hands in front of her petite chest, praying earnestly for his safety. And as Haruto's figure disappeared from view, Lieutenant Suzumiya returned to her duties, heading back to her subordinates. Phew, he he he, ha ha ha, damn. As Haruto ran towards the cave, the soldiers ahead occasionally glanced back at him, chuckling, annoyed by the situation. As Haruto hurried his steps, two soldiers approached him from either side. Well, well, but Captain, you sure do handle things. Get a life. Words of admiration for Haruto came from the right, while words of resentment came from the left. Just shut up and watch. To swiftly calm the situation, Haruto casually took out a piece of paper from his pocket, leaving the two soldiers speechless. Th that's. Ah, that infamous. Even though we tried to ambush His Excellency the Chancellor, we ended up being ensnared and our entire clan was handed over as slaves by the succubus employed by the Parabem mainland, she operates a brothel, one of the top tier establishments, and this is a free ticket? Why does the captain have it even though it's supposed to be distributed only to the SS troops? Well, I have my connections. Forget about what happened earlier, I'll distribute these to everyone. Understood, sir. Lord Kairishima. Given the bait, the soldiers, with nearly full speed, ran while skillfully glancing back, saluting Haruto. Crash. Looks like we didn't make it in time, as Haruto and his companions, now serious after dropping their jests, followed the villagers who took the lead. A rumbling sound emanated from the direction of the cave, accompanied by a billowing cloud of dust. Zed Zed, za damn it. To the squad leader from the east, can you hear me? We've secured the children but it seems the seal has been broken. Currently retreating. This is Kairishima. Understood. Take the children and they're further back to the village. We'll secure retreat route. Roger that. Understood. Well, as we heard, we'll hold off the enemy here until Ton and the others return to the village. Understood. The seal has been broken. We're in the worst possible situation. I need to play my trump card. If only there's someone nearby. Unable to avoid a confrontation with the Hydra. Haruto discreetly contacted a certain location through a covert communication line. From Kurobayashi to the squad leader, the target has emerged from the cave. It's huge. The target's length is approximately 20 to 30 meters. It's a monster. Just as Haruto finished the covert communication, a report came to him via personal handheld radio from Private Kurobayashi, who was acting as a spotter alongside two snipers on top of a cliff. Understood. Start the attack at my signal. Roger that. Haruto switched the PTT switch to toggle between radio transmission and reception, informing Private Kurobayashi to stand by, with his subordinates concealed in the shadows of trees and the undulations of the mountains. Haruto quietly waited for the fleeing subordinates. Pant, pant. Counting on you guys. As a subordinate, desperate to avoid being eaten by the Hydra, 
passed by him, Haruto called out, leave it to me, situation commencing, fire, as the Hydra emerged from the cave, vigorously moving its nine heads to search for prey, it spotted the four individuals fleeing towards the village and began its pursuit, it mowed down trees one after another, closing in on the four with unbelievable speed, but just as it was about to reach its prey, four of the Hydra's heads exploded, enveloping its body in flames and smoke, Ra'ug with four heads crushed simultaneously, the Hydra roared in anger and pain amidst the smoke and flames, no way, the target's still alive, you can see that for yourself, just keep shooting, as a signal of the explosion from the M109 payload sniper rifle, Haruto reprimanded his astonished subordinates while simultaneously attaching and firing 84mm recoilless rifles, Type 01 light anti-tank guided missiles, and even Type 06 rifle grenades from his Type 89 rifle. Damn it. <laughs> his subordinates also concentrated all their available firepower, adding to the barrage with full auto gunfire. Reload. This is the last one. Out of ammo already? I only had three rounds to begin with. After completing another reload, rounds from 84mm recoilless rifles and Type 01 light anti-tank guided missiles mercilessly tore through the Hydra's flesh. While the shockwaves from successive MK3A2 offensive hand grenades pounded its body relentlessly, if this Hydra is a creature according to legend, its central head is immortal. However, the other heads only have the ability to regenerate, and if you burn the wound when you drop your head, you shouldn't be able to regenerate it. Haruto was thinking about how he could put an end to the Hydra as his men retreated little by little as their ammunition ran out. However, that thought became a stumbling block. Platoon leader is in danger. Aiming for the moment when the barrage thinned out, the Hydra spewed acid all over the area. Mazu? Question mark. At the sound of his subordinate's voice, he immediately jumped away, but Haruto's equipment a Type 3 bulletproof vest and a Type 89 rifle were covered in sticky acid. The acid that adhered to the equipment melted away, making a hissing sound. Ark Captain, I'll take it off now so please don't move, the type 3 bulletproof vest that was removed from Haruto's body by his subordinates who rushed over to him melted the ceramic plates inside and burned the ground just in the nick of time, Jaya. Without having time to take a breather, Haruto heard a scream that shook his eardrums and turned around to see two of his subordinates had been turned into charcoal by the Hydra's breath, retreat, 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 retreat. The situation quickly turns and Haruto quickly withdraws his troops as he becomes disadvantageous. However, Hydra, which has regenerated all of its wounds except for the three heads, which were unable to regenerate as the wounds were burned by the flames of the explosion, pursues Haruto and his friends. This resulted in three more casualties. Hey, wait, where are you going? A soldier lent his shoulder to his burnt and injured subordinate and slipped past Haruto, who was about to retreat and headed towards the Hydra. I'll buy you time. Ignoring Haruto's attempts to stop him, the machine gunner carrying the Iron Man system stands alone against the Hydra. Oh. So 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 the Hydra groans and twists in annoyance at the flying bullets, but it suddenly stretches its neck and attacks the soldier. Jaya. Dash. Bakuan. Gulp. Exclamation mark. Damn it. Haruto couldn't help but let out a curse as he heard the sound of the soldier swallowing and the last gasp coming from behind him. If this continues, everyone will be killed before they reach the village. Please give me this. Well, T Captain, where are you going? You're buying time. Haruto pushed the wounded soldier onto his subordinate and stole the Type 89 rifle and magazine from his subordinate, and then turned on his heels. Ha ha. That's huge. This. Monster. Returning to the battlefield and facing the Hydra, Haruto desperately moved his legs trembling in fear as he began to attack. However, the bullets from the Type 89 rifle were unable to do any damage to the Hydra, and at best they were only harassing it. 
Is it the end? Haruto was fighting while somehow dodging Hydra's breath attacks. But when he ran out of bullets, he decided to make up his mind. Shea, the Hydra squeals happily as its annoying enemy has finally calmed down. And that's when she tried to swallow Haruto whole with her wide open mouth. Don't touch the captain. With a cry of anger, two Type 79 anti-vehicle anti-tank missiles suddenly flew from behind Haruto, puncturing a large hole in the Hydra's body. Wow. Haruto, who was covering his face with his hands to protect himself from the blast that was raging around him, slowly lowered his hands and turned to the side, where he saw a Type 89 armored fighting vehicle that had forcibly climbed up the mountain road while mowing down trees. Dot. Captain, are you okay? Hurry up, it's so expensive. The 90 caliber 35mm machine gun KDE roars out, and a barrage of armor piercing shells, APDS, and incendiary grenades, HEI, hits the Hydra, and fresh blood gushes from the Hydra's body each time it hits a hit. Dot. Come on, hurry up, hurry up and get on. Ensigns Yumiya said as he came out of the double hatch at the rear of the Type 89 armored fighting vehicle and hurried Haruto and tried to drag him into the vehicle. Says Yumiya, avoid a Kaya. However, seeing an opening, Hydra counterattacked, and the acid spewed out melted the Type 89 armored fighting vehicle along with the three crew members, and another splash of acid lightly burned Ensigns Yumiya's right leg. Says Yumiya, uck, uck. Haruta runs up to Ensigns Yumiya, who is groaning with an injured leg, with a pale face. Sir Aeru, a Hydra slowly approaches the two of them to eat them. Captain, I'm fine, so please leave me and run quickly. Second Lieutenant says Yumiya groans in pain and bravely urges Haruto to run away. Dot. However, without replying, Haruto silently pulls out a 9mm pistol from Ensigns Yumiya's holster and steps forward as if to protect Ensigns Yumiya. There's no way a superior can run away leaving his subordinate behind. Team leader, Haruto grins at Ensigns Yumiya. Then, he barked at the Hydra, which was now moving its red tongue in and out of its six remaining mouths. Come at me, you bastard. The moment Haruto barked to provoke the Hydra, the Hydra's large head approached Ensigns Yumiya and Haruto. The sound of cutting flesh and bones together echoed around the area. You endured well until I came. Leave the rest to me. The person who stepped between Lieutenants Yumiya, who was unable to move due to an injured leg, and the Hydra that was opening its mouth to eat Haruto, who was protecting him, and cut off the Hydra's head. It was Chioda, who was flying down from the HV-22B Osprey hovering above, carrying two halberds and his long black hair flowing. Also, about six members of the SS equipped with powered suits descended after Chioda. Well, you made it in time. Haruto never expected Chioda to come, but he was relieved to have such a strong ally come. F Vice President, Your Excellency, and the SS Ensigns Yumiya suddenly lets out a voice when he sees Chioda and an SS member equipped with a jet black type 00 exoskeleton powered suit suddenly appear in a desperate situation. I still don't understand. Well, it can't be helped because my sister and I are exactly like each other. Let me correct you. I'm Nagato Chioda, not Nagato Catherine, the vice president. I'm a special advisor to the president. A R S. Sorry. No. I don't care, while Chioda and Ensigns Yumiya are exchanging words, the severed head regenerates and the Hydra, which now has six heads, attacks Chioda. Ha, yo, the Chioda jumps around like a gymnast and dodges the simultaneous attacks of the Hydra, which attacks with its six whip-like necks and bears its fangs. The Hydra's head gouges the ground without being able to capture Chioda, a monster with an immortal head. It's quite troublesome. but. It would make a nice souvenir for the master. Chioda, who saw the movements of the furiously attacking Hydra with special eyes equipped with a wide variety of cameras including high sensitivity cameras, grinned fearlessly and quickly approached the Hydra, and with a single flash of the Nata held in both hands, it struck five. Fly off one's head, Shea! Exclamation mark. The Hydra cries out in pain and tries to regenerate the severed neck, but the neck does not regenerate. <laughs> Unlike before, it was cut by a blade that was heated by ultra-high frequency vibrations, so it can't be regenerated. As if to confirm Chioda's words, the blade of the Nejinata was glowing bright red with heat, 
and the smell of burning meat was in the air. Shea Hydra instinctively senses the difference in power and slowly retreats while glaring at Chioda in fear. Now, there's only one head left. As Hydra tries to escape, Chioda stabs the Nadinata in his right hand into the ground and points the palm of his free right hand at Hydra. Do you think I'll let you escape? Sink. Hydra turned its body around and tried to run away, but Chioda's word signaled it to fall to the ground as if it had been crushed by an invisible force. What? Haruto and Ensense's Yumiya are also surprised by this. Yeah? Oh. Is this it? This is a gravity weapon that applies the gravity control of the magic furnace. It's planted in my arm. Well, it's a prototype, so it's only effective for about 30 seconds. While saying this, Chioda walked towards the Hydra and thrust his Nadinata into the last remaining Hydra's neck. Sir Uru Hydra, unable to escape as it is held down by an invisible force, sees the image of Chioda reflected in its eyes and feels a certain fear. Then, die. With those words, the head of the Hydra's head fell off easily with the bright red blade that fell off. Immortality. Huh? It's still troublesome. Chioda narrowed his eyes when he saw that the head that was separated from the body was moving, unlike the body that turned to ash the moment the immortal's head was severed. However, the Hydra was unable to regenerate its body because the cut end was fused and burned. Well, it's just a good research material. Come on, collect this. Ha. Huh. A female soldier from the unit assigned to Chioda, commonly known as the Valkyrie Squad, replies to Chioda in this way. Hydra was subdued by Chioda, and the matter came to an end. Volume 04 Chapter 05 Gloria, the secondary city of the Elza's magic empire, boasts a size second only to the imperial capital. Situated at the forefront of the Marlin Strait, which connects the Killer Sea and the Tail Sea, Gloria naturally attracts people and goods, serving as a bustling major trading port. The cityscape characterized by its climate, is adorned with buildings made of earth and sun-dried bricks, their walls and roofs whitewashed with lime, presenting a picturesque array that delights travelers and seafarers who make port in its beautiful white streets. Upon closer inspection of the streets, one would find a multitude of people draped in sunshades bustling about, creating an atmosphere brimming with liveliness that belies the wartime circumstances. However, this vibrant scene is limited to the main thoroughfares. Stepping just one foot into the back alleys reveals a stagnant air, where those who came seeking employment from the countryside but failed to secure jobs now wander as vagrants. Others, having turned a blind eye to harsh realities, lie drugged and lifeless on the ground. Among them stride thugs with injured shins unable to walk the main streets, as well as adventurers fallen from grace, all inhabitants of Gloria's impoverished districts. Such is the dual nature of Gloria, with its contrasting faces of prosperity and poverty. At its center stands a massive castle protected by sturdy walls and a magnificent palace, symbolizing the empire's authority. To the north, facing the sea, lies a defensive barrier surrounding the city, extending even into the ocean. At the convergence point of this barrier stands the only gateway, the Grand Gate, through which trading ships and fishing vessels come and go. Furthermore, Outside the Grand Gate, forts erected on reclaimed rocky outcrops provide an additional defense, doubly thwarting invaders from the sea. While the northern side boasts stringent defenses, it is not the only area fortified. Due to its strategic and geographical significance as the Empire's secondary city, Gloria is heavily fortified throughout, with ironclad defenses and formidable military forces deployed for its protection. Enemies won't show up murmured a pilot within one of the dozens of flight-capable magical war machines patrolling the skies about 30 kilometers from Gloria. Number 3, stay silent and focus on your duty, commanded the leader from the first machine. Understood, replied the pilot of the third machine, silenced by the commander's admonition, as he gazed out at the azure sea displayed on the monitor inside the cockpit. What a bore. Seriously? Are enemies really going to come here? Ten minutes after the silence fell upon the third machine's pilot, another board pilot piped up. Number 10, maintain silence, reprimanded the leader. Come on, it's not like we're in the middle of anything. We've got time to kill, don't we? Sigh. Have a bit more sense of urgency. Listen, a week ago, the enemy annihilated the defense fleet at the Zero Sea and crossed the Kunai Strait. If they're heading straight here, they might be attacking us at this very moment, 
you know? Ha ha ha, Captain. You think the enemy is that foolish? There's no way they'd attack Gloria head on. Yes, Captain. Rumor has it that wandering warriors are at the palace in Gloria. They say all wanderers are formidable fighters, so if push comes to shove, they'll scatter the enemy. You guys are way too relaxed. Have you ever wondered why all soldiers in Gloria are on combat alert? And all the airships are out patrolling? The enemy will definitely come here. Oh, come on. The real target of the enemy must be coming by land, right? If so, the ones coming here are just decoy units. We won't have to fight seriously. Just brush them off and it's done. Due to information control by the Imperial upper echelons, frontline soldiers were only provided with favorable information, oblivious to the fact that the Empire was suffering a major blow and facing dire straits. Huh? What's that? As the pilot of the third machine listened in on the idle chatter of the other pilots through the magical communication device, a brief shadow flickered on the monitor. Number three, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. Just a moment, before the pilot of the third machine could respond to the leader's inquiry, he lost consciousness forever. Exclamation mark number three has been killed. Struck by a missile traveling at Mach 5. The third machine was engulfed in flames in an instant, plummeting towards the killer sea. As it spiraled downward like a dead leaf, the machine exploded mid-descent, shattered into smithereens. Scatter, scatter, gua, don't come, yawa, hit, hit, going down, going down, somebody, somebody help, it's hot, the cockpit's on fire, it's on fire ee. The flight-capable magical war machines promptly took evasive action against the sudden ambush, but unable to escape the onslaught of countless missiles, they exploded one after another in the sky. Exclamation mark enemy attack at 3 o'clock, distance 8000. Magical war machines on patrol are under attack. Enemy attack, full helm to starboard. Reduce altitude to 100. T trying. Full helm. Altitude. It's no good. Can't evade in time. Enemy shells closing in. Damn it. Of all places. Upon witnessing the successive downing of the flight capable magical war machines, the patrol ship hastily took evasive action, but it was too late. Dozens of missiles tore through its hull, causing it to emit black smoke as it plummeted downward. Thus, under the onslaught of a swarm of missiles filling the sky, all flight-capable magical war machines and aerial warships deployed to defend Gloria were shot down. The vast armada of Brabem, consisting of ships of all sizes, approached Gloria, nearing a staggering count of nearly 4,000 vessels. Combat Attack Squadron 31, all planes out of ammunition, returning to base now. In the Combat Information Center, CIC, of the flagship of the Expeditionary Fleet, the Blue Ridge-class amphibious command ship Blue Ridge. Soldiers worked diligently at their posts with heightened seriousness to ensure the success of the impending Gloria assault. First attack squadron, 10 minutes to Gloria. As the opening salvo of the assault on Gloria, hundreds of long-range air-to-air AIM-54 Phoenix missiles launched by combat attack squadron 31, composed solely of F-14 Tomcats, dealt a devastating blow to the Imperial aerial forces tasked with defending Gloria's skies signaling the commencement of full-scale attack. Contact from Vanguard Fleet. Commencing long-range artillery and cruise missile, as well as ground attack with surface-to-surface -surface rocket projectiles. Following the decimation of enemy aerial forces, the Vanguard Fleet, comprising 10 Spruance-class destroyers, 3 Zumwalt-class destroyers, and 30 heavily modernized assault battleships, each equipped forcibly with additional auto 127mm cannons and MLRS launchers, commenced their ground assault with rocket-propelled guided artillery shells, INS-GPS guided missiles, Tomahawk cruise missiles, and MGM-140 ATACMS, Army Tactical Missile System, Block 2 missiles, each carrying 13 MGM-140 ATACMS ground-to-ground -ground missiles, along with unpowered glide-type guided submunition, brilliant anti-armor submunitions, targeting Gloria's military installations. Fire all missiles. Every last one. Don't think about the consequences. Understood. The Vanguard fleet, advancing slowly towards Gloria, continued their relentless assault, expending all their ammunition in an unyielding barrage. Subsequently, guided artillery shells and Tomahawk missiles unleashed from the Vanguard fleet targeted Gloria's military facilities with pinpoint accuracy, 
engulfing the skies in flames and painting Gloria's atmosphere black with billowing smoke. Simultaneously, guided submunitions detached from the Attackham's main body in Gloria's airspace, deploying wings equipped with acoustic sensors to scan the ground below. Upon detecting the targeted magical weaponry, the submunitions executed aerial attacks, obliterating the magical weapons with precision. However, the destruction didn't end there. Whenever one magical weapon was destroyed, the surrounding parked magical weapons detonated like dominoes, amplifying the damage. Faced with the uncontrollable chaos of flames and cascading explosions, Imperial soldiers could only watch silently as the magical weapons burned. Captain, we have a problem. G. Gloria is under attack at a military facility on the outskirts of Gloria. A sentry who noticed the anomaly rushed inside. His expression frantic. What? An enemy attack? How did we miss this? I, I don't know. Nothing appeared on the magical radar. Impossible. Look, enemies are passing right over our heads one after another. A soldier, spotting the enemy from the window, yelled at his subordinate. E even if you say that this magical radar made by the wandering people isn't showing anything. Confounded and frustrated by the apparent failure of the magical radar, relied upon by Imperial soldiers at a critical moment. They couldn't hide their confusion and irritation. Damn it, you useless piece of junk. Where are the enemies coming from? As the first attack squadron, composed solely of F-35C Lightning is with stealth capabilities, launched from the expeditionary fleet's aircraft carriers and flew towards Gloria, and due to the low performance of the hastily improvised magical radar, the magical radar was discredited as useless. Enemies are heading towards us. All hands, evacuate. Run for your lives. The large and unmistakable radar facility, serving as a radar installation, was destroyed by the bombing of F-35CS, which quickly identified its existence. As a result, the magical radar, without the opportunity for redemption, quickly became nothing more than a worthless heap of scrap. Contact from the first attack squadron. Enemy counterattack is weak. We have achieved air superiority. With the onslaught of 200 F-35CS comprising the first attack squadron, Gloria's aerial and naval forces suffered severe blows rendering them completely silent. Thus, air and sea superiority around Gloria fell into the hands of Paribim. Second attack squadron, 10 minutes to Gloria. As the first attack squadron continued its aerial assault over Gloria, the second attack squadron, consisting of 300 aircraft equipped with ground attack armaments such as F-14S, F-A-18E slash F Super Hornets, Avenue 8B Harrieries, and Su-33S, approached Gloria. The third attack squadron, commencing launch when Kent summoned the aircraft carrier, along with it came the squadron summoned for reinforcement. However, due to insufficient training time for model conversion and a shortage of available aircraft, their own aircraft underwent modifications upon summoning. The third attack squadron was formed, comprising outdated aircraft such as the Type 620 fighter, Swai I carrier based bomber, Ryu Sai carrier based attack aircraft. F-6F Hellcat, SB-2C Helldiver, and TBF Avenger, totaling 1,500 planes. Despite bearing heavy bombs, they took to the skies one after another by kicking off from the flight deck. The 4th Attack Squadron, prepare for launch meanwhile, on the flight decks of two Nimitz-class nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, 80 unmanned combat drones, X-47B Pegasus, lined up undergoing final checks before their maiden deployment. Pilots of the 5th Attack Squadron, prepare for deployment. The helicopter unit, designated as the 5th Attack Squadron, comprising pilots of AH-1Z Viper and UH-1Y Venom armed with Hydra-70 rockets and Gore-17 miniguns, received their summons. As dusk fell, following five extensive aerial assaults, the expeditionary fleet arrived at Gloria to find its defense completely collapsed and non-functional. This outcome was inevitable, as during the initial attacks by the Vanguard fleet and the first attack squadron, the Empire's countermeasures, flying magical weapons and airborne warships, were already lost. The subsequent strikes by the second attack squadron with precision-guided bombs and ground-to-ground -ground missiles obliterated most of Gloria's defense installations. Then came the onslaught from the third attack squadron, which swarmed Gloria like a cloud, executing horizontal bombing, dive bombing, 
and strafing runs, reducing the military facilities to rubble. The 4th Attack Squadron's bombings further breached the sturdy city walls surrounding Gloria and the walls guarding its castles and palaces. Subsequently, the 5th Attack Squadron launched with a time delay, meticulously eliminating Imperial soldiers who emerged to recover comrades' remains and clear debris, using machine guns, rockets, and BGM-114 Hellfire missiles. It's finally tomorrow, isn't it? Yes, tomorrow will be quite busy. To conclude their military operations for the day, the final touch involved distributing evacuation advisory leaflets to the entire urban area of Gloria, ensuring civilians were warned to avoid being caught in the crossfire of the impending Gloria landing operation the next day. With that, the day's activities of the Parabem army came to an end, all to be carried over to the following day. What? Is that? Can't be. True, right? Oh. My. God. That ship is enormous. Having somehow survived the tumultuous day of being bombarded by an unknown arsenal of weapons, soldiers who had managed to greet the morning sun alive stood gazing blankly at the sea. Ahead of the soldiers' vacant stairs, dozens of massive black steel castles floated on the ocean's surface. Perfect weather for battle, commented Colonel Ariga, the commanding officer of the Yamato-class battleship. Yamato, as he gazed upon the white glistening cityscape of Gloria bathed in the morning sun from the bridge. Yes, not a cloud in sight, and the winds are calm. We've been blessed with favorable weather, remarked his subordinate. Indeed. And what of the enemy's disposition? Colonel Ariga nodded at the response from his vice-captain, then turned away from Gloria's view and addressed the intelligence officer who stood nearby with a handheld information terminal. Report based on intelligence gathered from infiltrating spies in Gloria, it appears the enemy is prepared to resist fiercely. I see. Would that they surrendered promptly. Carry on. Furthermore, we have reports that the Imperial forces are preventing civilians attempting to flee Gloria in response to our evacuation advisories from escaping. What? So there are still civilians in the city. Correct. Therefore, shelling of urban areas is strictly prohibited. Using civilians as human shields, are they? Regardless, it complicates matters. Indeed. For the troops landing in Gloria to seize the primary objectives of the castle and palace, they must pass through the urban areas. During this time, if they come under attack and require support, it's impossible to conduct proper support bombardment and close air support without risking civilian casualties. Let's hope nothing goes wrong. Captain, it's almost time to begin the operation, as the intelligence officer reported. Colonel Ariga frowned, realizing that the time for the operation's commencement was drawing near, and his vice-captain addressed him. Oh? Already? Then let us make our way to the Combat Command Center. Yes, sir. With one last gaze at the beautiful cityscape of Gloria, Colonel Ariga led his subordinates to the ship's Combat Command Center. All ships, assume your designated positions. Five minutes until bombardment commences. Warning, all deck personnel, evacuate to the interior of the ship. Repeat, all deck personnel, evacuate to the interior of the ship. Off the coast of Gloria approximately 15 kilometers away. Nearly 70 battleships, including the Yamato, had gathered to conduct artillery support. But, it's quite a spectacle. Yes, never before have so many battleships assembled like this. Truly, as Colonel Ariga and his vice-captain gazed at the LCD screen displaying external ship views in the combat command center, they spoke with deep emotion. And while the two conversed, the operation's commencement time approached. Two minutes before the start of the operation, all ships simultaneously rotated their main and secondary guns 90 degrees to the right, aimed their barrels at the targets, and prepared to fire. Incidentally, the battleships assembled for the Gloria capture operation came from various nations and eras, a sight that would bring tears to the eyes of any beholder. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. As the operator began the countdown, the clock's hands pointed to 7 a.m. The Grand Artillery Barrage, a preparation for the capture of Gloria, was about to begin. Commence firing. All main guns, open fire. With the Chief Gunnery Officer's command, the three triple barrel 46 cm 45 type 94 naval guns of the Yamato protruding over the starboard side of the ship emitted blinding flashes spewing out flames simultaneously instantly 
thunderous roars like ear-splitting thunder and tremendous shockwaves shook the surroundings. The sea surface, which had been undulating, momentarily dimpled due to the shockwaves, and the ship itself swayed greatly from the recoil of the simultaneous barrage. Other battleships surrounding the Yamato also emitted dense gun smoke as they fired their main guns, shrouded in darkness and swaying, until impact. 3, 2, 1, fire. Hundreds of shells flew into the air simultaneously, their whistling creating a deathly symphony. And as the requiem for imperial soldiers played, as the last note of death sounded when the grim reaper swung its scythe, Gloria erupted. A thunderous explosion filled Gloria, shockwaves raced, and mushroom-shaped pillars of scorching fire and black smoke soared into the sky. Stones blown apart by the explosion flew, and sand and soil lifted by the blast rained down like a torrential downpour. Ugh! Cough! Cough! Thank! goodness. For several seconds, soldiers lucky enough to survive the downpour of shells rose from the dust, coughing and choking on the dust. Cough. What? What is this? As the smoke enveloped the area and cleared, the soldiers' eyes were assaulted by the horrific sight of Gloria. For centuries, the gate and fortress of rocks had repelled countless invasions, but now they had vanished completely from the ground up. Apart from the coastal artillery batteries carved and built from rocks and bricks extracted and shaped from the mountains, the castles, palaces, and fortress areas of Gloria, apart from the urban areas, had become mountains of rubble due to yesterday's aerial bombardment, and numerous bowl-shaped craters had erased everything. Ugh! Where is? Everyone. As the landscape changed dramatically, soldiers, unsure of their whereabouts, stumbled about, searching for their comrades, when the next salvo from the battleship group, having completed reloading, landed. A soldier searching for his comrades was swallowed by the flash, and then he was reunited with his companions. It was at that moment when a third of the shells intended for Gloria were expended and many Imperial soldiers were incapacitated by shell shock, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, dash. Urgent communication from the Blue Ridge. Cease firing immediately. Repeat, cease firing immediately. The voice of a communications soldier echoed in the Yamato's combat command center. Cease firing. What's happened? Is something wrong? Yes, well, I don't have all the details, but it seems a saboteur infiltrated Gloria's castle and accidentally captured a defector. Apparently, the defector wishes to defect to our country. Defect? You say? Colonel Arriga's face resembled that of a startled pigeon as he processed the communication soldier's words. Yes, sir. Therefore, effective immediately cease the artillery barrage, and the landing force will expedite landing operations and move to secure Gloria. Delta Force and the 75th Ranger Regiment will deploy immediately. Delta Force will advance by helicopter, while the 75th Ranger Regiment will traverse the urban area by land toward the castle. After Delta Force secures and occupies Gloria's castle, they will attempt to transport the defector here by helicopter. If not feasible, the following 75th Ranger Regiment will transport them by land. Additionally, as preparations are completed, the main Marine forces, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Divisions, along with other units, will begin landing operations. Volume 04 Chapter 06 Inside the San Antonio class dock landing ship San Antonio, soldiers from the 75th Ranger Regiment, 1st Battalion, were enjoying a sumptuous breakfast. Hey! Have you heard about that, fools? Seated soldiers, piling meat and vegetables onto their plain plates, called out to their companions. Huh? What are you talking about? It's about Captain Whitman. Captain Whitman. Oh, you mean that story? About him surviving on the brink of death for 28 hours inside the heavily damaged M182 Abrams tank, soaked in oil and the blood of his fallen comrades, until he was rescued. Yeah. That's the one. I thought I'd fill you in since Captain Whitman is participating in this operation. Oh, I already knew about that. Heard he's turned into some kind of revenge-driven demon, hell-bent on avenging his subordinates. That seems to be true. Rumor has it he even appealed directly to His Excellency to force his way into this operation. Is that so? Seems like he's in a hurry to meet his end. Hey, don't stick your nose into other people's business so blatantly. Why yes, my apologies. Sergeant Sergeant Siag Bread furrowed his otherwise neat features and interrupted his subordinate's impolite conversation with a stern glance. At least have some decency before deployment. Jeez. Hey Siag, 
Don't be so uptight. What's wrong with a little chat? Yeah, I get it. I don't mind you chatting, but keep it appropriate. Well, fair enough. As Sergeant Sierg was being placated by his fellow sergeant, Raf Works, the battalion commander entered the mess hall with a stern expression, followed closely by his adjutant, who raised his voice. Attention all. At the sound of his voice, all soldiers in the mess hall hastily stood up. Salute the battalion commander. At the adjutant's command, the soldiers saluted the battalion commander in unison. At ease, as the battalion commander's words reached them, everyone lowered their hands and assumed the at ease position, gazing quietly at the battalion commander, awaiting his next words. Now, gentlemen, there's good news and bad news. Let's start with the bad news. We've been ordered to gear up and deploy within 15 minutes. All unit leaders are to assemble in the briefing room immediately after this. Sigh. Seriously? The battalion commander's grim announcement caused murmurs of discontent among the soldiers, accompanied by heavy sighs and muttered complaints. Now for the good news. We're leading the charge in the Gloria landing operation. That is all. Dismissed. With less than enthusiastic news. The soldiers, shoulders slumped in disappointment hastily left their meals unfinished and dashed out of the mess hall to prepare for deployment. In a corner of the vehicle storage bay on the San Antonio, weapons, ammunition, and equipment were already stacked in preparation for the planned landing operation at noon. Benefiting from such meticulous preparation, the soldiers who rushed from the mess hall to the vehicle storage bay swiftly grabbed their acquired equipment and efficiently prepared for combat. But, I wish they wouldn't suddenly change the operation schedule like this. Sergeant Ruff grumbled as he donned the multicam camouflaged improved outer tactical vest, IOTV, replacing the previous OTV, and loaded spare magazines into his pouches. Well, there's no helping it. Our top priority target, the defector, has been secured by the operatives infiltrating Gloria Castle. And you've heard, right? The defector wants to seek asylum with us, and currently. The operatives and the defector are holed up in a room in Gloria Castle, risking detection by the enemy. Yeah, I heard, but the plan's been messed up from the start. These kinds of situations always lead to something bad happening. I've got a bad feeling about this. You may have a point. Hey, Apam, hand me some rounds. What? Oh, come on, even you, Sergeant, please, spare me. My name is Akam. Please stop with the name jokes. Ha ha ha, my bad couldn't help it. Uck, seriously. While conversing with Sergeant Ruff, another soldier passing by tentatively approached Sergeant Sierg with a question about equipment. Um, sorry, Sergeant Sierg. Since our Marine Corps is supposed to land shortly after us, can we leave behind some extra gear, like water, ration packs, and night vision goggles? Oh, right. Well, no, carry the full gear just in case. And... Bring extra ammo than usual. Initially hesitant about the inquiry from his subordinate, Sergeant Sierg ultimately ordered a full equipment deployment to prepare for any eventuality. Got it, understood. Um. Then, Sergeant, what should I do with these darn heavy armor plates? Another soldier, not the one who asked the previous question about equipment, approached Sergeant Sierg, looking somewhat apprehensive, and inquired about the armor plates. Absolutely keep them on. You idiot. Wah. Well, I'm sorry. The soldier, foolishly questioning whether he could remove the life-saving armor plates, received a thunderous rebuke from Sergeant Sierg and retreated in embarrassment. Jeez. Don't ask stupid questions. Ha ha ha. You're still considerate of your subordinates, as always. Shut up. That's not it. Blushing furiously at Sergeant Ruff's teasing words, Sergeant Sierg turned away and reached for his partner which he had placed nearby. Zierg's partner is the SCAR, which comes in various models using 5.56 x 45 NATO rounds, 7.62 x 51 NATO rounds, 6.8 x 43 mm SPC rounds, and others. The SCAR minimizes differences between models to reduce maintenance costs and ensure adaptability to new calibers with minimal modifications. Its versatility allows it to switch between sniper and close quarters combat with the right stock. The majority of the 75th Ranger Regiment, including Zierg, typically carries the Scar H, also known as the MK-17, which is designed for 7.62 x 51 NATO rounds. However, for this operation, all units have been equipped with 6.8 x 43 mm SPC rounds. Now, 
Shall we go? Ziag, ready for combat, noticed something odd about one of his subordinates as they were about to leave the vehicle hangar. Hey, Park, what's with the grin? Despite the impending battle, Private Park Jackson's demeanor lacked any tension as he smiled broadly. His cheeks flushed and eyebrows relaxed. Huh? Oh, it's nothing, Sergeant. He he he. Despite Park's response, his unnaturally relaxed state and eerie smile raised Ziag's curiosity. What's that? A photo. Ziag noticed Park repeatedly glancing at something. A photo. He he he. Curious, Sergeant. You're curious, right? Park leaned in eagerly, as if waiting for the question. What's so amusing? Ziag's gaze fell on the photo. A snapshot of Park with a cute, short-haired woman, their smiles on display. Silence enveloped the group as Park proudly displayed the photo, contrasting sharply with the frozen expressions of Ziag and the surrounding soldiers. That's a death flag. So, you see, after Operation Vermilion, I'm marrying the girl in this photo. He he he. Park, scratching his head bashfully explained his plans amidst laughter. Realizing the potential danger, Ziag and his comrades huddled to discuss Park's situation. That was a death flag, right? Yeah, definitely. This doesn't look good. What should we do? If we leave him be, Park's toast. He's a good guy. It's a shame. Oh, wait a minute. Park Jackson, abbreviated PJR, with a decisive realization, Ziag and his comrades silently concurred and surrounded Park was still smiling at the photo. Huh? What's going on? Why do you all look so serious? Before Park could comprehend the situation, Ziag landed a swift right straight to his jaw. The impact sent Park reeling, his consciousness fading as he collapsed to the ground. Oh, Park suddenly collapsed. This is bad. Ziag, with exaggerated pauses, feigned concern in his monotone voice. This is terrible. He must have drunk too much. His organs are failing. A medic, pretending to check Park's condition, chimed in. Oh no. This is a disaster. The soldiers echoed, feigning distress. With Park unconscious, Ziag and his team swiftly loaded him onto a helicopter, completing paperwork for his transfer to a mainland hospital under the pretext of medical treatment for lovesickness! Exclamation mark S. Sergeant. What's happening? As Park regained consciousness, he attempted to question Ziag, but was silenced by a gag. Private Park. You are ordered to await recovery on the mainland. This directive is approved by the battalion commander. That is all. Salute! Exclamation mark timed with Ziag's command. The soldiers, barely containing their laughter, saluted Park. MMM. Sergeant. Comma confused and panicked. Park, now wearing restraints, was flown away. Leaving Ziag and the others amused by their clever ruse. Now. Let's go. He he he. My stomach hurts from laughing too much at the reason for his recovery, lovesickness. All right, let's go. With their errand complete, Ziag, accompanied by Sergeant Roof and onlookers, headed to the well deck at the rear of the USS San Antonio. As dozens of landing craft skirted through the debris of destroyed sea barriers and gates, heading towards Gloria, Ziag reiterated the mission details inside the CAC hovercraft. Before we land on Gloria, Let's review the mission once more. Make sure the changes are firmly implanted in your minds. Our initial objective as the 75th Ranger Regiment is to secure a foothold on Gloria. Following that, Delta will perform a Holoborn assault to seize the castle. We will act as bait, drawing attention away from the castle to hinder or prevent enemy reinforcements. If, for any reason, we cannot transport the VIPs by helicopter, we will proceed through the urban area to retrieve them return to the foothold, and transport them by sea. Understood? Yes, sir. One minute to touchdown. Powered by gas turbine engines, the LCAC, landing craft air cushion, swiftly glided across the ocean surface at 40 knots, its large propellers with four blades and shrouds churning up immense sprays of waves as it approached the sandy beach. Let's go. Pump up the energy. Sir. Yes, sir. Zeke and his comrades braced themselves awaiting the moment of landing with fervor, approaching shore. Prepare for landing. Dozens of Lukaks simultaneously beached on the sands of Gloria, initiating covering fire support with mounted M2 heavy machine guns and MK-19 automatic grenade launchers to aid the landing forces. Gunfire and explosions reverberated indiscriminately, filling the beach with the sounds of battle amid clouds of dust and smoke. Cease fire. Cease fire. Commence landing. Go. Go. 
go, go. As the cat's skirts deflated, fully grounding themselves, the covering fire ceased, and the front ramps opened. Soldiers and kits enhancing defensive capabilities were unloaded, including reinforced armor kits and upsized M1151 armored HMMWVs, high mobility multi purpose wheeled vehicles, their engines upgraded for the task. No counter attack, not even a sight of the enemy. It's a relief that we landed without much trouble but it's eerie how quiet it is. Yeah, feels like the calm before the storm. While Zeke and his team had anticipated facing some resistance upon landing, they were taken aback by the complete absence of enemy attacks. Nevertheless, the 75th Ranger Regiment, having achieved their primary objective flawlessly, efficiently secured the coastal area, which resembled a lunar landscape with numerous craters caused by repeated airstrikes and naval bombardments. They safely established a bridgehead, accomplishing their mission. Helicopters of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, commonly known as the Night Stalkers, pass one after another over the heads of the 75th Ranger Regiment, who have secured the beachhead, making the sound of their rotors flapping. It looks like the Rangers have successfully secured the beachhead. Second Lieutenant Graham Anchorage of Delta Force, sitting on the external bench of MH6 Little Bird, looks at the 75th, which fills the sandy beach that has been brutally dug up and torn up by repeated shelling. That's how I felt when I saw the soldiers of the Ranger Regiment. The enemy is nowhere to be seen. Where did he go? Well then, did the shelling blow everything away, or are you waiting with bated breath for us? I wonder which one. That's all there is to talking. Prepare to descend. In the blink of an eye, the MH6 was passing over a sandy beach and over a city area lined with white buildings. When Ensign Graham was responding to a question from a soldier who was wondering why he couldn't see the enemy, the pilot lowers the altitude and prepares for landing, prompting Ensign Graham and the others to prepare for descent. Okay, shall I go to work? Wearing Special Forces Body Armor SPCS, Cyrus, with Multicam Camouflage, Lieutenant Graham, who put on his rugged black helmet and pulled the cocking lever of his H&K HK 416 and loaded the first bullet into the chamber is the center of Gloria. Looking at the castle towering over a small mountain. Huh? There are four archers on the castle wall. Eliminate them. A pilot who was about to land in the castle courtyard noticed an archer on the castle wall trying to shoot an arrow at him. Learn. Of the six soldiers aboard the MH6, second Lieutenant Graham and another soldier, who are ready to attack and have a good angle of fire, respond to the pilot's request, raise their guns, and pull the trigger. Then, Along with the sound of a gunshot, a muzzle flash erupted, and bullets were fired in succession. Immediately after that, the enemy soldier's body suddenly flopped around, and then he collapsed helplessly, like a puppet whose strings had been cut. Target down. Clear. A large amount of fresh blood dripped out from the body of the soldier who died on the castle wall after being hit by a bullet, staining the area bright red. Okay. Let's land. After Ensign Graham and his men eliminated the enemy soldiers, MH6 slipped over the castle walls and into the castle courtyard. Go, go, go. The moment the MH6's skids, landing legs, touch down in the castle courtyard, Ensign Graham and his friends leave the aircraft all at once for safety and land on the castle grounds. See you. I hope you're safe. Having safely lowered Ensign Graham and the others, the pilot called out to Ensign Graham and the others, then immediately lifted the MH6 up into the sky to give way to the following aircraft and return to the mother ship. Spread out and move forward. Learn, huh? The enemy has appeared. As a number of MH6s slid into the courtyard one after another and dropped off Delta members, Imperial soldiers guarding the castle appeared one after another. Assault. <laughs> Fit the arrow. Prepare how to shoot. Yay. Let's show off the power of our magic knights to the inferior races who can't even use magic. Start chanting. Response. Roger that. And with that, infantrymen armed with swords and spears surged toward Delta, who had just landed at the castle, while archers and wizards from atop the castle walls and windows launched a relentless barrage of attacks. However, 
the most threatening archers and wizards were swiftly targeted and killed, leaving the infantrymen, who had bravely charged forward with swords and spears but without any cover, to be picked off like targets in a shooting range. Thus, after 150 Delta members landed in the castle courtyard, within just 30 minutes, Delta had completely taken control of the area surrounding the courtyard. Furthermore, they successfully secured both the saboteur and the defector, who had been hiding in a storage room near the courtyard. Well, time to withdraw. It ended more smoothly than I expected. The enemy withdrew as soon as we dealt them a blow, Lieutenant Graham said with a surprised expression, pleased with the progress. Originally, the plan was for Delta to fully secure the castle and hold it until the main Marine Corps unit arrived. However, due to the overwhelming number of enemy soldiers holed up in the castle, Delta could only manage to secure the courtyard, abandoning the idea of complete control over the castle. As per the revised plan, after transporting the defector, Delta was to withdraw from the castle. Not yet, Lieutenant Graham. We can't let our guard down until we've safely boarded the defector onto the helicopter. Besides, even though it's quiet now, if the enemy soldiers inside the castle launch a coordinated attack, we'll be in serious danger no matter how capable we are. One of the team members interjected. Yeah, the odds are like a hundred to one, another added, correcting Lieutenant Graham's optimistic words. We're well aware of that. Oh, our ride's here. Lieutenant Graham said, pointing to the MH-60K Nighthawk descending slowly into the courtyard. What? Move, evacuate, evacuate. It was too late when Lieutenant Graham, sensing danger, shouted. Carefully descending amidst the storm and noise, the MH-60K, attempting to land in the courtyard, had its tail boom, connecting the fuselage to the tail rotor, shattered by a sharp blow from a dragon knight that descended like a whirlwind slicing through the clouds. Darn it. Mayday. Mayday. Granger 02. Hit. Hit. Damn. We're going down. Despite the pilot's desperate attempts to control the wildly thrashing MH-60K, the aircraft had already become uncontrollable, reaching a point of no return. With the tail boom severed, the aircraft could no longer counteract the torque generated by the main rotor, initiating a spin that culminated in a crash. As the aircraft crashed, its impact caused it to bounce and tilt, flinging massive blades and debris like a whirlwind, assaulting the surroundings. What there? Lieutenant Graham, who had instinctively taken cover, emerged unscathed, only to witness a grim scene unfolding. The MH-60K, meant to retrieve the defector, lay sideways in the swirling dust, completely destroyed. Several Delta members, possibly hit by debris during the crash, groaned in pain on the ground. And the Dragon Knight, the unfortunate victim of the broken blade, lay in two pieces, alongside its mount, both sprawled in a gruesome manner. Right. The defector, distracted by the horrific scene, Lieutenant Graham suddenly remembered the reason they were here, the defector. His gaze wandered around, trying to locate the defector amidst the chaos. Uck. Dot. Damn. With widened eyes, Lieutenant Graham spotted the lifeless body of the defector, strewn carelessly nearby. He realized that their mission to retrieve the defector had ended in the worst possible outcome. Primary objective deceased. I repeat, the primary objective is deceased. The mission is a failure. Determined retreat via helicopter impossible due to the appearance of the Dragon Knight. Immediately dispatch ground units. Relay this to the Ranger Regiment and Headquarters. Following the failure to retrieve the defector and the impossibility of helicopter retreat, a request for retrieval by the Ranger Regiment was sent to headquarters. Quick! Retrieve the wounded. Medics. Medics. Medics rushed around to retrieve the wounded, and cries for medics echoed from all directions. The skies still swarming with dragon knights. Damn it! Weren't we supposed to have air superiority? The enemy has launched a counterattack. Now everything's chaotic. Damn it! The enemy here has come back to life. They're coming. Everyone. Retreat to the rear tower. We'll be slaughtered if we stay in the courtyard. Having rescued the crew from the crashed MH-60K and retrieved the wounded, Delta barricaded themselves in the tower nearest to the courtyard to protect themselves from the advancing enemy. This. This is bad. No. It already is. Lieutenant Graham muttered quietly as he helped support the wounded. His words proving to be an ominous foreshadowing of the turmoil about to engulf Brabham. Volume 04 Chapter 07 Delta Force, which stormed into Gloria's castle.
received the worst news that they lost the key target, the defector, and were cut off without a way out, spreading rapidly throughout the entire army. Emergency transmission from Delta. They urgently request a recovery team. Transmission from headquarters. Immediate orders to send a unit to the castle to retrieve Delta. I see. All right. Send the 1st Battalion to retrieve Delta. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions will continue to focus on securing the bridgehead. Understood. Upon receiving the request from Delta and orders from headquarters, commands were issued from the regimental headquarters to the soldiers of the 75th Ranger Regiment, who promptly sprang into action. Zeke. Looks like things have gone south. Roof. Yeah. Seems like your prediction was right. In the midst of the hurried deployment of the 1st Battalion, Sergeant Zeke Bread and his comrade, Sergeant Roof Wax, discussed with grim faces what they had talked about before their deployment, now turned into reality. You two, hurry up and get on. Sir. Yes, sir. Well then, see you later, Zeke. Don't you die on me. I know. You neither. Yeah. Hastened by their superiors, Sergeants Zeke and Roof abruptly ended their conversation, exchanged a fist bump with a smile, and boarded separate M1151 armored HMMWVs. Everyone on board? Yes, sir. The 1st Battalion is fully embarked. All right, let's go. As the soldiers of the 1st Battalion boarded their Humvees and M939 cargo trucks, Vehicles equipped with armored plates made by layering 5mm thick steel and ceramic plates instead of canvas on the cargo bed, with gun ports and roof-mounted gun mounts fitted with dual M2 heavy machine guns, moved out in a convoy to retrieve Delta, stranded deep in enemy territory. All personnel, be on alert. Salute. Who are, the soldiers of the 2nd and 3rd battalions, left behind on the sandy beach saluted as they watched the 1st Battalion, marching straight in a column formation, invading the city streets of Gloria one after another. It's full of enemies. As Zeke and his team entered the gleaming white city streets, suspicious figures resembling Imperial soldiers watched the 1st Battalion's convoy from every corner and alley. Sergeant, can we shoot them? Gorman, a specialist manning the M2 heavy machine gun in the upper gun mount, Asked Zeke for permission to fire as he aimed his weapon from behind the additional armor and thick bulletproof glass. No, we can't. Though I think they're enemies, we can't rule out the possibility that they're civilians. But, stand down. Firing on civilians is a big no unless they pose an immediate threat. Understood. With a frustrated tone, Gorman complied, and Zeke turned his gaze upwards. If only we could reach the castle smoothly. But that's unlikely. Watching the aerial battle for air superiority overhead, where F-A-18E slash F Super Hornets, F-35C Lightning is, and F-14 Tomcats wreaked havoc on the Dragon Knights, Zeke dismissed his optimistic thoughts, poised his Scar H out of the assistant driver's side window, ready to fire at any moment. And it was when the soldiers of the 1st Battalion, nervously enduring the eerie silence akin to the calm before the storm, had covered about half of the 20-kilometer journey to the castle and entered a large crossroads. Whoa! Well, suddenly, a thick, massive wall appeared, blocking Zeke's Humvee's path. Watch out! Specialist Ritz Carlton, gripping the steering wheel, slammed on the brakes instinctively, narrowly avoiding a collision with the wall. What? What is this? Enemy ambush! Enemies everywhere! Though they narrowly avoided a collision, the sudden appearance of the wall rising from the ground, as if with a mind of its own, split the convoy in half, leaving Zeke in a panic. Then, Gorman's sharp voice rang out, followed by the rattling sound of the M2 heavy machine gun. Damn it! It's an ambush. Turn left, left, take the left turn. With enemies popping out from windows of buildings facing the crossroads, firing bullets, magic, and arrows, Zeke made a split-second decision while firing back with his Scar H. What? B but. Sergeant, what about our allies beyond the wall? However, upon hearing Zeke's orders, Private Carlton hesitated, wondering if they could leave their comrades behind, trapped beyond the wall. They're beyond saving. Move. If we stay here, we'll end up like Swiss cheese too. Hurry up and move. Move out. As explosions and cries of agony echoed continuously from beyond the wall, and the unmistakable sound of magic weapons moving. Zeke reluctantly gave up on rescuing Sergeant Roofwax, who was in the Humvee right in front of them, 
and chose to retreat from the scene to regroup. Why yes, sir, with Zeke showering the enemies with 6.8 times 43 mm SPC rounds with a fierce expression, and as enemy bullets embedded into the bulletproof windshield, the driver nodded repeatedly, sharply turned the steering wheel, and pressed down hard on the accelerator. This is Sergeant Pared. All vehicles behind. Follow me. We're getting out of this damn place. Understood. Zeke's Humvee's rear wheel spun, kicking up dust as they sped away like a startled rabbit, followed desperately by the other vehicles in the convoy. Whoa. That was close. Just as Zeke's lead allowed the convoy to escape the crossroads, several magic weapons that had ravaged and devoured their prey pushed aside the wreckage of destroyed vehicles and broke through the wall, emerging onto the crossroads. Phew. If we had stayed there we'd be dead too. Sergeant Bread, you're amazing. In the back of the convoy, soldiers in the Humvee expressed their gratitude for Sieg's quick thinking. Sergeant, which way should we go? For now, turn right at the next corner and keep going straight. As bullets from two newly deployed Imperial Army rifles, the Mini Rifle, which uses many bullets known for their superior power, range, accuracy, and rate of fire compared to the muskets previously used, and the Magic Gun, which compresses the user's magical power into energy projectiles, rained down like a storm. Sieg and his team desperately pushed forward, shooting at anything and everything in their path. Roger. Well, damn it. Not again. However, Imperial mages, lying in wait at the front of the advancing Humvee, conjured walls once more to stop and eliminate Sieg's group, who had escaped from the kill zone. Don't stop. Push through. Sergeant. R. R. To stop was to die. Knowing this, Sieg kicked Private Carlton's foot away from the brake pedal, which he instinctively reached for when the wall appeared, and slammed his own foot on the accelerator, crashing into the forming wall at full speed. Gwaaah! NGH! As they collided with the wall rising from the ground with a thunderous impact, the Humvee was rocked by a tremendous shock. Let go! Keep driving! Ah Roger! Forced through the barrier, Sieg and his team found themselves confronted by more enemies lying in wait. Sieg withdrew his foot from the accelerator and directed Private Carlton to focus on counter-attacking while he himself took the wheel. This is the worst situation. As Sieg drove, exchanging fire from within the Humvee and surveying the enemy's movements, he noticed something unexpected. Besides Imperial soldiers, Irregular troops such as Gloria's residents and adventurers were also attacking the convoy. Get out of our town. Die, invaders. Death to the barbarians who ally with subhumans. Let justice's hammer fall upon those who defy the teachings of God. Kill the infidels. As a subcapital of the empire, Gloria was home to many devout followers of the Round Church. Consequently, non-believers who did not adhere to the teachings of the Round Church, the soldiers of Brabem faced merciless attacks from the faithful. Oh God, grant me strength. God, grant me the power to vanquish our enemies. Bestow upon me the power to strike down the infidels with justice's hammer. On the second floor of a building along the convoy's path, a young apprentice adventurer muttered such words as he concealed himself in the window's shadow, silently awaiting the convoy's arrival. Ha! 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 Sensing the convoy drawing near with an unfamiliar engine noise, the young boy knocked an arrow on his bow, exhaling steadily in rhythm to sharpen his focus to the utmost, and as the convoy approached, just as it drew near, the boy held his breath, leaned out of the window, drew his bowstring taut with all his might, aimed in an instant, and released his grip on the arrow and string. Damn it, enemies everywhere. Sergeant, we need to move. Gwaa the arrow released by the boy pierced through the head of Private Grumman who was manning the upper gun seat and firing the M2 heavy machine gun. Well, Grumman? Sergeant, Sergeant. Grumman's, what's wrong? No way. Stunned, Sierg witnessed Private Grumman's body collapse from the upper gun seat into the vehicle. His body limp, eyes rolled back, blood gushing from the arrow wound in his neck. He's dead, he's dead, Sergeant. It was clear that Private Grumman had been killed in action. Damn it, damn it. How dare you kill him? You bastards. Burning with rage at the loss of his subordinate, Sia gamed the enemy gun at an Imperial soldier about to fire back, and shot him dead. Someone, man the gun seat. Roger, I'll do it. Take this. You bastards. You ooh. A soldier seated in the rear quickly responded to Sia's command, swiftly manned the gun seat, cocked the lever on the right side of the M2 heavy machine gun twice with force, slammed a new bullet into the chamber, 
gripped the wooden handle of the grip tightly, pressed the trigger in the shape of an H with both thumbs, and began firing. Gunshots that reassured allies and terrified enemies echoed as 12.7 by 99 NATO bullets felled the enemy. And so, as Sierg and his team continued to run desperately, the number of incoming bullets gradually decreased until finally, there were no bullets flying at all, and the enemy soldiers were nowhere to be seen. Has the attack stopped? As Sierg puzzled over the sudden disappearance of the enemy soldiers who had ceased their attack, he emerged onto a large square. Did they retreat? He wondered. Had the enemy soldiers vanished because they had broken through the encirclement? No matter how much he thought about it, he couldn't understand. There were no enemy soldiers in the square or its surroundings, only silence prevailed. Well, for now, it's a successful escape. Sierg remarked. Th thank goodness. I thought I was going to die. One of his comrades exclaimed. Inside the halted Humvee, Sierg and his companions breathed a collective sigh of relief. Sergeant Bread, you did well. I'll take over command from here on, said Captain Klaus Kirby. The highest ranking officer present. Understood, Captain Kirby. Although Sierg had been leading by circumstance, he willingly relinquished command to Captain Klaus Kirby the highest-ranking officer among them. Phew, you did well too. I'll count on you next time, Sierg said, patting Private Carlton on the shoulder in appreciation. T thank you, Sergeant, Carlton replied, smiling bashfully as he received the pat. Now, let's move Graman's body to the truck while we can. Just as Sierg and his team were regrouping in the square after narrowly escaping, they noticed someone's voice crackling through the radio in the vehicle. ZZZ. ZZZ. Someone. Can anyone respond? This is Wax. ZZZ. Enemy. Escaping. ZZZ. Rescue. Hurry. ZZZ. ZZZ. Wounded soldiers are. ZZZ. No way. Despite the heavy interference making it hard to discern, Sierg was certain that the voice seeking help over the radio belonged to Sergeant Roof Wax. Sergeant Bread here. Roof. Is that you? Respond. ZZZ. Please. Someone respond. ZZZ. Damn it. Seizing the radio mic instinctively, Sierg called out to Sergeant Roof Wax. But whether due to poor signal or other factors, his voice didn't reach the other end. Captain. Captain Kirby. Realizing that Sergeant Roof was alive, Sierg leapt out of the Humvee and rushed to Captain Kirby, who was coordinating with headquarters via radio. What's wrong? Sergeant Roof is. I mean, Sergeant Wax is alive. Ah, uh, yes. I just learned that through headquarters as well. It seems around 50 soldiers, including Sergeant Wax, are alive. Then we must rescue them quickly. Unfortunately, the orders from headquarters are to rendezvous with the isolated Delta unit. Are there other rescue teams heading there? No, none are heading there. W what? Stunned by the cruel news from Captain Kirby. Sierg fell silent. While we've mostly eliminated the aerial threats, it seems the Grand Forces are mounting a full-scale counter-attack. Our regiment is also engaged with enemy forces on the beachfront, unable to send out rescue teams. So, we must go rescue them ourselves. Sergeant Bread, I understand your feelings, but... Sergeant Wax is two kilometers deep into enemy territory from here. Do you think we can make it? Captain Kirby spoke while glancing at the grim state of the remaining soldiers, trying to rescue Sergeant Wax amidst concentrated enemy fire again is impossible. Right now, our best bet is to reach the castle. Even if we were to rescue Sergeant Wax, we wouldn't have the strength to head to the castle. Afterward, the survivors of the 1st Battalion were mostly wounded and no longer operational as a combat unit akin to being wiped out in military terms. I understand. Upon hearing Captain Kirby's words, Sierk lowered his head and turned away. Um, enemy attack. Ready your aim. Don't shoot until the enemy fires back. Draw them in sufficiently before shooting. As Captain Kirby watched Sierk depart, exuding frustration at being unable to assist his comrades and the grim resolve of having to abandon them twice. A sentry soldier raised a voice. What are those guys? Feels eerie. Under Captain Kirby's command, soldiers swiftly shouldered their scars, perplexed by the enemy's peculiar behavior. Emerging from six paths leading to the square, numerous Imperial soldiers appeared, dragging weapons such as swords and guns, slowly approaching Sierg's group. Fire. Sensing something unsettling about the slowly advancing enemy soldiers, Captain Kirby, unable to tolerate drawing them in any longer, issued the order to attack. 
and the square was filled with the simultaneous sound of gunfire. What? However, seeing that the enemies, despite being showered with bullets, kept walking, the soldiers involuntarily ceased shooting. No way, can't be true. They are zombies. Shaken, the soldiers of the 1st Battalion trembled as the Imperial soldiers, despite being shot, continued walking with crazed laughter. Mujahideen, are they similar to the jihadists from that time? However, Siok, having experience in the Middle East, knew that the enemy wasn't zombies or the like. Muj. What is that, Sergeant? Mujahideen, warriors who participate in jihad, the holy war of Islam, in accordance with the principles of Islam. So, what's the connection between those Mujahideens and them? Well, simply put, they're high on drugs, those guys. With a disdainful remark, Siak destroyed the head of an enemy soldier, who was high on drugs and oblivious to the fear of death. With a 6.8x43 mm SPC bullet from the Scar H. TCH, not powerful enough. It'll take 7.62 mm bullets to kill them. Even after being shot in the head by Siak, an Imperial soldier continued walking for two or three steps before suddenly collapsing. It's the head. Destroy the enemy's heads. They're drugged out. Bullets to the body won't do much. And then two gunners. Spread your bullets. Whether it's the body or the head, it doesn't matter with 12.7 millimeters. Just shred the enemies without mercy. Understood. Upon hearing Siag's advice, the soldiers of the 1st Battalion resumed their attack, using scars to immobilize enemy soldiers' legs and M2 heavy machine guns to destroy them. However, due to the artillery bombardment conducted in the morning, many soldiers suffered from shell shock and were subsequently sent to the battlefield, heavily drugged causing the 1st Battalion to struggle. Everyone, get in the vehicles. Head straight to the castle and rendezvous with Delta. Feeling the imminent danger posed by the relentless waves of enemies, Captain Kirby issued the order. This is Captain Kirby. What? Roger that. Sergeant Bread. What's going on? Captain Kirby, who had jumped onto Humvee, exchanged words with the headquarters via radio and then called for Zeke. Rejoice. The situation has changed. We're heading out to rescue Sergeant Wax and the others. Dot 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 Roger that. After blinking two or three times in response to Captain Kirby's words, Zeke grinned and shouted loudly. Let's go. Guys, we're going to rescue our comrades. That Sergeant. Why are we suddenly heading out for a rescue mission? Riding on Humvee and facing the microphone of the radio. Corporal Carlton asked loudly to Zeke, who was roaring with enthusiasm. Well. Thanks to the Air Force regaining complete air superiority, the Night Stalkers can now go to Delta to pick them up. Oh, and Kirby requested close air support, so the AC-130 will also be coming out. Huh? AC-130? But there are no land bases around here. Where is it flying from? Didn't you read the operational plan distributed in advance? Geez. What do you think we brought those four Forrestal class aircraft carriers for? at the expense of crushing the Forrestal class carriers. Huh? You don't mean? That's right. The AC-130 launches from the aircraft carrier. No way. Zeke laughed gleefully, while Corporal Carlton's jaw dropped in surprise as if it had dislocated. In the waters 50 kilometers away from Gloria, the four Forrestal class aircraft carriers, CVA-59 Forrestal, CVA-60 Saratoga, CVA-61 Ranger, and CVA-62 Independence, were roaming. On the flight decks of each carrier, one massive aircraft was parked. I never expected we'd be deployed from the first day of the Gloria landing battle. Well, isn't that fine? It's better than having no chance to shine at all. I suppose so. Inside the specially modified AC-130 you spooky too, the pilot and co-pilot bantered while conducting equipment checks and preparing for takeoff. Hydraulic system. OK. Auxiliary rocket system, OK. All systems are green, ready for takeoff. All right. This is which bird 01? Takeoff. Preparations are complete. Requesting permission for takeoff. And when the aircraft was ready for takeoff, the AC-130U, with its four engines roaring, awaited the moment quietly. Which bird 01? Permission granted for takeoff from the Forestal Bridge. Good luck. Which bird 01? Roger. Taking off now. As the aircraft carrier Forrestal accelerated at a maximum speed of 34 knots into the wind, the pilot of the AC-130U responded briefly and slowly pushed the throttle lever forward. The engine output increased, 
and the roar of the engines grew louder, however, the AC-130U couldn't take off because it was held in place by wheel chocks, but that was also part of the plan, maximum engine output, let's go. When the engine output reached its maximum, the pilot signaled the deck crew through the small window of the cockpit to remove the wheel chocks. Wheel chocks removed, as the deck crew, who had been crouching under the aircraft, removed the wheel chocks as instructed, the aircraft began to slowly run on the Forrestal's flight deck, gradually accelerating. Not yet. Not yet. In the shaking cockpit, the pilot calculated the timing. Now, auxiliary rocket system activated. The moment they passed by the side of the Forrestal's bridge, the pilot shouted, and the co-pilot pressed the switch to activate the auxiliary rocket system. Whoa. Ark. When the auxiliary rocket system activated, the rockets attached to the rear of the aircraft spewed flames, accelerating the aircraft rapidly, and the tremendous G-forces pushed the pilot and co-pilot against their seats. Ark. Resisting the onslaught of G-forces, the aircraft, laden with ammunition and fuel, Equipped with one Gore 12 25mm Gatling gun, one 40mm cannon, and one 105mm howitzer on top of its C-130 Hercules based high short takeoff and landing capabilities, floated momentarily, then began to plummet towards the sea, falling can't bear it. Second auxiliary rocket ignition, ignition just before the aircraft touched down on the sea. The second auxiliary rocket, installed as a backup, ignited. As a result, the aircraft forcefully soared back into the sky. Successful takeoff. We did it, Captain. Phew. That was close. But we did it. The relieved captain, having regained altitude, patted his chest in relief. We're flying, we're flying. I thought I was going to wet myself. Yeah, me too. It was quite a thrill. Sorry, I wet myself. What are those guys in the back doing? No. More importantly, what happened to the others? The captain, who was exasperated by the commotion inside the aircraft, suddenly came to his senses and asked the co-pilot. Ah, uh, let's see. It seems which bird O2 also successfully took off. Ah, captain, which bird O3 failed to take off and crashed into the sea? O4 was successful. I see. While waiting for the companion aircraft scheduled to take off later. Which bird O1 unfortunately witnessed the crash of which bird O3, which attempted to take off from CVA-61 Ranger? Well, at least three out of four aircraft were able to take off safely. After watching the frantic rescue efforts of the crew members in small boats swarming around the crashed aircraft to rescue the crew of which bird O3, the three AC-130 US formed up and flew towards Gloria. Volume 04 Chapter 08 Countless aircraft bearing the Crimson Circle, the national emblem of Brabham, affixed to their fuselage, crisscrossed the vast skies of Gloria. This is quite a spectacle, isn't it? I bet the air traffic controllers are screaming by now. But we need to be careful. It's getting a bit crowded up here. Having regained air superiority from the Dragon Knights, the Parabem forces, with their main Marine Corps divisions, deployed a significant number of aircraft to assist the ground forces under pressure and to buy time until the main landing force, the three Marine Corps divisions, could complete their preparations for landing. As a result, the skies over Gloria appeared congested. Now then, which bird O1 to O2 and O3 split up from here? One aircraft each. Which bird O2 is to support the 75th Ranger Regiment? Which bird O3? Assist the Delta unit isolated in the castle. Will provide support for the 1st Battalion. Which bird O2? Understood. Which bird O3? Understood. Escorted by a squadron of F-35 C Lightning II aircraft from the CVN-77 George H. W. Bush, 3 AC-130 U Spooky II aircraft arrived over Gloria, ready to provide support to the Delta unit isolated in the castle. The 75th Ranger Regiment engaged in combat on the beach, and the 1st Battalion heading for the rescue. Hawkeye 01 to which bird 01? Over. Which bird 01, flying towards the location of the 1st Battalion, received a call from the A60 liters Black Hawk. Hawkeye 01, equipped with special electronic equipment, external antennas, and command and control systems, flying alongside the AC-130U. Which bird O-1 here? Go ahead. We, Hawkeye O-1, are tasked with guiding the 1st Battalion's route. Counting on you. Which bird O-1, understood. Which bird O-1, 
joined by Hawkeye 01, who arrived to provide real-time optimal route guidance to the 1st Battalion heading for the rescue, rushed towards the 1st Battalion. Huh? Is that which bird 01 here? The commander of the 1st Battalion responded. This is Captain Kirby of the 1st Battalion. Finally, you've arrived. We've been waiting for you. Apologies for the delay. We will commence close air support from now on. Requesting instructions for attack targets. Sorry, but we don't have the luxury for that. We're barely holding on with the counterattacks. Eliminate the enemies at your discretion. Which bird 01, seeking instructions for attack targets to provide close air support, was at a loss for words at Captain Kirby's response. They're asking too much. Captain, what should we do? It seems they're really stretched thin. Oh well. We'll leave the final decision on attack targets to our guys. Understood. Realizing they couldn't receive instructions for attack targets from the 1st Battalion, who are heading for the rescue under concentrated enemy fire, the captain and the co-pilot nodded to each other and entered support mode. Maintain altitude at 2,000 meters. Begin orbiting with a bank angle of 30 to 35 degrees. Altitude 2,000 meters. Bank angle 30 to 35 degrees. Initiating orbit. As the captain issued instructions to the co-pilot, which bird 01, in support mode, began orbiting, repeating a left turn orbit around ground targets, around the designated area. Orders from the captain, the primary attack targets are enemy soldiers hindering the advancement of friendly forces. Additionally, only attack houses along the road. It seems there are still civilians inside. And make sure not to hit our allies. Be extremely cautious of friendly fire. That's all. Understood. Acknowledging the captain's orders, the gunners, who had been preparing for firing, responded enthusiastically and immediately moved on to the attack. First, the 105mm howitzers targeted and began shelling enemy soldiers emerging from houses hidden after the convoy had passed, adding to the devastation of the Imperial soldiers who were cocky and unaware of the danger. Then, a barrage of bullets from the Gore 12 25mm Gatling guns and the 40mm machine guns rained down on the enemy soldiers. The 25mm Gatling guns swept along the houses annihilating the enemy soldiers hiding behind the walls, while the 40mm machine guns pulverized enemy soldiers lurking inside the houses. Wall spotted 75 meters ahead of the convoy. Eliminated. Understood. Two magical weapons spotted at the corner of the T-junction, 300 meters ahead of the convoy. Handle with the 40mm machine gun. Yes, sir. While the enemy infantry units are on the move. Let's eliminate them with the 25mm Gatling gun while we still have visual confirmation. Understood. Relying on the information relayed from Hawkeye 01, guiding the 1st Battalion to optimal positions, the barrage raining down from which Bird 01 hovering in the sky intensified fiercely. Utilizing FLA, forward-looking infrared, the tactical officer accurately directed attacks on enemy vehicles, steadily eliminating them. Seems like our separated allied units are nearby. Hold fire. Roger that. Confirming the halt of the convoy in front of buildings where the separated allies were barricaded, the tactical officer ordered a ceasefire, temporarily halting which bird 01's support bombardment. This is the 1st Battalion, we've linked up with allies. I repeat, we've linked up with allies. Thanks to the support from Hawkeye 01 and Witchbird 01, voices of joy rose from the 1st Battalion as they finally reached the location where their comrades were. Message from Captain Kirby to Witchbird 01, grateful for the aerial support. Thanks to you, we managed to reunite with our comrades, more than happy to help. We're returning now as we're out of ammunition. Over. Having expended all ammunition in close air support, Witchbird 01 decided to return to its mothership the Forester, for replenishment. After waving to the Allies, on the ground and responding with a banking maneuver, the aircraft turned its nose towards the Forester. Now, the real challenge begins. Yes, shall we brace ourselves? The pilot and co-pilot of Witchbird 01, anticipating the daunting task of landing on the Forester, tightened their nerves and returned to the mothership, renewing their focus amidst the relaxed tension. Well, partner, you're still kicking, huh? That's my line. Roof, glad you made it out in one piece. Hey hey hey, I wasn't about to kick the bucket while she wasn't around. Good to see you're holding up. Out of about half of the 1st Battalion, approximately 300 individuals, who had been ambushed and separated by the Imperial Army, 
55 were fortunate enough to survive, among them, Sergeant Truth and Zeke, who had been separated, reunited with a hearty fist bump just like they did when they parted ways. So, what's the current situation? And what happened to Delta stranded in the castle? We've only been getting bits and pieces of information over here, so it's a bit hazy. Well, the situation is more or less at a stalemate. Delta was successfully retrieved by the Night Stalkers, who went to pick them up. I see. So, what's our next move? Retreat? Even if we wanted to retreat, we have too many casualties, and besides, our regiment is still engaged in combat. We'll probably have to hold out here until the marines arrive. Well, that makes sense. It's smarter to wait for reinforcements here than to push ourselves too hard. Sergeant Spread and Wax, our allies' helicopters are coming to deliver supplies and evacuate the severely wounded soldiers. Help them out. Understood. Leaning against the walls of a building, Zeke and Sergeant Roof sat down and continued their conversation, only to be called into action by Captain Kirby who was in charge. Whoa. Getting covered in sand here. Bringing goggles was a smart move. As Zeke and Sergeant Roof, along with a squad of soldiers, climbed onto the rooftop of the building, they were assaulted by the swirling dust carried by the wind. Thanks to this wind, uck, getting sand in my mouth. Keep quiet, or you'll end up eating a mouthful of sand. Tell me about it. As Zeke and the others, frustrated by the flying dust, maintained vigilance in the vicinity, Several helicopters flew in formation towards the at low altitude. They're here. Huh? We're getting a transmission. As Zeke, who was watching the helicopters, realized that there was communication coming through his radio. He tuned in. This is Sergeant Bread. Go ahead. ZZZ, ZZZ, ZZZ. This is Private Park Jackson. Sergeant, do you copy? The moment he heard that voice, Zeke froze. No way. It can't be, Park. That's right. It's Park, and let me tell you, Sergeant, it's terrible. If that helicopter hadn't turned back to San Antonio due to engine trouble, I would have been on my way back to the mainland for sure. Where are you right now? Right now, I'm on the escort helicopter for transporting supplies to where you are, the Black Hawk. But, is something wrong, Sergeant? Listening to Park's words with a sense of shock, Zeke shouted to all the soldiers on the rooftop, all personnel. Tighten up perimeter security. However, Zeke's command was a little too late. Wah, we're in trouble. We're targeted by a ballista. Emergency evasion. Break, break. Huh? Well? Voices like these echoed through the radio as their helicopters suddenly dispersed. TCH Sweeper 06 has been hit. Direct hit on the tail rotor. The aircraft is unstable. It's going down. Uck, oh. This is bad, Sergeant. Unfortunately. A massive arrow fired from the burlister hit directly on the tail rotor of Sweeper 06, the helicopter Park was on. With the control of the aircraft lost, Sweeper 06 spun out of control, losing altitude rapidly. Sweeper 06 hit, going down. Repeat, Sweeper 06 has been hit. Dot 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 Black Hawk down, Black Hawk down. Sweeper 06 is going down. Repeat, Sweeper 06 is going down. And the Sweeper 06 flying at low altitude, crashed in a matter of moments, watched by everyone. They could only watch in stunned silence as Sweeper 06, carrying Private Park, crashed. Volume 04 Chapter 09 How much further until we reach the crash site? Only three blocks remaining. Damn, that's far. Under Captain Kirby's orders, Zeke led 20 soldiers, traversing the dusty streets of Gloria on foot, fending off enemy soldiers emerging from every corner. Their objective was clear, to rescue the crew of the downed Sweeper 06. Zeke and his team refrained from using their Humvee to avoid drawing attention and because the route to the crashed site was too narrow for it to pass through. While a longer route could have been taken with the Humvee, it would have taken too much time to reach their destination. Hawkeye 01 to Bread Squad. Numerous enemy troops and civilians are swarming the Sweeper 06 crash site. Sergeants Rush to get and Taylor Gohan, dropped from Sweeper 02, are currently engaged in combat but are outnumbered. Hurry. Understood. We're doing our best here. Responding casually to Hawkeye 01's report, Zeke pushed forward with haste. Wait. Stop. Sensing a foreboding feeling as they approached a corner, Zeke raised his voice and gestured to his soldiers to halt. Damn it. They're shooting at us. As Zeke slowly peeked around the corner, numerous bullets struck the wall ahead. We're in a hurry here. In retaliation. 
Zeke extended his scar H around the corner, squeezing the trigger, eliciting screams from the ambushing enemy soldiers. Grenades got it on it. Upon Zeke's command, the soldiers promptly threw MK3A2 offensive grenades towards the enemy. Moments later, the grenades exploded, clearing out the enemy soldiers around the corner. All right, let's move forward. After confirming the enemy's elimination from the corner, Zeke resumed advancing, followed by his subordinates. Rebounds per game. However, as Zeke's team started moving again, a soldier noticed something and shouted loudly. As everyone reflexively took cover at the soldier's voice, a fireball launched by a hidden mage exploded near Zeke's team, causing shockwaves and injuring them. Cough. What rebounds per game? That was a fireball, as long as we understand the meaning. Enough. Let's move on. No matter what. Squad leader, the mage from earlier is gone. Should we pursue? Leave it. Let's go. Understood. Cutting short the exchange with his subordinates filled with ambiguous words, and leaving the mage who disappeared immediately after the attack unchist, Zeke continued towards the crash site. We've spotted it. There it is. Continuing their engagement with the enemy, Zeke's team finally arrived at the heart of enemy territory, the crash site. They witnessed their outnumbered comrades fiercely resisting amidst numerous enemy troops and armed civilians. It's risky without much cover due to the clear visibility. Khans, I'll leave ten men with you to guard the east side of the crash site. Got it. Let's go, everyone. Zeke addressed one of his subordinates, dividing the team in half to secure the crash site. The rest of you, provide suppressive fire here. I'll check inside the Black Hawk. Oh, disc, come with me. Got it. Amidst flying enemy bullets, Zeke and the medic, Corporal Disc, ran towards the Black Hawk. Rangers. Hold your fire. Oh, thank goodness. We were almost out of ammo. We made it just in time. How many did you bring? Seeing Zeke, only two Delta operatives who had been fighting until now breathed a sigh of relief. Only twenty. Another squad is coming later with the Humvee to pick us up. As they joined Sergeant Rush to get, holding an M14 Say Crazy Horse, and Sergeant Taylor Gohan, holding an SPR MK12. By the side of the crashed Black Hawk. Zeke continued their conversation while occasionally spraying 6.8 times 43 mm SPC rands towards the enemy. So, any survivors? Just one. The rest were killed in action. Upon being informed by Sergeant Gohan, Siag peered into the interior of the Black Hawk, which was lying sideways. Ark, sir. Gent? Exclamation mark. So, you're the survivor, Park. Good to see you alive, Siag. Seeing Private Park lying weakly in the sand-covered interior, widened his eyes in surprise and spoke. Ha ha, I managed to survive somehow, but I can't feel my legs. I see. Understood. Just stay put. I've left the rest to Disc. Roger. After watching Corm and Disc crawl into the Black Hawk's interior, Siok returned to his subordinates with Delta. Disc, how's Park doing? Just hold on. Um, he's not in immediate danger. But his trapped legs are the issue. Without large tools, rescue seems impossible. Understood. So, I guess we have to wait for the vehicle convoy. As Siog, now away from the Black Hawk, finished his communication with Corman Disc while hidden behind cover, a communication came in from Sergeant Khans. This is Khans. Sergeant, the enemy is pulling back. Huh? An enemy? An old man is approaching from the road to the south. Despite the advantageous situation, instead of retreating enemy soldiers, a new enemy appeared before Siag and his team. Is that... is that a civilian? No, he's wearing armor and holding a staff. He's an enemy. But, I have a bad feeling about this. All units, prepared to attack when ready. We strike together. Roger. Spotting the enemy confidently approaching, fluttering his cloak some 150 meters away, with no attempt to hide. Siag gave the order to attack to his subordinates in order to seize the initiative. Wait. I'll take him down in one shot. However, even before Siag's subordinates could launch their attack, Sergeant Digger traced his M14 Say, equipped with a scope mounted on a picket in the rail, and looked through it. And the moment he caught sight of the enemy in the crosshairs through the scope, Sergeant Digger pulled the trigger of the M14 Say. Bang. The 7.62x51M NATO round flew out of the barrel. Got him. Sergeant Diggert felt a solid impact as the bullet flew along its direct path. But just before the 7.62x51M NATO round, flying at supersonic speed, 
could hit its target in the forehead, a wall of sand appeared out of nowhere, deflecting the bullet, you've got to be kidding, hey, that's a troublesome opponent, my bad feeling was right, having their fatal blow thwarted, Sergeant Diggett realized that the enemy was not an easy adversary to defeat and furrowed his brow, having already sensed that the enemy was a formidable opponent, Sierg sighed in disappointment, I am Taroas David, the O, the strongest magic knight who protects Gloria, fire, interrupting the elderly David's speech, the simultaneous attack of Sierg and his team began, NGH, you dare interrupt my speech, what uncouth fellows, however, your attacks are quite feeble, you'll never defeat me with such light assaults, as the simultaneous attack commenced, David, who had transformed the sand wall that had only been deployed in front of him into a spherical shape to protect his whole body, looked disdainfully at Sierg and his team's attacks and casually stroked his proud white chin beard, tch, all the bullets are being blocked by that sand wall, the firepower isn't enough, well, if we had something like a rocket launcher or some anti-tank weaponry, it'd be easy to take him down, unfortunately, we don't have any on hand, what to do, as Sierg pondered how to kill David, who was becoming increasingly impatient due to being on the receiving end of a one-sided attack, the elderly man began to move, well then, I suppose it's my turn, after finishing his incantation and muttering those words, David swung his staff, summoning dozens of sand figures resembling imperial knights, go, my strongest minions, slay all those inferior races who cannot wield magic, upon receiving orders from David, the sand figures moved in unison, change of target, fire at the sand figures, roger that, despite Sierg and his team showering the moving sand figures with bullets, their attacks had no effect on the masses of sand manipulated by David's magic, oh no, this is bad, sweat dripped from Sierg's forehead as he faced enemies made of sand, impervious to bullets, damn it, ideally, I should retreat for a moment, but I can't just abandon disc and park, should I call in for support attack, no, but, it'll take at least five minutes for air support to arrive, sergeant bread, what's the plan, captain, soldiers, caught off guard by the unexpected emergency, looked at Sierg with pleading eyes, it's a gamble, but I have an idea, can you two lend a hand, yeah, sure, if you have a plan, spit it out already, Sierg, having enlisted the help of Delta team sergeants, Diggett and Gohan, decided to execute his daring plan after requesting air support just to be safe, um, someone's coming, oh, challenging me with such a crude blade after discarding useless firearms, very well, let's see how worthy of an opponent you are, Count David, using a magical tool that allowed him to see through the sand walls, spotted Sierg, who appeared alone, and laughed heartily while wielding his staff like a weapon, come forth, let my servants slaughter you, as if in response to Count David's words, Sierg dashed forward at full speed. What? Is he ignoring us? His servants? Ridiculous. Don't underestimate my magic. Thinking Sierg would disregard the sand dolls, Count David dispersed them along Sierg's path. However, that was precisely Sierg's aim. The moment the sand dolls gathered in Sierg's path, his subordinates, armed with FN40GL, MK-13, grenade launchers, launched 40mm grenades at them, damn it, is this his aim, as the 40mm grenades exploded, obliterating the sand dolls, Count David realized his mistake, but, I can create as many sand dolls as I want, where did he disappear to, as Count David attempted to conjure replacements for the vanished sand dolls, he realized he had lost sight of Sierg, this is troublesome, the transparency effect of this magical tool only works on obstacles right in front of me. With the dust swirling outside the sand wall like now, I can't see the enemy, huh? What's this smoke blocking incoming bullets with the sand wall? Count David strained his eyes to locate Sierg but found himself further obstructed by an M18 smoke grenade thrown near him. Hey, planning to approach during this perfect opportunity. How naive. Grua, Nagi, Seima. Just as Count David began an incantation for a new spell, TH3 incendiary grenades and MK3 A2 offensive grenades were hurled towards him. TH3 exploded on the sand wall above him, while MK3 A2 detonated slightly in front of it. HMPH, with this level of power, you think you can breach my defense? Wah! Well, the sand wall, which Count David had absolute confidence in, began melting away as if it were being bathed in magma, leaving him speechless. HMPH, 
That's the TH3 incendiary grenade for you. It can melt even steel beams. Your sand wall is nothing compared to it. More importantly, the smoke screen obstructing your and our visibility has been dispersed by the explosion of the MK3A2 offensive grenade. Siog, lurking in the shadows, smirked confidently. Why? How? By what means? While Count David, stunned by the unexpected turn of events, was met with the answer in the form of two incoming 7.62 by 51 NATO rounds. Gofu, such foolishness to be struck down by these inferior beings. Count David, struck in the chest by the sniper fire from Sergeants Degut and Gohn, collapsed to the ground in despair. Target hit, he's dead. Indeed, he certainly knows how to keep us on edge. A relieved atmosphere swept through Zeke's group as they vanquished their troublesome foe, but it was short-lived. Gemma, they're right. Do not underestimate me. Gar. Ha. Ha. Sand. Sand. Needles. What? Uh-oh. Despite being on the verge of death, Count David, spitting blood, summoned his last bit of strength to rise and unleash a powerful attack. At the swing of his blood-soaked staff, cone-shaped sand spikes emerged from the ground around Count David piercing through everything they touched as if driven by his sheer determination. Kaha, damn. It, however, as Count David, having exhausted his remaining strength on the final blow, breathed his last, the sand spikes, no longer sustained, crumbled away. Hey, that was close. Just two seconds more, and that old man would have skewered me to death. Thanks to Count David's demise, Zeke narrowly escaped death clutching at wounds caused by the sand spikes grazing his cheek. Sergeant, where are you? Sergeant, over here. Sergeant, are you all right? Yeah, somehow. Answering his approaching subordinate with a raised hand, Zeke retrieved his scar H from where he had hidden it and slipped away into the shadows. Seriously? You guys show up right after it's over. As Zeke's group, having defeated Count David, began preparing for a possible enemy resurgence and setting up a makeshift camp. Several Humvees approached the crash site through a detour route. Zeke, are you okay? Sergeant Wax, descending from one of the Humvees, rushed to Zeke. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank goodness. By the way, Zeke, things have taken a turn for the worse. Relieved that Zeke was unharmed, Sergeant Wax's expression darkened unexpectedly. What happened? While watching soldiers carrying large tools heading towards the crashed Black Hawk to rescue Private Park trapped inside, Zeke asked Sergeant Wax. It seems that the Marines scheduled to land late never arrived. Not only that, but the expedition fleet has temporarily left Gloria. What? Are you kidding me? Why? Shocked by the news, Zeke grabbed Sergeant Wax by the collar. Hey, calm down, you idiot. Let go. Sorry. Just tell me already. Cough, cough. Jeez. You could have listened to the whole story. My bad. Now spit it out. All right. So, it appears that an unidentified giant creature has appeared about 100 kilometers away from the expedition fleet and is rapidly approaching them. Because of that, the marine landing has been postponed temporarily, and they won't resume until they've dealt with the unidentified giant creature. You've got to be kidding me. And that's not all. It seems that unidentified giant creatures have also appeared 250 kilometers away from Parabem's mainland and on the coral plain. The higher-ups are in a panic because of this. What? What's going to happen now? I don't know. Zeke and Sergeant Wax looked up at the sky with uncertainty. And so, the battle for Gloria became increasingly chaotic. Volume 04 Chapter 10 An Urgent Alarm, Signaling a State of Emergency, blared through Parabem's mainland and other islands informing those who heard it and stirring a sense of crisis. Report the situation. Kent burst into the operational command room, accompanied by Catherine and Chioda, and exclaimed right away. Just a moment ago, a massive airborne creature appeared 250 kilometers east of the mainland. Additionally, a submarine unit on patrol, located 100 kilometers away from the expedition fleet advancing towards glory reported encountering an unidentified giant creature and engaging in combat. However, communication with a submarine unit has been lost. Furthermore, ground forces advancing into the Empire's territory reported sighting unidentified giant creatures and countless monsters in the Kared Plain. Before Kent could report, Ibuki, who had already entered the command room to grasp the situation, 
responded quickly. Three monsters appearing simultaneously? This has become troublesome. Catherine, Chioda, how do you perceive this? Do you think it's just a coincidence? Most likely, I believe it's an attack by the Empire. I share the same opinion as my sister. Master. I see. Both of you share the same opinion as me. We're receiving footage from reconnaissance aircraft. Footage is coming from other sources as well. As Kent and the others discuss the situation, P-1 anti-submarine patrol aircraft and D-2 Hawkeye early warning aircraft flying near the unidentified flying object captured it with onboard cameras and relayed the footage to the command headquarters. Simultaneously, footage of the remaining two unidentified giant creatures was sent to the command headquarters via reconnaissance aircraft and then through artificial satellites. They're huge. Kent inadvertently let slip as he saw the three giant creatures displayed on the huge screen in the command room. On land, a giant tortoise, accompanied by countless monsters, slowly advanced across the Karad plain, with a volcano emitting billowing smoke mounted on its shell. It stamped its six thick legs on the ground with each movement, causing the earth to collapse and leaving massive footprints behind. In the sea, a blacking sea dragon swam near the surface at great speed, protruding its long neck and three rows of dorsal fins, showcasing its presence. Equipped with powerful jaws and teeth that crush everything, covered in strong scales, and with a long, swaying tail underwater, it approached the expedition fleet as if drawn to it. In the sky, a creature with a disproportionately large belly and eight pairs of giant wings on its back fluttered through the air like an insect, emitting a buzzing sound. With a single eye rolling around and compound eyes glowing red, it remained vigilant, occasionally emitting jarring cries. The gaze of everyone crowded in the command room was fixated on the three creatures, and a heavy atmosphere enveloped the room. Sorry for the delay. This is Celestia. You're knowledgeable about monsters. Do you understand? Are these creatures from this world? A step behind, Celestia, who arrived at the command room, was asked by Kent. No, as far as I know, there are no monsters like these in this world. They're likely summoned monsters from another world. In that case, to summon these creatures, how much magical power is needed? At least, it's estimated to require the magical power, sacrifice, equivalent to 10,000 people per creature. I see, that's... Hearing Celestia's answer, Kent suddenly remembered something and turned to Catherine. Catherine, a while back, there were reports that the Empire was purchasing a large number of slaves, women and children who couldn't be used as soldiers, right? Yes, it's reported that they ultimately bought around 30 to 40,000 people. At that time, I thought they were just trying to gather as many soldiers as possible. Are you saying they used those purchased slaves as sacrifices? Most likely. Well, if Celestia's speculation is correct, our enemies have summoned quite a troublesome thing. However, the creatures on land, sea, and sky are aptly named for such a situation. As Kent shifted his focus from the display of the three creatures, summoned by the Elzes' magic empire through a large-scale summoning ritual, he rallied his spirits. All right, we conclude that the Empire has released hostile creatures. All personnel, prepare for first-class combat readiness. We will commence extermination operations immediately. Furthermore, we will designate the hostile creatures on land, sea, and sky as Behemoth, Leviathan, and Jizz, respectively. Understood. Under Kent's command, the entire army begins to mobilize towards annihilating the enemy. First off. Let's leave dealing with Leviathan to the expedition fleet and focus on Behemoth and Jizz. Kent bonded over the 3D map displaying the respective movement speeds and current positions. Master, Behemoth's slow movement suggests that it will be some time before our forces engage. Would it be prudent to leave it for now? Indeed, but the countless monsters accompanying Behemoth pose a problem. Judging from satellite imagery, they're indiscriminately attacking towns and villages around the Karad Plains. Even those beyond our control, it's uncertain whether they'll advance ahead and attack. We're better off lowering our front line, consolidating our forces, and striking all at once. All right, abandon the first defense line. Instruct all advancing units to fall back to the second defense line. With the current situation, acting rashly would lead to individual units being picked off. Understood. I'll send orders to the advancing units to fall back to the second defense line. Yes. Please do so. Following Kent's decision, 
the units invading Imperial territory were temporarily pulled back. This allowed for the organization of the extended front lines and concentration of forces to swiftly deal with Behemoth. Master, what should be done about the enemy civilians in the occupied towns and villages during the retreat? That's a good question. Kent struggled to respond immediately to Chioda's sharp inquiry. For now, inform them of Behemoth's approach and evacuate only those who wish to leave. Those who refuse to evacuate can be left behind. Despite having time before engagement, time is limited. We can't afford to attend to those who refuse to evacuate. Understood. Thus, it was decided that the Purabam army within Imperial territory would temporarily shrink its front lines. Upon being informed by the retreating units about the approaching behemoth and masses of monsters, 70% of the residents in the occupied towns and villages opted to evacuate, maintaining order as they began the process. However, as the Parabem army and evacuating residents commenced their retreat, some monsters, as Kent had feared, advanced ahead and attacked the fortified city of Ballard. Located just beyond the Karad Plains. This led to considerable casualties among the Parabam Army's 4th Division and civilians stationed in Ballard. Nevertheless, apart from this incident, the retreat of the Parabam Army was successful. Once the retreating residents arrived at the new front line, designated as the second defense line, they were further transported to rearward areas. Incidentally, the fate of the 30% of residents who refused to evacuate upon receiving the false alarm about Behemoth's approach remains unknown. As Jizu approached, numerous ships lifted anchor and departed simultaneously from Parabem's military port and anchorage. Hoisting combat flags on their main masts, they swiftly made their way onto the open sea, steadily preparing for anti-aircraft combat. Meanwhile, at the airfield, the squadron of F-22 Raptors, prepared for scramble, raced down the runway with thunderous roars, soaring into the sky to intercept Jizu. Following closely behind were E-3 Sentry early warning aircraft, ready to provide support. Inside the hangars lining the airfield, maintenance crews worked at a frantic pace, loading ammunition and fuel onto parked fighters, bombers, and attack aircraft. Simultaneously, on the ground, the last line of defense for Parabem was preparing for the worst-case scenario of Jezu's mainland invasion, retrieving every imaginable anti-aircraft weapon from the armory. Now then, setting aside other matters for now. This pesky insect is our immediate concern, Kent said, having issued instructions to various sectors, now focusing on devising a strategy against Jezu. Catherine, what's the status of unit deployments? He inquired. We're about 80% deployed currently. The remaining 20% will be in combat position within five minutes, Catherine replied promptly. Chioda, any abnormalities in the mainland defense's anti-air interception system? Kent continued. None, master. Everything's green across the board, Chioda confirmed. Preparations for interception seem to be in perfect order, Kent mused. For now, they would proceed with the planned interception and observe the situation. Kent nodded approvingly, knowing that the seasoned soldiers trained through both drills and real combat, would fulfill their duties without the need for his direct command. A communication from the 27th Fighter Squadron, which has scrambled for interception. Target confirmed, initiating attack now, came the report, marking the beginning of the battle. Barometer, engage. Fox 3, Fox 3. Baromo 2, Fox 3. Baromo 3, Fox 3. F-22S from the 27th Fighter Squadron. Scrambled from Parabem's mainland airfield, locked onto Jizu on radar and simultaneously launched AIM-120 DMRAM missiles. The solid-fueled MRAM missiles, trailing white smoke, flew towards Jizu at Mach 4 speed. The 27th Fighter Squadron has launched missiles. Estimated time to impact, approximately 20 seconds. The command center announced as everyone watched the points of light representing the missiles on the display, closing in on Jezu's position. Impact in 3, 2, 1, 0. All missiles have hit the target. On the screen fed from the P-1, maintaining a safe distance from Jezu, over a hundred MRAM missiles were seen striking Jezu's body. Did we do it? One operator muttered unconsciously as they observed the smoke-covered Jezu. Ha! Don't jump the gun. You fool! In an instant, the other operators stared at the one who had spoken out of turn with a startled expression, while Kent let out a heavy sigh. Ah, uh, um? Realizing they had attracted everyone's attention and understanding the gravity of what they had said, 
The operator turned pale in an instant. Escort the digit out of this room, Catherine, glaring fiercely with beads of sweat streaming down her face, commanded her subordinate standing behind her, gesturing with a jerk of her chin. You understood. The operator, who had slipped up, found himself being escorted out of the operations command room by members of the guard, unable to utter an apology before being expelled. One month's pay deduction. Understood, master. As you wish. It's done. Chioda promptly responded to Kent's muttered words by manipulating the desired system through Parabem's main server, reducing the salary of the aforementioned operator. Do you understand the objective yet? Kent, looking weary and downtrodden, asked the operator in front of him. The objective is still intact, as I thought. What? W. We have a serious situation. A massive number of flying creatures are emerging from Jizz's body. Th. There's hundreds. N no, thousands. M millions. The count is immeasurable. What did you say? In response to the report that stunned the operator, Kent widened his eyes and stared at the display showing jizz. There, the unnaturally swollen abdomen from the M-Ram's attack burst open, and a never-before-seen creature burst forth from the ruptured belly like a muddy stream. This is bad news. The creature, about two to three meters in length, resembling a mix of grasshoppers, mantises, and dragonflies, formed a black cloud and swirled around Jizz. Quickly evacuate P1 and E2. You understood. From HQ, upon Kent's command, the monitoring units P1 and E2 immediately took evasive action and departed the airspace. However, just as the two aircraft left, the RQ-4 Global Hawk, an unmanned reconnaissance aircraft flying in a different airspace, arrived at the designated area at the right time. As a result, there were no issues with monitoring Jizz. Recalculation of the target group completed. Estimated count, 100,000. The target group is rapidly approaching the mainland. What? Jizz's flight speed is increasing. The following aerial units have arrived in the combat zone and initiated attacks. Inside the rapidly bustling operations command room, the operator's voices rose one after another, and the display showed various fighter jets, attack aircraft, and bombers launching various missiles with the support of information from the E-3 flying at 20,000 feet altitude. It's like putting out a fire with a bucket of water. Despite relentless missile attacks from the aerial squadron against the overwhelming number of demons, there seemed to be no decrease in their numbers whatsoever as the pilots of the fighter jets, having exhausted their missiles, valiantly engaged in dogfights with the demons using only their machine guns, they managed to shoot down numerous demons, however, one after another, their aircraft were surrounded by the demons and shot down, your excellency, Jizz has breached the second defense line, I see, then proceed with the plan to withdraw all aerial combat forces from the battle zone, understood, however, Despite the valiant efforts of the aerial squadron, by the time of their appearance, Jizz and the demons had already penetrated deep into the airspace beyond the air defense identification zone, breaching the first defense line, and had now breached Parabem's second defense line. As a result, the interception mission against Jizz by the aerial combat forces was deemed a failure, and they were forced to retreat. All aerial combat forces are withdrawing from the airspace. A communication from the first fleet. They have commenced anti-air and anti-surface combat. The attack aircraft and bombers, which had been engaging in long-range attacks, turned their noses, while the fighter squadrons, which had been engaged in close combat, ignited their afterburners, rapidly increasing their propulsion, shaking off the pursuing demons in an instant, and swiftly withdrawing from the airspace. They absorbed the waiting vessels that had been left out of the expedition fleet formation and expanded their ranks. Then. From the hastily formed circular formation of the Parabem Defense Fleet, known as the First Fleet, Aegis ships, mini Aegis ships, missile destroyers, and missile cruisers fired continuous salvos of ship to air missiles, RIM 66 SM 2 Mr. Standard missiles, from MK 13, MK 26 twin launchers, or MK 41 VLS, vertical launch system, towards the demons. In addition, ship-to-ship -ship missiles such as harpoons, tomahawks, supersonic anti-ship missiles P-800 Onyx, Type 90 ship-to-ship -ship guided missiles, Exocets, RBS-15, etc., were launched towards Jizz. 
the countless standard missiles launched were guided towards the designated high-priority targets via the Aegis combat system installed on the Aegis ships, and they flew towards Jiz in a straight line, while groups of ship-to-ship -ship missiles and cruise missiles aimed directly at Jiz. Enemy attrition rate approximately 20%. The enemy is still approaching our fleet. All ships, open all gun ports. Prepare for close-range anti-air combat. The standard missiles, which were continuously launched without interruption, exploded demons one after another, and large missiles continued to hit Jiz. However, the onslaught of demons and Jiz's invasion showed no signs of stopping as they closed in on the first fleet. Shortly after commencing anti-air and anti-surface combat, the first fleet, which had rapidly closed the distance, switched from fleet air defense, fleet area defense, missiles such as standard missiles to individual ship defense, point defense, missiles such as ESSM and CAM, and further prepared for the launch of close-range air defense, close-in weapon system, missiles such as RIM-116 RAM, while opening the gun ports of various anti-aircraft guns and SILs, phalanx. Furthermore, by this time, Attacks against the enemy intensified as missiles such as MIM-23, improved. Hawk for ground-to-air, Type 03 medium-range surface-to-air guided missiles, Type 88 ground-to-ship guided missiles, Type 12 ground-to-ship guided missiles, ground-to-ship variant, P-800 Onyx, Harpoons, and Tomahawks were launched from missile launchers installed in the sea fortresses constructed using the islands and offshore oil plants on the outskirts of Paribim. Exclamation mark targets spotted in the direction of 12 o'clock, distance to the target group, under 20,000. They're here. Admiral Kitomio Zamu, commander of the First Fleet tasked with homeland defense, adjusted his hat firmly as he observed the horde of monsters darkening the sky followed by massive Jizu. Prepare for firing with Type 3 shells. Prepared for firing with Type 3 shells. Amidst the launching of modified AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, adapted from RIM-116 rams aboard the accompanying ships, commands for artillery fire from the bridge of the flagship Nagato, the lead vessel of the Nagato-class battleships, echoed between Admiral Kitomi and the artillery officer, commence firing. Firing commenced. As permission to fire was granted, the two forward-mounted 41cm twin-gun turrets of the Nagato unleashed a simultaneous barrage. Following Nagato's main gun volley, Matsu also fired its main guns in a similar fashion. Seconds later, the eight Type 3 shells exploded amidst the swarm of monsters, their burning shrapnel engulfing the creatures and incinerating them. The enemy's attrition rate has exceeded 50%. Despite the continuous attacks and the earlier assault with Type 3 shells, the attrition rate of the monsters had reached 50%, yet their numbers remained vast. The target group is closing in further. As Nagato and Matsu hurriedly reloaded their main guns, the secondary guns of both ships, as well as those of the heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and the rapid firing guns of missile cruisers and destroyers, unleashed a barrage forming a curtain of fire. Nevertheless, the enemy's momentum continued unabated, with even phalanx and relatively small caliber anti aircraft guns joining the air defense battle. Targets at 40 degrees to the right, elevation 40 degrees. Keep firing, keep firing relentlessly. They're coming from the left. Fire, 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 fire. Above the first fleet, a mix of naval vessels from various countries. The sky was dyed pitch black by monsters and the barrage of fire. Shells with time fuses, VT fuses, and proximity fuses, fired from main guns, anti-aircraft guns, and rapid-fire guns, bloomed like crimson flowers in the sky. Anti-aircraft guns of various calibers, ranging from 40 mm to 12.7 mm, launched shells into the air, bringing down monsters one after another. Enemy target group approaching directly overhead. Dash. They're ignoring our fleet and heading towards the homeland. Don't let them go. Bring them all down here. As every available anti-aircraft weapon spewed flames, the horde of monsters flying directly above the first fleet finally completely disregarded the fleet. Heading towards Paribim, the flight continues. Jizz is coming. TCH. All ships, prioritize Jizz as the primary target for attack. Understood. As the swarm of creatures resembling clouds passes overhead the first fleet, now comes Jizz, boasting a size equivalent to three Yamato-class battleships, 
closing in on the first fleet. It's huge. A genuine monster. Just keep firing at it. Roger that. Before the soldiers stationed outside each ship could be awestruck by Jiz's enormity. They immediately unleash anti-aircraft shells at Jiz with the full force of the first fleet. However, the solid exoskeleton covering Jiz's body proves impenetrable, rendering their efforts futile. If it's this one, go down. The gunners manning the rear main guns of the only battleships in the first fleet, Nagato, and Matsu, attempt to pierce Jiz's exoskeleton with Type 3 shells as it passes overhead, but the shell's lack of penetration makes it impossible to breach Jiz's armor. It's too tough, that monster, not even its feathers are burning. Seems like it would require anti-ship armor-piercing shells, bunker busters, or large-scale bombs carried by battleships to have any effect. As missiles resume their attack on the retreating Jiz and creatures, the gunners of the First Fleet's anti-aircraft weapons, now rendered useless, grumble while watching Jiz disappear into the distance. Volume 04 Chapter 11 The sky was blanketed by a horde of demons, resembling a swarm of locusts, as they and their leader, Jizu, approached the mainland of Paribim, target group, passing directly above the First Fleet. Still advancing towards the mainland, ignoring the First Fleet completely. The demons and Jezu continued to advance relentlessly, despite enduring fierce anti-aircraft fire. Target group has entered Prabem's airspace. Reports entering the operations command room were worsening by the moment. Chioda. What's the situation? I- I'm sorry, master. It seems unavoidable that the enemy will land on our soil. Chioda, who controlled Prabem's entire defense system, remotely operated all fixed gun emplacements. Missile launchers installed on the mainland and other islands, as well as anti-aircraft weapons installed like hedgehogs on high-rise gun turrets, limited to fully automatic ones, with a remorseful tone, she conveyed to Kent the calculated rate of interception and invasion speed due to the current anti-aircraft fire, indicating that it was unavoidable for the enemy to land on the mainland. I see. HN. Seeing Kent's bitter expression, Chioda gritted her teeth. Damn it. How dare they embarrass me a mere insect, and invade master's sacred land. Prepare yourselves, you damn pests. Not a single one of you will escape. Unable to show any positive outcome to Kent, despite boasting control over the defense system and claiming to thwart all external invasions alone, Chioda's innermost feelings boiled like magma. Catherine, I'll leave the entire ground force command to you. Yes, understood. Delegated by Kent to command the Grand Forces of Brabem, Catherine descended into the central command post in the operations command room and began directly commanding the troops. Raina, Lena. Yes, by your side. We can't assume there won't be any unforeseen circumstances. So, the two of you stay by Asuka's side. While observing Catherine taking command of the Ground Forces, Kent instructed his maid attendants, Raina and Lena, to accompany his daughter Asuka. Understood. We comply. Upon receiving Kent's orders, the two bowed and, swaying their made uniform skirts, hurried out of the operations command room, leading the demon subordinates waiting outside to Asuka, who should be in the underground shelter of the headquarters. Now then, just going to take a quick trip. After confirming Raina and Lena leaving the operations command room, Kent stood up quietly. Kent Sama, where are you going? Master, where do you intend to go? Your Excellency? Seeing this, Serizia, Chioda, and Ibuki asked Kent with puzzled expressions. Oh, just need to use the restroom. Master's bad habit. He he, restroom. Is it? Then, allow me to accompany you halfway. Your Excellency? I won't know what to tell the Vice President later. They've caught on. Although Kent stood up claiming to go to the restroom, everyone present easily saw through what he was up to. Well, I'll be back soon. Understood. But please return as quickly as possible. We'll handle the escort and other arrangements here. Good luck. Sorry for the trouble. Deciding it was better not to detain Kent, who wouldn't listen anyway, and rather than him being manipulated without their knowledge, Chioda and Ibuki chose to fully support Kent. Then, Kent's armor. Yeah, I'm off. With understanding subordinates bidding him farewell, Kent left the operations command room with Cerezia, unnoticed by Catherine. Communication with Fortress 17 lost. Coastal defense ship number 180, 
sunk. Reinforcement request from Misaki Island Garrison. Reinforcement request also received from nearby Bison Island. As soon as they invaded Prabem's territory, the horde of demons abandoned their previous restraint and unleashed their utmost brutality, intent on destroying anything visible before them. In response, despite the valiant efforts of the defense forces on each island and the small naval vessels such as frigates and missile boats deployed by Parabem in the inland sea, they found themselves overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of the demonic creatures, forced into a disadvantaged position. Those damn Mushikara, they're getting cocky, Chio, her voice grim and eerie as if crawling along the ground, muttered with frustration. Witnessing the destruction of the nation Kent had built, she had reached her breaking point and was now completely livid. Just then, a report arrived, pouring nitro into Chio's rage. What? What did you say? Is this a joke? Is it a mistake? I see. Understood. Vice President, it's urgent. It has been confirmed that nearly all the crew members of the three Sejong the Great class destroyers, Sejong the Great, Guri, and Nishiyane's Ryo, who have undergone extensive and large-scale renovations to finally operate properly, have abandoned their posts and fled. Find them and kill them. What? Don't make me repeat myself. Any deserters from the enemy lines are to be killed on sight. Understood. In her enraged state, Chio issued the order of purge casually and returned to commanding the ground forces engaged in combat. Enemy targets. Entering mainland airspace. Confirm activation of short-range interception systems installed in anti-aircraft turrets and fortresses. The 16th and 112th Infantry Regiments, along with the 2nd and 5th Tank Battalions, as well as the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalions, have commenced engagement. Two Infantry Regiments, two Tank Battalions, and three Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalions deployed in the military ports and fortresses on the eastern side of the Parabem mainland finally engaged in combat as the enemy approached. With this, the worst-case scenario of warfare spreading to the Parabem mainland had come to fruition. Damn. Then it's an all-out war. Use whatever you can, kill the enemy. Those vermin, at all costs. Do not let them further tarnish our master's nation. Understood. As the battle commenced on the mainland, the first attacks came from anti-aircraft turrets and fortresses equipped with M5175 mm anti-aircraft guns. 35mm twin anti-aircraft machine guns L90, VADS 1 Kai, Otto Miller 76mm, 127mm single guns, Phalanx, Goalkeeper, Ram, and Iron Dome, among others. Following that, the Avenger System, 93 type short-range surface-to-air guided missiles, 9K35 short-range surface-to-air missiles, and other short-range surface-to-air missile systems such as Russia's 2K22 Tunguska, Japan's 87 type self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, and Germany's Werbelwind, launched missiles as the mainstay of three anti-aircraft artillery battalions, while infantry armed with FIM-92 Stinger, Starburst. 91 type portable surface to air guided missiles, 9K38 Tigler, and other portable air defense missile systems were deployed for anti air combat. Inadequacies were supplemented by infantry using heavy weapons to intercept the demonic creatures. The attrition rate of the enemy targets exceeds 89%. Just a little more. Damn it. Some of the enemy targets have exploited gaps in our anti aircraft fire and invaded District 9 of the urban area. Enemy infiltration reported in Districts 8 and 12 as well. Communication lost with the 1st Anti Aircraft Artillery Battalion. It seems to have been wiped out. The enemy has reached the 42nd Anti Aircraft Turret. The non-combatants taking shelter inside the turret are in danger, amidst the relentless barrage of anti-aircraft fire mobilizing every available weapon, just when it seemed like the number of demonic creatures was diminishing and a glimmer of hope appeared. The tide turned. Report after report of nightmarish developments flooded into the operations command room. However, upon hearing the report, Catherine didn't panic. Instead, a faint smile graced her lips to think these pests would underestimate us so. As the display showed the creatures breaching the sturdy doors of turret 42, smashing through thick concrete walls with scissor-like claws, Catherine caught a glimpse and, with a ferocious grin, 
signaled for a counterattack with their numbers, we can overpower them. Dash, exterminate every last one of the mu scum. Understood. With the dwindling numbers of the creatures, the Parabem forces shifted from defense to offense and launched a full-scale assault across all fronts. However, to everyone's surprise, the first to counterattack weren't the regular Parabem soldiers, but the non-combatants from Parabem's mainland. Within the belly of the beast, now awakened and hungry, the creatures rampaged through turret 42, destroying everything in their path in search of prey. Because, over countless generations, they had been instinctively programmed to know that within fortified nests, buildings, lay defenseless and vulnerable prey waiting to be devoured. However, much to the creatures' dismay, the humans in Parabem were not the defenseless and vulnerable prey they were programmed to expect. Thinking they could easily prey upon those hiding in shelters by smashing through the last line of defense, the creatures joyfully clacked their mandibles, only to be met not with cowering prey but with men and women, young and old, armed and ready to kill. And in the next moment, the creatures that thrust their faces into the shelters were met with a storm of bullets their bodies riddled with holes, life extinguished. HMPH, there's no way these mu pests can defeat us. The nation's entire populace armed as soldiers. Catherine watched proudly as the non-combatants, armed with powerful firearms, maintained discipline akin to a military unit, sallying forth from turret 42 to exterminate the creatures. Meanwhile, Inspired by their actions, other enraged non-combatants and regular Parabem soldiers across various locations turned to all-out counter-attacks, swiftly and mercilessly driving out the creatures. Submachine guns like the P-90 and MP-7 wielded by children slowed the creatures down, while men and women, young and old, armed with assault rifles and old-fashioned rifles, punched holes through the creatures' tough exoskeletons piercing their insides and delivering fatal blows. From an outsider's perspective, it was an extraordinary sight, one that was becoming increasingly common in certain parts of Parabem. In the face of the astonishing counterattack by the citizens of Parabem, the dwindling horde of monsters was mercilessly exterminated, and the tide decisively turned. Now all that's left is, the behemoth. Despite causing considerable damage throughout Parabem, Catherine felt a slight sense of relief knowing that the remaining enemy was now only Jizz. Are the aviation units and the first fleet holding up well? With various anti-aircraft guns having completed their missions and the anti-aircraft fire weakening, the current opponents of Jizz were temporarily the aviation forces that had temporarily left the battlefield and the first fleet, which had returned to Parabem's inland sea after a reversal. Concerned about the movements of these aviation forces and the first fleet, Catherine inquired to the operator nearby. Yes, all aviation units are launching wave attacks against Jizz, but their effectiveness is limited. Additionally, the first fleet continues its attacks with anti-ship missiles, cruise missiles, main guns, etc., but it seems they have not been able to deliver effective blows to Jizz. In that case, how is Jizz faring at the moment? The fighter units have managed to distract Jizz, successfully delaying it within a 20-kilometer airspace from the mainland. I see. Master, what do you think? Turning around to seek Kent's judgment on how to deal with Jizz, Catherine was left speechless. This was because the presidential seat, where Kent should have been, was empty. No. Could it be? Master? Noticing Kent's absence and seeing Ibuki and Chioda awkwardly turning away. An unpleasant premonition struck Catherine's mind. There. Daughter Hangar Zero is opening, and Catherine's unpleasant premonition turned out to be accurate. T the F-23, the presidential aircraft, is appearing, it's preparing for takeoff, as the F-23, whose pilot's identity was known inside the cockpit, emerged from Hangar Zero via the underground elevator and proceeded onto the runway with its hard points loaded. The situation in the command room became chaotic. Establish communication with that F-23, quickly. Why yes, understood. Following Catherine's instructions, the operator hurriedly tapped on the console, and on the command room's display, Kent, wearing the joint helmet-mounted queuing system, JHMCS, and a pilot suit, appeared. Ah. Dot. Am I caught? Caught? No, master. What are you intending to do? As soon as communication was established, Catherine's thunderous voice struck Kent. Oh, well, we're short on firepower, and I thought it would be just right to gather some combat data with this guy. Besides, to take down that monster, this guy is necessary. 
right? Emphasizing this guy, Kent pointed to what was mounted on the F-23's hardpoints. Let someone else handle that. Just get out of the aircraft and return here immediately. Huh? Is there a communication glitch? I can't hear. Huh? With those confused words as the last, the communication was abruptly cut off. M Master. As the communication line went dead, Catherine's gaze at the darkened display in the command room echoed hollowly. G.R.R. Why didn't you stop Master? Immediately after the communication with Kent was lost, Catherine approached Ibuki and Chioda with a hint of anger. Vice President, please calm down for now. Calm down? How can I be calm about this? Master has headed to the battlefield alone, you know? As for that matter, I believe it's under control. We've assigned 10 each of the guard forces F-22, F-35, and T-50 to escort him. Additionally, we've programmed the F-23S system with a returned base program to be enforced by our instructions if necessary. Furthermore, my doppelganger is also on board a variable fighter, escorting the master. What? You mean? You guys? Yes, as Vice President envisioned, rather than master acting on his own in places unknown to us. We judged it would be better for him to operate where our eyes can see, and within the range of our control. Showing some understanding of Ibuki's judgment, Catherine fell silent. However, in the next moment, Ibuki and Chioda were utterly astonished by Catherine's next actions. I understand your points, however, considering we're unsure of the extent of that behemoth's capabilities, we need to settle this quickly. Saying so while reaching for the telephone. Catherine made a call to a certain location, ring, click. This is Doc 1. Who the hell is calling at this damn busy time? We're busy confirming damages caused by those damn monsters, it's Catherine. Catherine? Why you mean? Vice President, the worker who answered the phone at Doc 1 of Catherine never expected a direct call from Probem's number 2. Regrettably, he responded with rough language, immediately regretting it and breaking out into a cold sweat. Right. Getting straight to the point due to an emergency. Which of the following ships? The 111th, the 797th, the 798th, or the 799th, can be mobilized. Specifically, among the fictional battleships summoned by the Master, which one has been converted into an aerial battleship and is ready to fire its main guns? Iowa class, Montana class, South Dakota class, N3 class, G3 class, Lion class. H class, any of them. Yes, while the retrofitting of the 111th is not yet complete, the trial installation of the magical reactor is finished, and the first and second turrets can be utilized. As for the other ships, they are still awaiting retrofitting and cannot be moved. Very well, then immediately mobilize the 111th. Um, right away? I mean, now? I said immediately, didn't I? But, we haven't even conducted a trial run of the magical reactor and we don't have the personnel necessary to mobilize it. Gather the personnel somehow. Got it? Within 30 minutes, you must position the 111th as we instruct. The worker who answered Catherine's outrageous command was speechless, unable to string words together. Choose either Roger or understood. Understood. We'll get started on it immediately. Given Catherine's compelling tone and the absence of alternatives, the worker had no choice but to reluctantly agree. That's settled. Now, what punishment should be meted out to the master upon their return? HMPH, with her absurd demands burdening the workers, Catherine quietly smirked, leaving everyone in the operations room trembling. F-23, Spider Unit 1, take off. Unaware of the commotion in the operations room or what awaited him upon his return, Kent confidently declared as he raced down the runway and soared into the sky. Huh? Is that Cecilia? On his way to the target. Jezu, Kent coincidentally noticed Cecilia waving vigorously as she battled the monsters emerging from Jezu's abdomen using magic and summoned creatures. In response, Kent tilted the F-23's distinctive diamond-shaped main wings with only two tail fins, signaling acknowledgement. Master, please reduce your speed. The escort cannot keep up. After Kent responded to Cecilia, the pilot of YF-24 Aardvark, a prototype variable fighter aircraft formed by the fusion of the F-23's second unit and a flying type magical weapon, advised him via emergency communication to slow down. Chioda, why are you here? Ah, the duplicate. Still, you handled that craft quite well, 
I recall it being quite unruly. As an artificial AI, I can manage, though not as skillfully as you, Master. Impressed by Chioda's proficiency in piloting the YF-24, which even Kent, who possessed the ability to wield weapons, struggled with, Kent let out a voice of admiration. Now then, since the escort has caught up, let's quickly deal with that monstrosity and return. Right, that would be wise. Especially considering sister's displeasure. Enough said. You're starting to get scared of going home. Kent remembers what an angry Catherine is waiting for him, and is afraid of what will happen after he returns. Is everyone ready? Of course, master. This is also okay. You can go anytime. We are fully prepared. Okay, then let's go. As if to shake off the nightmare that would await him upon his return, Kent fired up his spirits and gave commands to the pilots under his command, then reignited the afterburner that had been turned off. They quickly ascend to high altitude while forming a formation. Height 4000, 6000, 8000, 10000. When Kent reached the target altitude, while checking that the altimeter needle displayed on the large color LCD MFD was rotating rapidly. He returned the aircraft to level and then flew into formation at an altitude of 10,000 meters. A range target confirmed. All machines, follow me. I'll kill you in one hit and go home. Jesus, my master. Learn! Exclamation mark. After confirming the current location of the target and that everyone is ready to attack, Kent gives the order to attack. All aircraft begin descending. 31 fighter planes were making a sudden descent which was the exact opposite of the previous steep rise, and a prototype variable fighter plane was following them a little further away, not only is it being pulled by gravity, but because its afterburners are ignited, it instantly exceeds the speed of sound and descends towards the ground in the blink of an eye. All aircraft, adjust the timing. Learn! Exclamation mark. Kent and his friends set the angle of descent to 50 degrees and entered attack mode at super high speeds of Mach 2.5, in front of their line of sight. They saw Jizz chasing after a decoy fighter plane. Yo, let's go. 31 fighter planes aim at the huge body of Jizz, who is obsessed with chasing the decoy fighter planes. Dot. The axis of fire overlapped with Jizz. And just before the aircraft collided with Jizz's body, Kent and his friends fired their shots all at once, passing through the friction of Jizz's body, it leaves downward. Meanwhile, nearly 105,000 pound laser guided ground piercing bombs were dropped from Kent's escort group, and were placed on hardpoints under the wings of GBU 28 bunker busters and F 23s with the premise of impairing their stealth performance. The 60 Randalls that were hanging, special bombs for destroying runways hit the center of Jizz's body with the same force and pierced her body. Bunker Buster penetrates the hard exoskeleton and burrows into Jizz's body, and D. Randall explodes all at once as the solid rocket motor ignites and burrows deeper into Jizz's body. Jizz's body suddenly swells up due to the impact of the explosion, and finally, the exoskeleton, which cannot withstand the impact of the explosion, bursts into pieces along with blood and flesh. Jaya uh, exclamation mark. Jizz's body was torn in half, and he let out a scream as if he was dying while spewing out purple blood. However, the attack on Jizz was not over yet. Scream, roar, Chioda, who was following slightly behind Kent and the others, transformed the body of the YF-24, which was one size larger than the F-23 it was based on, into humanoid form during descent. She then attacked Jizz's body with the massive cannons and rocket pods attached to the hard points under its wings, causing severe damage. This one's just for fun. After firing off all the 88mm armor-piercing shells and rockets in an instant, Chioden unleashed the Panzer Faust equipped with a thermobaric warhead, ensuring devastation within Jizz's body. Confirming the raging flames consuming Jizz's insides, Chioda reverted her aircraft to fighter mode and withdrew from the scene. Is this the end of it? Watching Jizz slowly descending after being bisected and gutted by Chioda, Kent muttered to himself. However, things weren't going to be that simple. What? Seriously? Just when it seemed like the light had faded from Jizz's single and compound eyes, an eerie black light reignited, and it charged ferociously towards Kent's F-23. And not only that, 
Despite losing more than half of its body and presumably lightening its load, its flight speed and maneuverability had significantly increased. Damn it, why won't it die? Is it some kind of cockroach? And its first master, your highness. Unexpectedly, Kent quickly slammed on the foot pedal and pushed the control stick down, banking sharply to the left to dodge Jizz's onslaught. However, despite evading the collision, Kent found himself outmaneuvered as Jizz seized the opportunity and chased after him. Master, I'll provide cover, please disengage, please, it's right on my tail. I'll try to shake it off, as Kent gripped the throttle lever, attempting to outmaneuver Jizz as it pursued relentlessly with its remaining wings flapping and its jaws wide open. A sudden urgent communication link opened and Catherine's voice filled Kent's ear through the JHMCS speaker. Catherine, sorry, but I don't have time to, just keep going. Pass through the cumulus clouds located 40 kilometers to your right at an altitude of 450 meters. What? Understood. Huh? Understood. Kent is momentarily taken aback by Catherine's instructions, but he obediently follows them and lowers his altitude to 450 heading towards the designated cumulus clouds with jizz in tow. Are these the altitude and direction? Correct? Yes, it's perfect. Master. What on earth are you planning to do, Catherine? Oh, it's dangerous. I'll crush that big butt perfectly. Kent asked while dodging Jizu who tried to bite her, and Catherine answered with a serious face. Completely? How on earth can we use the same moves we did just now? I have hands. How can you do this to Jizz who flies at such a ridiculous speed? Seriously. If the timing is right, it's possible. The moment Kent passed through the side of a cumulus cloud designated as Catherine, he saw an object hiding in the shadows of the cumulus cloud, and was speechless. Then, at the moment when Jizu's compound eyes caught sight of a battleship floating in the sky as he tried to slip past the cumulus clouds in pursuit of Kent. 646 centimeters type 91 armor piercing bullets were fired with a roar. There was no time to dodge, there was no way to miss, from just a few tens of meters away, and Jizz was hit by a type 91 armor piercing bullet before he could react to the extremely close range gunfire. The well timed type 91 armor piercing bullet pierced Jizu's head, the particularly hard exoskeleton of his head as easily as paperwork, and after stirring up his clogged brain, the time fuse was released. Is activated. The large amount of explosives that had been packed causes a huge explosion and completely blows off Jizz's head. Ship number 111, I think you were able to bring something like this with you. The aerial battleship was in a tragic state of being covered in large amounts of Jizz's flesh and purple blood. Actually, it was laid down as the fourth Yamato class battleship, but as the war situation worsened, it had the unfortunate fate of being dismantled. Kent looked at the ship that had followed him in fascination. Okay, let's go home, yeah? What is this radio? It's broadcasting to all frequencies. Ha, Chioda, please go and do it. Is it okay? There's no way you'll abandon me. After the battle, Kent is taking a breather when he receives an unsolicited radio call. After hearing the contents of the radio communication, Kent sighs and decides to send Chioda there. I got it, master. Following orders, Kent sees Chioda's YF-24 fly away and points the plane's nose toward the airfield on the mainland of Paribim. I'm going to go somewhere, run away, like this. I don't know what to do. I still have things to do. Kent couldn't help but want to run away when he saw Catherine smiling and standing proudly greeting the F-23 as it landed safely and returned to the hangar. Volume 04 Chapter 12 The first to notice the approaching presence were the three submarines of the 7th Submarine Squadron, patrolling a hundred kilometers away from the expedition fleet planning the conquest of Gloria. Ugh. This is boring incredibly boring. First officer, do something about it, remarked Captain Francis Mayfield, one of the numerous female captains aboard the Virginia-class nuclear-powered submarine SSN-77. Virginia, as it cruised at 10 knots, shrouded in darkness at a depth of 150 meters, with sunlight blocked by seawater. Equipped with a photonic mast, which does not penetrate the sail like traditional periscopes due to its non-penetrating design. The command center lacked protruding periscopes. Instead, it featured advanced controls such as joysticks, and cluttered instruments masqueraded as various displays and consoles. Captain Mayfield, with her commanding aura akin to a stern queen, 
sat in the captain's chair, her face turned away from her subordinate, Lieutenant Commander Arthur Maxwell, who sat behind her. Such boredom, Captain, we are currently on a mission, Maxwell responded tentatively. Captain Mayfield, with an expression devoid of emotion, her eyebrows slightly furrowed, exuded an aura of dominance that made one instinctively want to submit. She petulantly challenged Maxwell's authority, to which Maxwell could only shake his head resignedly. I understand, but, sigh. It's so dull when nothing happens, Mayfield lamented. Please bear with it, Captain, Maxwell urged. As Captain Mayfield needlessly flaunted her sensuality by running her fingers through her short, neatly trimmed blonde hair, shifting her long slender legs on her lap, and fanning her ample bosom with her hand, Maxwell could only look away in exasperation, reprimanding her. Hey hey, what's wrong? Why turn away? Mayfield teased, noticing Maxwell's slightly flushed cheeks, which he had brought upon himself. Not only did Captain Mayfield revel in Maxwell's discomfort, but the other officers and crew packed into the command center also chuckled at Maxwell's naive reaction. They think this is amusing, but it's not their problem. Knowing from experience that Captain Mayfield wouldn't care the least bit about preserving one's pride and might even toy with them further, Maxwell could only grit his teeth in frustration, re-signed to silence. How cold of you to remain silent, first officer. Ha ha, can't you entertain yourself with me around? Mayfield chided. Sigh, Captain, if you keep saying such things, something might actually happen, and it won't be pleasant. Maxwell warned. Just as Maxwell tried to deflect Captain Mayfield's verbal assault, a sudden shout interrupted them. Captain. An object rapidly approaching our vessel from the 12 o'clock direction, 3,000 meters away, depth 800, traveling at 10 knots. The sonar operator, monitoring the surroundings while listening to underwater sounds through the passive sonar, suddenly raised his voice. Captain. The officers fell silent exchanging meaningful glances. Don't give me those looks. It's not my fault. All right, all hands. Battle stations. Move it. Now. Captain Mayfield ordered, feeling the accusatory stares from Maxwell and the crew in the command center. Roger that. Immediately after Maxwell and the others responded, the alarm signaling battle stations blared throughout the ship, the normal lighting shifting to red, indicating the implementation of battle stations. The crew rushed to their assigned positions in a flurry of activity. While the crew assumed their positions, Captain Mayfield and Lieutenant Commander Maxwell gathered around the HLSD console, capable of displaying various tactical information, to assess the situation. So, what's the approaching object? It's not an enemy submarine, is it? Captain Mayfield inquired. Well, we can hear sounds like fins or a tail splashing through the water, so it's likely some kind of sea monster. Maxwell replied, a sea monster. A creature lurking in the depths. Perfect for passing the time. Captain Mayfield mused. Captain, engaging in unnecessary combat. What are you saying? A sea monster is heading our way. This falls within the scope of self-defense. Though Captain Mayfield maintained her formal demeanor, it was evident that she intended to engage the approaching sea monster for the sole purpose of alleviating boredom. Now, Request cooperation from Curacio and Viborg. Let's strike together. She ordered. Yes, ma'am. Responding to Captain Mayfield's orders with a slight slump in his shoulders, Maxwell immediately contacted the Oyashio class submarine SS 596 Curacio and the modernized Kilo class submarine B 227 Viborg, securing their cooperation in combat through underwater acoustic communication. Load torpedoes into all tubes from 1 to 4. Roger. Loading torpedoes into tubes 1 to 4. Prepare torpedoes for tubes 1 and 2 next. Preparing torpedoes for tubes 1 and 2. According to the predetermined plan, the Viborg surfaced towards the seat to report the situation to the expeditionary fleet. After confirming that the Curacio had deployed on the starboard side of the Virginia at a distance of 800 yards, the Virginia prepared for attack by loading MK-48 heavyweight guided torpedoes into each of its four 533mm pressure-type torpedo tubes, only opening the launch ports of tubes 1 and 2. Similarly, the Curacio prepared for attack, loading Type 89 long torpedoes into its six 533mm torpedo tubes and opening the launch ports of tubes 1, 2, 3, 
and four, fire the pingers, understood. Both ships then released pingers, sonar signals, from their bow sonar arrays to confirm the precise position of the target before launching torpedoes. This is enormous. Estimated target length is 500 meters. Distance from our vessel is 2,500. The sonar operator, astonished by the echoes of the active sonar, widened his eyes in disbelief. What? Don't panic, Xo. It'll die soon enough. Ah. Uh, my apologies, Captain. While Maxwell, the Xo, reacted with surprise to the sonar operator's report, Captain Mayfield remained composed showing no signs of concern even after realizing the size of the approaching sea monster. All right, launch torpedoes from tubes 1 and 2. Torpedoes from tubes 1 and 2. As the torpedo officer echoed Captain Mayfield's command, two MK-48 heavyweight guided torpedoes were released into the sea from tubes 1 and 2. Following suit, four Type 89 long torpedoes were launched from the Curacio. Target's trajectory unchanged. Bearing 12 o'clock, distance 2000. Depth 330 seconds to torpedo impact. Guided by the active passive sonar systems mounted on the torpedoes, all six torpedoes approached the massive sea monster. Impact in 3, 2, 1, 0. As the MK 48S and Type 89 swam relentlessly towards the sea monster without showing any signs of evasion, they collided, causing a brief, dazzling flash in the dim underwater environment followed by the shockwave of explosions. All torpedoes hit the target. HMPH, anticlimactic. Transition to condition 2 readiness, just as Captain Mayfield decided to stand down from condition I combat posture, the sonar officer, who had been listening intently, furrowed his brow and spoke up. Captain, please wait a moment. What's wrong? This is. Target still active. Closing in on our vessel, distance 1500, depth 200 speed 50 knots. Despite intermittently sending out active sonar pings to confirm the target's destruction, the sonar continued to detect the approaching threat. What? It's still alive? Damn it, fire torpedoes from tubes 3 and 4. Torpedoes from tubes 3 and 4. Reload for the next volley. Captain Mayfield and Xo Maxwell swiftly issued orders, mobilizing the crew of the Virginia to neutralize the approaching sea monster. Two torpedoes launched from the Curacio. What? Rapidly approaching torpedoes detected from behind, first presumed to be the Sigval launched by the Viborg. Following the torpedo launch from the Virginia, the Curacio also fired additional torpedoes. Additionally, after completing its report to the expeditionary fleet and joining the battle, the Viborg fired six VA-111 Sigval torpedoes towards the sea monster, threading the needle between the Virginia and the Curacio. Nicknamed underwater missiles, the Sigvals, upon being ejected from the launch tubes, initially traveled at 50 knots. However, immediately after launch, the liquid-fueled rocket engines ignited, propelling them to a maximum speed of 200 knots approximately 370 km per hour, in an instant. This astounding velocity was achieved due to the Sigval's ability to create a large number of small bubbles, supercavitation, around itself as it traveled, significantly reducing drag and resistance. The fearsome pride of the Shikva was its unparalleled lightning speed. However, despite consecutive hits from the MK-48 heavyweight guided torpedo and the Type 89 long-range torpedo, the sea demons remained undefeated. WH what do you mean the torpedoes aren't effective? This is bad. Captain, we should consider a temporary retreat. Fine, there's no other choice. Full engine power, hard to starboard. Captain Mayfield, feeling the pressure of their weaponry's inefficacy, lost composure as Lieutenant Commander Maxwell suggested a retreat. Realizing their current arsenal was inadequate, Captain Mayfield accepted Lieutenant Commander Maxwell's advice and opted for retreat. Full engine power, hard to starboard. In response to Captain Mayfield's retreat order, the two helmsmen seated before the control console tilted their joysticks to the right, swinging the ship's hull around. Whoa, whoa, watch out. As the ship increased speed for retreat and swung sharply, Captain Mayfield, who had slipped on the tilted floor of the Virginia's command center, was promptly caught by Lieutenant Commander Maxwell who hurriedly supported him. Curacio, the Borg, commenced the turn just like the Virginia. Following the Virginia's retreat decision, the Curacio and the Borg followed suit, initiating their turns simultaneously. In the tilted command center, 
The sonar operator grasped the railing and raised their voice to report to the captain. Target increasing speed 20 knots, distance 800, depth 150. Still accelerating, we won't make it. They're catching up. Damn it. Prepare for impact, everyone. As Captain Mayfield was held by Lieutenant Commander Maxwell, he shouted, As we're about to make contact with the target, fire the pingers at maximum power, directing them rearward. Lieutenant Commander Maxwell issued a separate order to the sonar operator, distinct from Captain Mayfield's command. Understood. Distance between our ship and target, 700, 500, 300, 200, 100, 50, 10. Pingers fired. Zero. As the sonar operator counted down to zero, the Virginia discharged the pingers at maximum power. At the instant the countdown reached zero, a tremendous impact struck the Virginia's hull. Ugh, oh, ugh. In the face of the potentially devastating impact, every crew member aboard the Virginia screamed in unison. Ugh, report casualties immediately. Emerging from Lieutenant Commander Maxwell's arms, Captain Mayfield, his voice piercing through the dimly lit command center due to the emergency power, surveyed the scene. Damage appears severe, with apparent contact at the aft section of the hull. We're taking on water in the aft 7th and 8th blocks. It's flooding the engine room too. The screw has detached from the hull. Current propulsion is at zero. The ship's current speed is 4 knots. Further decrease in speed. Depth is 170. Still sinking. Trouble. Water is nearing the reactor. Damn it. We'll abandon the stern of the ship immediately. Seal off the bulkheads. We must prevent water from entering the reactor at all costs and blow the main ballast tank. Do not let the ship sink any further. Understood. Lieutenant Maxwell's quick thinking saved the day. The sea demons, closing in to crush the Virginia, were momentarily startled by the high-pitched sound of the sonar, emitted at maximum power, and veered slightly away just before collision. Thanks to that, the Virginia narrowly escaped sinking, with only its stern deeply gouged. However, the damage was extensive. The shrouded propeller system was completely destroyed. The lightweight wide aperture hydrophone array at the rear was also damaged, causing flooding in various areas, and the ship was slowly sinking towards the seabed from the stern. Communication lost with the Curatio and the Borg. I hear the sound of metal grinding, and a massive release of air. Damn. With the effective sinking report of the Curatio and the Borg, the atmosphere in the command center sank further and only Captain Mayfield's regretful words echoed round. Ouch, Captain, are you alright? Shielding Captain Mayfield, Lieutenant Maxwell, bleeding from a head wound after hitting his forehead on the console corner, finally regained consciousness. You're awake. Lieutenant, are you alright? You're bleeding. Yeah, somehow. Captain Mayfield, noticing Lieutenant Maxwell's injury, hurried over, showing genuine concern and checking on his condition. Captain, are you alright? Yeah. Thanks to you. I owe you one. MMGH. As the two exchanged words, a sudden impact reverberated through the hull. We've grounded on the seabed. Depth is 230. Attempting to surface by expelling seawater from the main ballast tank and replacing it with air, the Virginia ended up grounding on the seabed due to excessive flooding. We'll have to wait for rescue. Yes, sir. But will rescue come? If we've lost contact, they should come looking for us. I see. However, the question is whether our oxygen will last until then. All we can do is hope. Yeah. Disabled and without power, the Virginia could do nothing but wait for rescue in the darkness, submerged at a depth of 230 meters. Volume 04 Chapter 13. At Area E5.525, encountered unidentified giant creature, initiating defensive combat. Immediately after this report was sent from the 7th Submarine Squadron's Viborg to the Expeditionary Fleet. Communication with the 7th Submarine Squadron was lost. The headquarters of the Expeditionary Fleet, puzzled by this development, dispatched a sharp, split hybrid airborne reconnaissance pod equipped FA-18E slash F Super Hornet for visual confirmation. The reconnaissance revealed two oil slicks, likely remnants of sunken submarines, and numerous floating objects resembling submarine wreckage in the area where the 7th Submarine Squadron had lost contact. Furthermore, as the FA-18E-F pilot witnessed the extraordinary sight, they expanded their search range. A colossal sea monster, akin to an island, 
a black king sea serpent with a long neck and dorsal fins arranged in three vertical rows, was spotted swimming towards the direction where the expeditionary fleet, engaged in the conquest of Gloria, was stationed, moving at a speed of 15 knots. This is Romeo O2, giant sea monster, no, sea serpent, confirmed at area E5.515, heading west at approximately 15 knots towards Gloria. Distance from expeditionary fleet is about 90 kilometers. Although its size and details differ, it's like watching a plesiosaurus, the pilot reported. The revelation from the reconnaissance sortie through the expeditionary fleet into chaos. The timing couldn't have been worse. With the unexpected development of a defection request from enemy infiltrators, the main landing force had rushed into the landing operation prematurely, without proper preparation only to find themselves isolated and under fierce enemy resistance upon landing. While efforts were underway to rescue these stranded units and prepare for the landing of the Marine Corps, the appearance of the monstrous sea serpent at a perilously close distance of about 90 kilometers prompted the expeditionary fleet to make a swift decision. Recognizing the vulnerability of the ongoing landing operation amidst the chaos, the expeditionary fleet, albeit reluctantly, ordered an immediate cessation of Marine Corps landing preparations and instructed the transport convoy to evacuate the area, leaving behind the units already on shore. Simultaneously, following orders from Parabem's mainland headquarters to annihilate the Leviathan, battleships, missile cruisers, and missile destroyers unleashed nearly 200 anti-ship missiles, BGM-109B Tomahawk as and RGM-84 Harpoon from armored box launchers and MK-41 VLS. Furthermore, aircraft carriers deployed attack squadrons armed with anti-submarine and anti-ship weapons, provocatively launching an assault on the Leviathan, which calmly swam near the surface. With these countermeasures in place, the staff at the expeditionary fleet's headquarters regained some composure. Despite the Leviathan's immense size, they believed that it would succumb to the overwhelming barrage of attacks. They questioned the necessity of evacuating the transport convoy. However, this marked the beginning of a nightmare for the expeditionary fleet. Amidst the hundreds of combat ships, as tomahawks and harpoons soared at near supersonic speeds just above the sea surface, a momentous event occurred. The Leviathan ceased its motion and extended its long neck forward, revealing a gaping maw lined with sharp teeth. What in there? As the pilot of the monitoring FA-18E slash F pondered the Leviathan's strange behavior, a geometric magic circle materialized in front of the Leviathan's open mouth. Even those without magical aptitude could see the immense amount of magical energy swirling within it. Hey! Hey hey hey! Something's seriously wrong. Utilizing its dorsal fins, specialized organs for gathering faint magical energy from both the atmosphere and the sea. The Leviathan synthesized the collected energy with its own, compressing it into a highly dense magical projectile in a matter of seconds. Then, in the next moment, the compressed magical projectile, initially the size of a bowling ball, transformed into a beam of destructive force, emitting from the Leviathan's mouth. With each movement of the Leviathan's head, the black magical beam streaked from right to left across the sea surface. Immediately after, Approximately half of the approaching tomahawks and harpoons were obliterated in midair by the magical beam, detonating their payloads and creating nearly a hundred fireballs. Seriously? Witnessing the overwhelming destructive power, the pilot of the FA-18E slash F was momentarily stunned, forgetting even to maneuver the aircraft. Despite this, around a hundred tomahawks and harpoons that narrowly avoided the Leviathan's attack continued their advance towards the Leviathan. However, the Leviathan once again opened its mouth, deploying a different geometric magic circle from before. This time, it released the gathered magical energy not as a beam but as a barrage of magical projectiles, maintaining their original form. The magical bullets fired successively were like machine gun rounds, taking down tomahawks and harpoons with terrifying precision. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. At this rate, we're going down with all ammo expended. The FA-18E slash F pilot, noticing that the number of remaining tomahawks and harpoons, visible to the naked eye, was now barely over 30, let out a voice akin to a scream. However, Lady Luck smiled upon the Parabem side. Leviathan had exhausted all the magical power it had gathered, causing its assault to cease. Seizing upon this perfect opportunity, 
the remaining 15 tomahawks and harpoons, which had not yet been shot down, plunged into Leviathan's body, unleashing a massive explosion to vent their accumulated frustration. All right, phew. I thought we were done for a moment there, but anyway, that takes care of th, huh? The pilot, who had been heaving a sigh of relief as Leviathan was enveloped in flames and smoke, was left speechless upon seeing Leviathan emerge unscathed from the smoke. The battle with Leviathan had only just begun. Following the initial missile assault, the attacking force attempted to close in on Leviathan but suffered considerable damage from its anti-aircraft defenses. As a result, aerial attacks were withheld, and instead, saturation strikes with Tomahawk and Harpoon missiles were conducted four times. Despite numerous hits, Leviathan's robust phosphorus defense prevented effective damage. Taking these factors into account, the ultimate strategy against Leviathan, with its formidable defense, was determined to be a concentrated barrage of firepower from surface ships. Handpicked vessels from the expeditionary fleet were selected, and a special task force was hastily assembled to confront Leviathan and determine the outcome. Have we received any word from the 7th Submarine Squadron? We've been trying to reach them persistently. But there's been no response from either the Virginia, Curacio, or the Borg. Moreover, Two oil slicks were found in the area where their signals were lost. It's likely that at least two out of the three submarines have been sunk. I see. At present, three submarine rescue ships are diverting their course away from Leviathan's path towards the designated area. They've been instructed to notify us immediately if they find anything. I apologize for the trouble. No need to apologize. I understand the situation. Amidst the preparations to eradicate Leviathan, named by Kent. The Sea Dragon, in the anticipated encounter zone, the flagship of the Special Task Force, the Iowa-class battleship BB-63 Missouri, commanded by Vice Admiral Douglas Mayfield, who also happens to be the father of the ship's captain, Fran Mayfield, awaits the mission while worrying about his daughter's safety. That foolish daughter of mine, causing worry like this. And right before her wedding, I should have stopped her from going out on this mission after all. Although maintaining composure outwardly, Vice Admiral Mayfield's heart is filled with anxiety and regret. What? We've detected submerged targets in motion. Distance, 30,000. Depth, 150. They're still approaching our fleet. However, regardless of Vice Admiral Mayfield's concerns, the situation continues to evolve rapidly. Though temporarily losing sight of Leviathan after it submerged to avoid the relentless attacks from the expeditionary fleet, the special task force, equipped with MK-50 torpedoes and supported by numerous SH-60 Seahawks flying above, managed to scatter sonar boys extensively along Leviathan's expected route, effectively locating it once again at a distance of 30,000 at a depth of 150 meters. They're here. All units, proceed according to the operation plan. Understood. With Vice Admiral Mayfield's order to switch gears, the special task force springs into action. Alert shark, whale, and dolphin units to initiate attack immediately. Launch attack squadrons from Hayu and Eyes. All ships, prepare for anti-submarine combat. As the operation commences, the squadron of SH-60 helicopters flying above quickly forms formations and heads towards Leviathan, followed by SH-60K helicopters launched from the lead ships of the Hyuga-class escort vessels, Hyuga and Eyes, armed with Type 97 short torpedoes, AGM-114M Hellfire II missiles, and aerial depth charges. From squadron leader to Missouri, all units are in attack position. Commencing attack now, Missouri acknowledges. The three squadrons, now in position, simultaneously release MK-50 torpedoes towards Leviathan. Immediately after, drag shoots for attitude control deploy from the rear of the MK-50 torpedoes as they descend slowly, maintaining their downward trajectory towards the sea. Upon impact with the water's surface, the MK-50 torpedoes release their drag shoots and ignite their engines. Tracking Leviathan through acoustic homing, they accelerate at 40 knots, in no time. The MK-50 torpedoes close the distance to Leviathan and detonate one after another underwater, sending numerous towering columns of water shooting up. From squadron leader to Missouri, all rounds seem to have hit the target. However, we cannot confirm any debris on the surface. We will depart the area for ammunition resupply. 
With all torpedoes launched by the three squadrons hitting Leviathan, they turn their bows and head back to their mother ships for replenishment. From Missouri to all units, the operation continues. Keep up the attack. Despite losing sight of Leviathan's current position due to the underwater detonations caused by the MK-50 torpedoes, the Special Task Force, considering Leviathan's resilience, continues the assault. Helicopter units from Hayu and Ais continue to circle the explosion points of the MK-50 torpedoes dropping aerial depth charges indiscriminately, causing numerous columns of water to erupt into the sky. With such concentrated attacks, it's likely that it'll cause some damage to that creature. Vice Admiral Mayfield murmurs as he observes the multitude of water columns on the display in the CIC. What do you think? We still haven't sighted Leviathan. What's this? Leviathan spotted. 12 o'clock, distance 23,000. Amidst the continuous towering water spouts, Leviathan emerged onto the sea, still unscathed. Then let's show the full force of the Parabem Navy. Roger that. The resilient Leviathan stirred up a storm of brutality from the special task fleet. All ships, weapons free, commence surface combat. With a resounding cry, Leviathan, swinging its long neck menacingly, faced off against a multitude of missile-equipped ships, led by four Virginia-class nuclear missile cruisers and four Kirov-class missile cruisers integrated into the special task fleet. Simultaneously, the main guns and secondary guns of Japanese battleships Yamato, Musashi, Kongo, Hiai, Haruna, Kairishima, Fuso, and Yamashiro, American battleships South Dakota, Indiana, Massachusetts, Alabama, Iowa, Wisconsin, New Jersey, and Missouri, British battleships Prince of Wales and King George V, German battleships Bismarck and Tirpitz all erupted in unison, commence assault by the 5th and 6th destroyer flotillas. Following the thunderous orchestra of naval artillery, the 5th destroyer flotilla, consisting of heavy cruisers Mogami and Mikuma, light cruiser Ruo, destroyers Ikazuchi, Inazuma, Hibiki, and Akatsuki and the 6th Destroyer Flotilla, composed of heavy cruisers Suzuyu and Kimono, light cruiser Obukuma, destroyers Urafame, Isakase, Yukikase, and Hamakase, relentlessly fired their main guns while closing in on Leviathan at full speed. They launched all of their oxygen torpedoes, including the renowned Type 93 torpedoes of the Imperial Japanese Navy, from their torpedo tubes. The Type 93 torpedoes, silently and swiftly, crept towards Leviathan without leaving a trace. Fifteen seconds until target impact for the first wave of anti-ship missiles. To minimize Leviathan's anti-aircraft interception, approximately 15 SH-60K helicopters, despite suffering casualties, launched attacks with AGM-114M Hellfire II missiles, assuming the role of decoys. They evaded incoming anti-ship missiles such as Tomahawks, Harpoons, 3M24 Urine, and P-700 Granite, the SH-60K helicopters, buzzing around like flies, annoyingly attacked, disappeared, relieving Leviathan's attention from the approaching missile barrage, but interception was no longer an option. Target. All hits. Hundreds of anti-ship missiles, without missing a beat, overwhelmed Leviathan, a behemoth nearly twice the size of the super dreadnought battleship Yamato, crashing into it one after another, engulfed in flames. Leviathan let out a final agonizing cry. 3, 2, 1, 0. Impact. However, the assault by the Special Task Fleet persisted unabated. Following the tempest of anti-ship missiles, countless shells rained down from battleships and other vessels. Leviathan found itself engulfed in a multitude of water spouts, its visibility obscured, but the flashes of explosions confirmed the hits. Then, after several seconds of merciless bombardment, as the towering water spouts began to fall under gravity, a Type 93 torpedo, which had been swimming underwater, latched onto Leviathan's flank, creating a new series of water spouts. Although over a hundred Type 93 torpedoes were launched, only three found their mark. Nevertheless, even three hits were enough to demonstrate the exceptional power of the Type 93 torpedo. However, what happened to the target? Breaking the eerie silence that had lingered since the end of the attack, Admiral Mayfield sought confirmation. Target. Remains. Intact. The report from the radar operator dashed Admiral Mayfield's expectations. What. Do you mean. 
It's still intact, displayed on the CIC's monitor, Leviathan, far from displaying a mangled carcass, remained completely unscathed, blazing with fury, and ready for retaliation, keep up the attack, don't give him a chance to strike back, understood, despite Admiral Mayfield's order to continue the attack, fearing Leviathan's counterattack, it was slightly delayed, high energy reaction detected from the target, what? As if in retaliation for being mercilessly pounded, countless magical bullets were continuously fired from the enraged Leviathan. Immediately after, explosions echoed, and a tremendous impact ran through the hull of the Missouri. What the TCH damage report? While Admiral Mayfield gripped onto nearby objects to withstand the impact, the captain of the Missouri shouted orders to his subordinates to assess the damage. Direct hits on the starboard central third gun turret and the first machine gun group. Numerous casualties. Ammunition ignited. Fire outbreak. Damn it. Hurry with damage control. Understood. Due to the magical bullets hitting, the ammunition prepared in the third gun turret exploded causing a fire on the starboard central side of the Missouri, and crew members, damage control personnel, rushed around inside and outside the ship to handle the situation. Furthermore, around the Missouri, black smoke rose, and the tragic scenes of several other damaged vessels were unfolding. Report Damage from the previous attack, 17 heavily damaged, 25 moderately damaged, 19 lightly damaged, 9 sunk. Among battleships, only four remain unscathed, the Kairishima, Yamashiro, Alabama, and New Jersey. The damage caused by Leviathan's counterattack was extensive, affecting approximately 40% of the Special Task Force's vessels. By the way, all the vessels that were heavily damaged or sunk by Leviathan's magical bullets were destroyers or light cruisers, with battleships remaining at worst moderately damaged. You monster! In this situation, we have no choice but to use that. What? Are you talking about that? That is still in the experimental phase. I understand that. But there's no other way to change the tide of the battle but to use that. Understood. I'll immediately send orders to the Long Beach, Bainbridge, and Truxton. Overwhelmed by the staggering damage inflicted by Leviathan's single counterattack, Admiral Mayfield disregarded the objections of his chief of staff and decided to deploy a certain weapon still in the experimental phase into actual combat. Captain, incoming transmission from the Missouri. Orders to the Long Beach, Bainbridge, and Truxton to utilize railguns. What? Are you kidding me? Railguns haven't even undergone proper testing yet. What is command thinking, Captain? What shall we do? These orders come directly from Admiral Mayfield himself, defying them. I know. Dot. There's no other choice. We're going all in. Prepare for railgun bombardment. Show Leviathan what we're made of. Understood. Responding to Admiral Mayfield's orders aboard the Missouri, the captain of the Long Beach, equipped with an experimental railgun, proceeded with preparations for firing, albeit with hesitation. Release safety valves 1 through 4. Power supply lines, all green, power charge at 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100% ready to fire. The USS Long Beach, which had removed its 38 caliber 127mm single gun mounts from the forward deck and replaced them with railguns, gradually supplied the railguns with power generated by its nuclear reactor, totaling 30 megawatts. As it prepared for attack, it moved from the rear of the fleet to the front to secure firing lines, aiming its split-barreled railguns at the Leviathan, unleashing crackling blue-white flashes repeatedly. High energy reaction confirmed. Second shot incoming. Damn it. Full rudder. Evasive maneuvers. Full rudder. It's no use. We won't make it in time for evasion. Shit. However, just as the railgun-equipped ships Long Beach, Bainbridge, and Truxton prepared to attack, Magical projectiles launched from the Leviathan once again assailed the special task force. Question mark what? The captain, informed that evasion was futile, cursed under their breath and instinctively closed their eyes, bracing for the impending impact. Yet, after the sound of explosions from nearby ships being hit, Long Beach remained unscathed. Was it luck that the enemy's attack missed? The captain cautiously opened their eyes, only to witness the Kairishima, 
forcibly inserted between Long Beach and the Leviathan's firing lines, acting as a shield and engulfed in flames. They, protected us, Captain, it's dire. Bainbridge and Drugst are now incapacitated from the previous attack. As a result, the railgun equipped ships left unharmed are only this vessel. To the gunners of the railguns, do not squander Kirishima's sacrifice. Lay waste to the Leviathan. Understood, the Captain deeply moved by the Kairishima's sacrifice in protecting Long Beach, rallied the gunners of the rail guns. And so, Long Beach, having emerged from the shadow of Kairishima to avenge its burning ally, aimed at the Leviathan fire. At the captain's command, the intensity of the rail guns flashes overflowed from the muzzle, and in the next moment, a projectile accelerated by the Lawrence force was shot out at Mach 6 speed striking the Leviathan 14,000 meters away from Long Beach with tremendous kinetic energy, though the aim had slightly missed, resulting in only a portion of its torso being torn apart into phosphorus and flesh. It was still a significant achievement considering the Leviathan had remained unscathed despite previous attacks. Prepare for the next shot immediately, let's keep up the pressure. Learn. The captain spoke in quick succession as if to admonish his subordinates who were furious at the sight of Leviathan, who had been immune to previous attacks, bleeding and groaning in pain with a voice that was clearly different from before. Give instructions to, what, we're in trouble, an abnormality has occurred in the power transmission system to the railgun, in addition, an abnormality has occurred in the muzzle, it appears that part of the muscle has melted. It's impossible to fire the next bullet. Hey, come this way. However, after all, the railgun, which is a weapon under test operation, develops dozens of abnormalities after just one shot, rendering it useless. R? We're starting to dive into the target. When the captain, who had no choice but to stand still, realized that he was at a disadvantage, Leviathan slowly dived into the sea. Shit. I have no choice but to miss this. The special fleet was attacked twice by magic bullets and was completely injured. Although the ships that barely had any combat capability continued to fire sporadically, none of the ships had enough power to pursue them and could only watch as Leviathan fled. However, there it is. Missiles and shells suddenly came from nowhere and hit Leviathan's wound cut open by the railgun. The missile forced the wound open, and the shell that flew into the body through the gaping wound exploded inside the body causing a large amount of blood to fly out, forcing Leviathan to give up on diving into the wound. What? Where did the attack come from now? The captain of the Long Beach, overwhelmed by the frustration of having to miss the Leviathan, let out a voice of surprise, but the answer to his question came not from his subordinates, but from the perpetrators of the attack, along with the next bullet. It came back. This is the first independent guerrilla fleet and this fleet will now participate in the battle to destroy Leviathan! Exclamation mark. The first independent guerrilla fleet under Major General Suzumu Sato, who had been fighting in various places, arrived at the battlefield at the last minute. The war situation has entered its final phase. The situation of the battle changed completely due to the presence of only 12 battleships that formed a single formation and jumped into the battlefield. If you let Leviathan escape here, it will be a disgrace to the end of your life. No matter what you do, kill him. Learn. On the bridge of the eyes, which is running at maximum war speed, Rear Admiral Saito yells out a shout, and his subordinates bravely respond to Rear Admiral Saito's command. The first independent guerrilla fleet, with its high morale, tried to close in on Leviathan and finish it off with artillery fire from extremely close range. Without fear of damage, target prepares to attack. When the first independent guerrilla fleet approaches Leviathan, Leviathan, which has become slow due to damage, slowly rears its head and attempts a counterattack. Stay on course, engine at slow speed, main gun firing. Immediately after the captain of eyes, who had been timing the timing of Leviathan's counterattack, issued an instruction. Eyes slowed down while being careful not to be hit by an Arta which was sailing directly behind, and began to attack Leviathan. Two 35.6 centimeters shells were fired into the sea in the line of sight of the ship. Damn, you missed it? No. That was on purpose. S. Seriously. The soldiers of the special fleet twisted their heads when they saw Eyes' mysterious actions, 
but they soon understood the meaning of Eyes's actions. The magic bullet fired towards Eyes crashed into the water column created by the 35.6 cm shell and exploded there. Maximum engine speed, steering 50 degrees. Okay, this is the end. By a clever trick, Eyes evaded Leviathan's counterattack and got within 8,000 meters. She steered the ship and aimed all of her main guns at Leviathan. At the same time, Hyuga, Oba, and Kanugaza broke from their single formation and spread out. Eleven ships, including Ishizu, Kongu, Kairishima, Okizuki, Turatsuki, Suzatsuki, Hatsatsuki, and Shinjetsu also aimed their cannons at Leviathan and began attacking. The concentrated fire from the twelve ships further enlarges Leviathan's wounds and blows out his internal organs. After the first independent guerrilla fleet's onslaught ended, what was found there was the corpse of Leviathan, exhausted and dying from a rain of cannonballs. Thus, Parabem, the battle to destroy Leviathan, which caused unexpected damage to the expeditionary fleet, finally came to an end. In a cold village nestled on the mountainside a short distance from the fortress city of Ballard, a place where the Snake People clan sought refuge, the atmosphere was unusually chaotic. The source of this chaos stemmed from the sudden appearance of Jiz and countless demons on the Karad Plains, just beyond the village's site. Each person is allowed only one piece of luggage. Leave any additional baggage behind here. Everyone, please form two lines from here. Don't panic, stay calm. Following the subjugation of the Hydra, soldiers from the 7th Mechanized Infantry Battalion, 5th Platoon, who had stationed themselves in the Snake People clan's village, prepared to comply with the orders from the command headquarters to retreat to the second defense line. Additionally, they facilitated the transportation of civilians who wished to evacuate, retreat, with the unit to escape from the approaching jizz and demons. Guiding the villagers, who clung to their precious belongings, they loaded them one by one onto the cargo bed of the Type 73 large truck sent by the 4th Division for transporting refugees. We're counting on you from here on out, says Yumiya. How's the progress? The captain of the 5th Platoon, Lieutenant Haruto Kairishima, in charge of overall command, inquired of his adjutant, 2nd Lieutenant Akari says Yumiya. Sir, the evacuation process is about 80% complete, so we should be able to depart within 15 minutes. 15 minutes. That's a bit tight. Hurry it up as much as possible. Understood. After confirming Suzumiya's slight nod, Haruto, accompanied by two subordinates, thoroughly inspected the village to ensure no villagers remained in their homes. Hey, isn't that the village chief over there? While conducting the inspection with his subordinates, Haruto noticed the village chief gazing silently towards the cave where the Hydra had been sealed, located on the outskirts of the village. Ah, it's you. Captain, it's time to depart, what are you doing? My apologies, I was bidding the village farewell and lost track of time. I see. Have you bid your farewells already? Yes. Then let's go. With that, Haruto, somewhat reluctantly, led the village chief, who was still casting longing glances towards the village, to the village square where the vehicles were gathering. We can't thank you enough. As they walked through the village, the village chief began speaking softly, expressing gratitude. Not only did you liberate our clan from the curse of the Hydra, but you also provided generous support for our livelihoods. Now our clan can finally move forward. That's true. But first, we must ensure a safe evacuation. Yes. Don't look so worried. Rest assured, we will protect you at all costs. And it seems we've managed to arrange the relocation you mentioned before. Is that true? Yes, it is. Ah, how can we ever thank you enough? Don't worry about it. We've spent weeks together. It's the least we could do. We're truly fortunate that you came to us. Hey, hold your tears for later. Haruto smiled at the sight of the village chief, overwhelmed with gratitude, shedding tears, and affectionately patted the chief's shoulder. Captain, the preparations for departure are complete. Ah, understood. Having finished their inspection, Haruto returned with the village chief to where second lieutenant Suzumiya was, just as the preparations for departure were wrapping up. Is everyone on board? All right, let's go. After confirming that everyone had boarded the vehicles, Haruto, who had boarded the lightly armored mobile vehicle later than anyone else, gave the command. The convoy, consisting of vehicles carrying all the villagers who wished to evacuate, the entire population of the village, and all the soldiers of the 5th platoon set off, 
heading straight for the fortress city of Ballard, where the 4th Division was stationed. Damn, has it already begun? Bang, 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 and the deafening sound of gunfire echoed in the distance. Once again, heavy artillery such as the 155mm howitzers deployed 20 kilometers behind Ballard. The 99-type self-propelled 155mm howitzer, the 203mm self-propelled howitzer, and the multiple launch rocket system, MLRS, launched projectiles including the Type 03 155mm multi-purpose projectile, 203mm shells, and M26 rocket shells, their swooshing sounds filling the air as they approached and landed. Boom! The explosion resounded, delayed but forceful as Haruto and his companions, along with the snake-like humanoid tribe, safely arrived in Ballard after leaving the village behind. A group of monstrous creatures, repeating destruction and slaughter, reached Ballard at the same time. Despite the desperate resistance of the 4th Division, the creatures, relying on sheer numbers, breached Ballard's city gates, flooding into the city. Consequently, a considerable number of monsters infiltrated the city and intense battles between the 4th Division and the monsters erupted in various locations. Captain, we need to hurry. Yeah, Haruto answers Yumiya, glancing at the units of the 4th Division rushing around to buy time, hurried towards the superior officer who should be at the headquarters of the division. Immediately redirect two platoons to the right flank of the town. If you dilly-dally, the defense line will be breached, and the rear will be infiltrated. Yes, sir. Excuse us, Colonel Kotaka, Lieutenant Haruto Kairishima and the 5th platoon have just returned safely, Haruto. Thank goodness you're safe, cough, Lieutenant Kairishima, rather. I'm relieved to see you safe, Colonel Kotaka, clad in a military uniform that seemed mismatched with the image of carrying a school bag, hastily issued orders, his face lighting up with joy at Haruto's safe return. But then he quickly composed himself, clearing his throat. Colonel. What's the situation on the battlefield? Um, it's not looking good. No, it's safe to say it's the worst. Furrowing his brows with a bitter expression, Colonel Kotaka uttered his words almost in disdain. The enemy's advance speed exceeded our expectations, causing both the troops' retreat and the evacuation of civilians who wished to flee to be delayed. We're currently buying time with delaying tactics as the troops retreat, but how long we can hold out is uncertain. I understand. So. What should our 5th platoon do? Retrieve the civilians near the front lines. The units engaged with the monsters don't have enough manpower to escort civilians. Understood. We'll start immediately. I'm counting on you. Oh, I almost forgot. Even in the worst case scenario, Ballard is scheduled to be abandoned in two hours, so don't forget that. And there have been reports that the attacking monsters are oddly well coordinated, so be extra cautious. Yes, sir. Don't let your guard down. With this reminder, Colonel Kotaka punctuated their conversation, and Haruto and Lieutenant Suzumiya saluted before leaving the division headquarters. Kanemori, come here for a moment. Yes, what is it? After returning to the 5th platoon and informing his subordinates about sending the snake-like humanoid tribe to the rear first and the task of retrieving civilians, Haruto discreetly summoned one of his subordinates. Listen, after taking the villagers to the rear base, find the soldiers of the SS division preferably officers if possible, and tell them that Kairishima requests their assistance, hand them this note, question mark, uh, understood, counting on you, wait, captain, please wait a moment, as the soldier who received the note was about to turn away, he called out to Haruto, what is it, I've been wanting to ask, and now seems like the only chance, but who are you, captain, the soldier's question lingered in the air, it's always been a mystery, you know, having such strong connections and influence within the guard. Well, I suppose when you do so much, people start to catch on. Haruto scratched his head vigorously, as if grappling with an itch, then sighed before responding to his subordinate's inquiry with a weary air. Well, it's probably been leaked anyway, so what's the harm? But listen, don't tell anyone else, alright? Yes, sir, I'm part of the first generation. Affiliated with I. Seriously, to those who didn't understand, Haruto's statement made absolutely no sense, but for those in the know, it was a startling revelation. Yeah, dead serious. So, 
Being part of the first generation means you were among the initial squad members summoned by His Excellency, and being affiliated implies a particularly trusted group due to the experiences shared during fortress combat, likely comprising individuals with the stature of senior officers within Paribim and I is supposed to be an internal reconnaissance agency, existing only as rumors about whether or not the guard created it. Thanks for the lengthy explanation. You've got it right. Um, what's your actual rank, then, Colonel? Um, sir? Can we just forget this conversation ever happened? I have this feeling that if this were to leak, I might meet with an unfortunate accident. Question mark um, why are you silent? Is it really that serious? Just make sure you don't meet with any unfortunate accidents. Alright, I'm counting on you to keep this under wraps. W wait, sir. P please wait. I'm begging you. Captain. I mean, sir. Haruto brushed off his clinging subordinate with a casual air and walked away as if to say, I don't know anything anymore. And thus, with a nonchalant expression, he left the scene behind. Though there was a slight altercation when escorting a clan of serpent folk to the rear with minimal protection, it was swiftly resolved with a stern reprimand from Haruto. The soldiers of the 5th squad immediately resumed their mission, swiftly collecting civilians left behind near the front lines. Captain's a bit clumsy isn't he? A soldier from the 5th squad, escorting a 73-type large truck carrying civilians recovered from the vicinity of the front lines, muttered quietly. Yeah. He was saying stuff like, can we really fight alongside you dummy humans to repay our debt? To those who wanted to fight alongside us. Well, it was effective in calming the situation, but the captain didn't get much appreciation. Yeah. But those who understand, understand. Let's hope so. The two soldiers reminisced about their absent-minded but kind-hearted Captain Aku. Was someone talking about me? No, right now, I need to focus on what to do with this. Meanwhile, Haruto, who had been collecting civilians left behind in the constant gunfire at the front lines, found himself caught up in a troublesome situation. They're still at the church. Let go, let go of me. H. Hey, calm down. The church you're talking about is already within the combat zone. It's too dangerous to go there now. Please, just calm down. Soldiers from a different unit than Haruto's 5th squad were restraining a girl who was causing a scene. Trying to rescue acquaintances left behind at the church that had already entered the combat zone. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Let go already. Damn perverts. Huh? Attempting to break free from the soldier's grasp. The girl clad in crimson armor delivered a powerful kick straight to the soldier's groin in front of her. Ugh. But it's not effective. What? The girl opened her eyes to see that the soldier who had been kicked in the man's groin, which was supposed to be his vital point, grabbed him again to hold him down without falling down. I'm equipped with a pug and pug groin defense system, so what's my blind spot? Jeffu? The two types were developed in response to an increase in the number of soldiers suffering from severe trauma to sensitive areas such as the genitals and anus, as well as to the lower body, due to damage caused by AIDS, improvised explosive devices, laid down by extremist armed groups in countries such as Iran and Afghanistan. The soldier, who was wearing body armor for the lower half of his body, smiled triumphantly at the girl, who was surprised to see that he had not taken any damage from the kick. But the next moment he was struck by the girl's straight right straight to his cheek, and fell silent. Says Yumiya, Tina, capture me. Ha. I understand. Kaya, what are you guys doing? Ha. Let's go. Wow. At the direction of Haruto, who could no longer watch, second lieutenant says Yumiya and private Dina Vermeer, a dog kin who had newly joined the 5th platoon to replace the soldiers who died during the Hydra subjugation started running toward the church. The girl was restrained in an instant and rendered harmless. Atatata, I'm sorry. Lieutenant Dono. We are sorry for the inconvenience. I don't care. I'll take care of this girl, so you guys can go back to your duties. Ha. After returning the soldier who was having trouble with the girl to his mission, Haruto turned to the girl. I feel sorry for you, but this is an emergency, so I ask you to follow my instructions. Even if I force you, you go just as Ensign says Yumiya put her foot on her leg and she lost her posture. Private Vermeer quickly mastered her arm and pushed her to the ground. The girl was unable to make a movement, but she looked at her as if she were looking at her parents' enemy. He glared at Haruto. Tina, take him to the cargo, type 73 large truck. I understand. 
Private Vermeer, who forced the girl to stand, saluted and answered Haruto while waving the fluffy tail that grew from his easy-to-deliver buttocks like a puppy being praised by its owner. Whoa, W wait a moment. The girl, about to be taken away by the canine soldier, Femal, clutched tightly against her side, stopped Haruto with tears welling in her eyes. What is it? Haruto asked, as I've been saying, there are many acquaintances of mine left behind at the church, can't you help rescue them, please lend your strength. Haruto glanced at Lieutenant Suzumiya upon hearing the girl's plea, then inquired, Suzumiya, how far is it to the church, I believe? It's about three blocks ahead, Suzumiya replied. No chance, it's already too late, Haruto said, shaking his head. What? But... We won't know until we try. It's a distance impossible to traverse with a horde of monsters around. Give it up. Haruto asserted. Then. Then let me go alone. The girl implored tearfully. I won't be a bother. Please. If you go. It'll trouble the soldiers fighting at the front. Tina. That's enough. Let her go. Haruto ordered. However. Haruto couldn't bring himself to agree. Knowing that the girl heading to the front lines would only hinder other units. Hey. As the girl, still held tightly by Femal, vanished from Haruto's sight, she continued to protest, wait, let go of me, stop, jeez, Haruto sighed, he understood her feelings to some extent, but well, there was no choice but to make her give up, it was for the best, though Haruto felt sympathetic towards the girl, he convinced himself that his decision was not mistaken, however, later on, Haruto would come to regret the choice he made. Volume 04 Chapter 15 and 16 Intense combat persisted, with ceaseless gunfire echoing from the forefront of the fortress city of Ballard to the nearby urban area. Let go of me. Let me go. Release me. NGH. GERR. Please, calm down just a bit. Private Tina Fermia struggled with the fierce resistance of the girl she held tightly under her arm. Each time the girl clad in crimson armor resisted. The armor clattered against her body, and the sword at her waist struck Fermia's arm forcefully. If you let go, I won't cause any trouble. Thrashing about like a child denied a treat. The girl attempted every form of resistance against Private Fermia, but all her efforts were futile. Oops. Phew, what are you saying? If I let go, you'll head straight for the church. It's obvious that would cause trouble for our allies currently fighting. Therefore, I cannot let go. Having endured nightmare-like days at the boot camp in Parabellum and survived hellish training to emerge as a soldier, Private Fermia, though frowning at the girl's resistance, calmly dealt with her, exerting a bit more force on the arm around the girl's waist. The superior strength of the canine humanoid race, to which the girl belonged, groaned as Fermia tightened her grip forcibly restraining her movements. Eek, uck. Please, sniff, let me go. Everyone. Everyone will. Die. Sniff, please. Sniff. Immediately realizing that resistance was futile after being restrained by private Fermia, the girl, tears streaming down her face, relaxed her body, re-signed to her fate. Even if you say that, I can't defy the captain's orders. Sniff please. Everyone at the church is my last remaining family. It's been ten years since. I lost my family. I can't bear to lose loved ones again. Private Fermia, who originally hailed from the slums of a provincial city in the Canary Kingdom, had joined the Parabellum army for the sake of supporting her family back home, which included her younger sister and brother. As she listened to the girl's story, her steps gradually slowed until she came to a complete stop. Sensing Fermia's hesitation, the girl, seeing her chance, pressed on, please, we won't cause you any trouble, there's a dried up well just around the corner over there, that well serves as the entrance to a secret passage that leads to the church, see, you won't be bothered if you go that way, right, what, why didn't you say that earlier, if you tell them about it, even the captain, sniff, no use, the secret passage is too narrow, it's only wide enough for two people, and it's like a maze inside, can't accommodate a large group. Then what's the point? What are you going to do there? I wish I could help everyone, but if I can't get your help, it's impossible to help them, but I can't just survive alone. I can't bear that. So I'll fight monsters with everyone and share their fate. NGHHH. What excuse should I give the captain? Seeing the determination in the girl's eyes as she looked up at her, Fermia muttered under her breath, 
How long does it take to go to the church and back through the secret passage? Huh? About 30 minutes round trip. 30 minutes. That's cutting it close. How many people are at the church? Probably around 30 to 40. Then we must hurry. Wah. Hey, wait. What are you? As Fermia dashed forward, the girl looked bewildered. If we hurry, we can help everyone. So let's go quickly. But, are you okay with this? It's a violation of orders. My instructor who trained me, well, he was a special instructor who came for just one day, said something like, if it doesn't get found out, it's not a problem, or rather, deal with it before it becomes a problem. He also said, compassion is not for others, it's for yourself. If someone's in trouble, help them, it'll come back to you someday. And as a soldier and as a human, or beast, strive to act in a way you can be proud of. Thus, in an unexpected moment, the teachings of some military dictator found resonance and blossomed. As the withdrawal approached, the issue came to light. Tiara still hasn't returned, and says Yumiya, who went to look for her, hasn't returned either. Yes, the last time we saw Private Fumul was when he went to the front line with the captain. Then, when the deputy captain, who returned a step ahead of the captain, found out that Private Fumul hadn't returned, she took a GPS device and went to bring him back. Damn it. That idiot. Went off to the church with that girl, damn it. Haruto, intending to retreat to the rear with the civilians they managed to recover, found himself unable to do so as the whereabouts of his two subordinates were unknown. So, there's no radio contact with Suzumiya and Tina? No, sir. We've been calling out to them continuously but there's been no response from either of them. What about their current location? Since the signal from the transmitter is weak, we can tell the general direction they're in, but it'll take a little longer to pinpoint their exact location. Damn it, we're running out of time. Haruto, frustrated, slammed his fist against the bed of the Type 73 large truck. This is Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka of the 7th Mechanized Infantry Battalion. What's going on with the 5th Platoon? Hurry up and fall back. Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka, who was commanding the retreat of his unit, grew impatient with Haruto's 5th platoon, which had not yet completed its retreat, and contacted them directly. This is the 5th platoon. We have a problem. Two of our members are missing. We request permission for search and rescue. What? Dot. It's regrettable, but Lieutenant Kairishima, I cannot authorize a search. Immediately retreat and regroup with friendly units. Colonel Kotaka, in 15. No, in 10 minutes, we can locate the two using GPS and immediately retrieve them. Please grant permission for the search. Permission cannot be granted. Immediately retreat. Colonel, Haruto grabbed the mic extended from his headset and pleaded loudly. Haruto, no matter how much you insist, or rather because it's you, obey my orders. This is an order as Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka, as a military personnel. Fall back immediately. Repeat. However, Haruto's plea did not sway Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka. Damn it. The 5th platoon will immediately retreat and regroup with friendly units. Understood. Take action immediately. That is all. Captain. As the communication was cut off, Haruto bowed his head, still gripping the PTT switch of the radio. The subordinates sent various glances to Haruto as he bowed his head in frustration. The 5th platoon will fall back. What? Is the captain planning to abandon those two? Hey, can't you stop him? You're the captain too. Right, that's true. A young soldier who was about to confront Haruto was reprimanded by an older soldier. Reprimanded, the young soldier fell silent with a guilty conscience. And just as the soldiers of the 5th platoon were about to follow Haruto's orders, Kobayashi, I leave command of the 5th platoon to you. What? While well, Haruto's additional instruction surprised his subordinates, deep down, they also felt, that's our captain, and secretly smiled. I'll bring the two back. You guys go ahead, captain. What is it? Once again, you already know. Question mark we're coming with you. Ten soldiers, excluding those who had the duty to escort the civilians to the rear, grinned defiantly and spoke with cheerful voices. Now, let's hurry and go get the two, captain. We won't make it if we don't hurry. By the way, we're fully armed with this much. Even hordes of monsters are nothing. Just to clarify, what I'm about to do is a violation of orders. After this, it'll be a court-martial offense, you know? We're aware of that. We're not that stupid. In a sense, they might be completely foolish. Understood. Only those who are free to come. But remember, whatever happens from now on, 
I won't take responsibility, understood, seriously. Our squad is a gathering of fools, initially taken aback. Haruto eventually understood his subordinate's unwavering determination. He granted permission to accompany them, seating himself in the passenger seat of the surplus 73 type large truck. TCH, still can't pinpoint their location seated in the passenger seat. Haruto felt frustrated that the whereabouts of Lieutenant Suzumiyo and Private First Class Vermeer still eluded him. By the way, the reason Lieutenant Suzumiyo and Private First Class Vermeer carry transmitters is due to the disappearance of then Sergeant Hunter Funazaka. Now a lieutenant, incident following his temporary status as a prisoner of war, it became mandatory for all personnel to carry transmitters. Furthermore, combat personnel with a high probability of going missing have micro-transmitters implanted in their necks. We've finished loading weapons and ammunition. Everyone's aboard. Haruto glanced at the GPS device as his subordinates, who volunteered to accompany him, loaded necessary equipment onto the truck bed. Finally, as they boarded the truck bed themselves, Haruto gave the roof of the driver's seat of the 73-type large truck two firm taps. Let's move. Roger that. With that signal, the 73-type large truck began to move. And so, at Haruto's discretion, the search for Lieutenants Yumiyo and Private First Class Vermeer commenced. As the sounds of gunfire grew louder, Haruto and his comrades felt their tension mounting. Captain, there are friendly forces ahead. What should we do? We don't have time to explain the situation. Besides, if we do, they'll definitely detain us. So, we push through. Because before they could rescue the two, before they could battle the demons, they had to break through the allied forces fighting desperately on the front lines. Understood. I'll go a bit rough. Despite soldiers ahead waving frantically and yelling for them to stop, Haruto's subordinate gripped the wheel and pressed the accelerator to its limit. The engine roared louder and the speed of the Type 73 heavy truck increased. ST stop. Stop. Whoa. W what's with them? Ignoring the warnings of their allies, the Type 73 heavy truck pressed on. All right, we've received orders to retreat. Let's fall back. Roger that. Huh? What's that sound? Wait. Watch out. The frontline soldiers, realizing that Haruto's Type 73 heavy truck was hurtling towards them at incredible speed hastily jumped to side with shocked expressions wh which unit are they from i don't know more importantly where are they going there are only demons ahead that's right wait forget that we need to report this to headquarters why yeah you're right the soldiers who allowed haruto's breakthrough quickly reported to headquarters bringing haruto's unauthorized actions to the attention of lieutenant colonel kotaka zzzzz zzt and Haruto, respond. Hey, Haruto, hurry up and respond. We know you can hear us. They called sooner than expected. Oh, despite the furious shouts coming from the radio in the vehicle, Haruto leapt onto the Type 73 heavy truck and unleashed a barrage of 5.56 by 45 NATO rounds from an 89 type rifle into the abdomen of a six legged creature resembling a demonic tiger. Then, after eliminating the imminent threat, he exchanged the empty magazine and, while continuing to fire 5.56 by 45 NATO rounds at the demon attempting to board the Type 73 heavy truck, cautiously picked up the noisy radio. This is Kairishima. You, you idiot. Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka's first words were a loud curse that could have ruptured Haruto's eardrums. Ugh, why didn't you follow orders? I just can't abandon my subordinates. No matter what, Haruto replied calmly indiscriminately scattering bullets out the passenger side window. I understand the sentiment of caring for your subordinates all too well, but do you truly grasp the current situation? How much trouble do you intend to cause the other units with your selfish actions? Besides, the defense forces are already beginning to withdraw. Dot. I won't say anything further, but return now. I can still cover for you if you come back immediately. I appreciate your concern. However, we are acting fully aware of the consequences. Please don't worry about us. This is the path we've chosen, and we'll handle it ourselves. If that's what you're saying, wah, well, my apologies, Colonel Kotaka. I'm ending this communication. Wait, Haruto. The conversation isn't over. Without waiting for Colonel Kotaka's response, 
Haruto cut off the communication as he caught sight of a large horde of monsters lying in wait along their path. Focus firepower ahead. Eliminate the enemy. Haruto leaned out of the passenger side window, holding his Type 89 rifle in both hands. He switched the selector lever from single shot to full auto and unleashed a barrage of bullets. Roger that. In response to Haruto's command, three of his subordinates in the cargo bed concentrated firepower towards the advancing direction. Intermittent bursts of fire from the Minami light machine gun and the M249 light machine gun rained down on the monsters blocking their path, while O6 type rifle grenades blasted them aside, clearing a path through the onslaught. Captain. The current positions of the two targets have been identified. They are 500 meters north from here. All right. Let's hurry. Roger that. As Haruto returned to the vehicle, the driver, who had been glancing at the GPS device beside him, delivered some good news. Meanwhile, amidst the swarm of monsters approaching them, Haruto and his team hurried to the whereabouts of Lieutenants Yumio and Private First Class Vermeer crushing and flinging aside the carcasses of the slain monsters as they went. The two of you are at the end of this alley. Got it. Four people follow me. The rest protect the cargo. Learn. The Type 73 large truck stopped right near the point indicated by the transmitter signal. Haruto gets off the train and heads towards the two with four of his subordinates. Dot. Haruto carefully moves through the narrow alley while listening to the gunshots of his subordinates left behind in the Type 73 large truck fighting the gathering monsters. Don't let your guard down, you never know where the enemy will come from. Understood, Boo? Mikawa? It was at this moment that Haruto, who was leading the way with a Type 89 rifle, warned his subordinates following him to be careful. There's a buzz behind Haruto! Exclamation mark I heard the disgusting sound of flesh being pierced twice, and immediately a scream went up. When Haruto turned around in shock, he saw Corporal Makawa, his belly pierced by poisonous purple tentacles and lifted into the air, along with his Type 3 bulletproof vest. I am in the house. I don't care if it's through the wall, just shoot. When Haruto and his friends saw the tentacles piercing Makawa's body extending beyond the wall of the house facing the alley, they immediately counterattacked. Even though they were bathed in the blood gushing from Makawa's abdomen, it started. Fuck. Shit, shit, shit. Wah. -wah. It was a random shot with no aim, but perhaps by chance, the tentacles writhed in pain, and at the end, they lost their strength, leaving Corporal Makawa lying helplessly on the ground. Dot uh. Corporal Makawa, whose exhausted tentacles were still stuck in his stomach, spat out a large amount of blood from his mouth and convulsed repeatedly, and the blood flowing from Makawa's abdomen quickly spread on the ground. What's Makawa's condition? While exchanging magazines, Haruto ran to Corporal Makawa and asked his subordinates who were checking on his condition. No, I'm dead. Let's hurry. We'll collect it later. Learn. After cutting off the tentacle that had penetrated his abdomen, I laid down Corporal Makawa's body and gently closed his wide open eyes with my hand, and Haruto and his friends hurried ahead without a word. After cutting off the tentacle that had penetrated his abdomen, I laid down Corporal Makawa's body and gently closed his wide open eyes with my hand, and Haruto and his friends hurried ahead without a word. What on earth is this? Haruto and his friends arrived directly above the signals coming from Ensense's Yumio and Private Vermeer's transmitters, and are dismayed by the unexpected situation. Nobody is here. When I looked around, I couldn't see the two of them, and the end of the alley was a T-junction, so there was no place for them to hide. Equipment? Malfunction? No, I didn't expect that. But, this is where the signal is coming from. Just search. Search. As Haruto watched his subordinates frantically searching around him, he was unable to move, overwhelmed by the fact that he had lost his subordinates due to his own arbitrary actions and had also failed in rescuing the two of them. Dot. I, I, what on earth are you here for? I'm here even if I let my subordinate die. Haruto was so disappointed that he could no longer stand and fell down, collapsing and crying. Blood slowly oozes from his fist as he slams it into the ground over and over again. Team Leader dot. After searching the surrounding area, Haruto's subordinate saw him and approached him to advise him to retreat. Captain, I'm afraid. 
Huh? Shut up, Captain. I understand how you feel, but I don't want to stay here any longer. No, that's not it. Haruto, who had been lying on his knees crying earlier, suddenly put his ear to the ground and heard some noise. Captain, what? Send STTW and slash PPS 26. Hurry! Exclamation mark. Captain, no way. No way. The two of you are underneath. And slash PPS 26 STTW is a wall penetrating radar used by the US military. It is a device that can identify the presence of a person by detecting the heartbeat of a person on the other side of the wall using Doppler radar. B. The N slash PPS 26 is capable of penetrating walls up to 20 centimeters thick and can capture targets within 8 meters of the wall. I found it. There are three of us. Using the N-PPS-26 that was thrown to him, Haruto confirmed the heartbeats of three people right below him, and was glad that his actions were not meaningless and that two people were still alive. However, such joy is short-lived. Captain. Voice Captains, we are surrounded by monsters. What? Just like Haruto, a subordinate who was using N-PPS-26 to inquire about the situation underground informed him that the situation was at its worst. It looks like the Vice Captains are cornered in a dead end. Multiple monsters are approaching. Where is the entrance? When I looked around earlier, I couldn't find anything like that. You're kidding? Question mark. Well, that's bad. Captain. Entrance. Where is the entrance? While his subordinates were pacing back and forth, searching for the entrance to the underground, Haruto was quietly preparing himself. Send us the C4. A. Hey, well, are you really planning to rush in from there, Captain? There is probably no other way. No matter how much it is, it's too dangerous. Okay, let's get it over quickly. The gunshots that I was hearing until just now have stopped. Huh? Yeah, I can't help it. One of his subordinates handed Haruto a C4 explosive in a desperate manner. Hurry, hurry! Exclamation mark. Haruto called out to his subordinates as he set the C4 explosives in a circular motion a little further away from Suzumiya's second lieutenant and quickly pierced the fuse to prepare for detonation. I asked for backup. Eh? You must be kidding. Team leader? Before his subordinates could stop him. Haruto pressed the detonator switch while surrounded by the C4 explosives he had set. Suzumiya. Shouting the name of his precious subordinate, Haruto rushes into the underground secret passageway, enveloped in smoke at the same time as the explosion. Beneath the fortress city of Ballad, there lay a network of dimly lit, narrow secret passages, akin to a maze. These secret passages were initially constructed parallel to the city's development, but now, with no one to oversee them and only a select few aware of their existence, they had become prime nesting grounds for spiders and rats. However, at this very moment, three women found themselves cornered in the labyrinthine dead ends of these secret passages, facing imminent peril. Out of ammo, no more bullets. The last 9x19 Parabem round, nestled in the chamber of the 9mm submachine gun, pierced the forehead of the approaching demon as it was discharged from the muzzle. With a small hole in its forehead, the creature, shaped like an animal, collapsed, and the spent cartridge clattered to the ground with a dry sound. Sub-Lieutenant Suzumi Iwakari, realizing she had run out of ammunition, frantically searched her body for spare magazines, only to recall, with a sense of frustration, that she had exhausted all of them in previous battles. Captain, I apologize. It seems I won't be able to make it back to you. It's... It's all over. I'm sorry. It's my fault. I'm sorry. While shielding Private Tina Vermeer, who was on the verge of tears out of fear of death, and the girl murmuring apologies under the weight of guilt, Sub-Lieutenant Suzumiya released her grip on the 9mm submachine gun and tightly pressed her injured right arm with her left hand, regretting her own misjudgment. It all began when she was instructed by Haruto to prepare for the unit's withdrawal, returning ahead of time to the rendezvous point of the 5th Squad. Suzumiya realized that Vermeer and the girl in the red armor hadn't arrived yet. Acting on impulse, she quickly grabbed a GPS device and pinpointed Vermeer's current location. Upon realizing that Vermeer was still relatively close, she made the hasty decision that she could still retrieve them. If only she had contacted Haruto and the entire unit to retrieve Vermeer, the situation would have been resolved. But in her reluctance to escalate matters and her desire to handle it herself, 
she sealed her own fate. Subsequently, chasing after the signal emitted by Vermeer's transmitter, they stumbled upon the underground secret passage through a collapsed path, and by chance, they encountered the two who were also wandering through the secret passage towards the church. However, just like Suzumiya, they were attacked by demons that had entered through the collapsed path and were cornered in a dead end. Their coming as a repulsive creature, drooling from its mouth, attempted to engulf the three over the corpses of its fallen kin, Suzumiya, with a determination to fight until the end, firmly gripped her combat knife with her unblemished left hand stained with her own blood. I, I'll fight too. Seeing Suzumiya wielding her combat knife, the girl in the red armor attempted to draw her sword from her waist, as if following Suzumiya's lead. Wait. Do you think you can swing that sword in such a narrow space but, but, if you're going to do it, aim for thrusts. Understood. Receiving advice from Suzumiya, the girl adjusted her posture, readying her sword for thrusts. Huh? When did I become the baggage here? They're here. At Vermeer's misplaced words, the demon lunged at Suzumiya in that instant. Suzumiya. Suddenly, the ceiling collapsed, crushing the demon that was leaping at Suzumiya. Amidst the roaring noise of the collapsing ceiling, a familiar voice echoed to the three. What? What's happening? W what's going on? Why is this happening? Blinded by the billowing dust, the three coughed incessantly, utterly perplexed by what was unfolding before them, but unbeknownst to the bewildered trio, beyond the dust cloud, the staccato gunfire of Type 89 rifles resounded, accompanied by the continuous wails of the demons. No. It can't be. This. This can't be real. Ah, where? No way. Hey, no. Lies, 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 lies. How could? How could this? Yawa. Haruto pointed his finger towards the direction where the church bell tower, engulfed in flames, appeared diminutive. The girl, catching sight of the church engulfed in raging flames, collapsed to the ground, wailing inconsolably and sobbing like a baby. Silently, Haruto scooped up the girl, who refused to cease her wailing and carried her in a princess hold, walking away. Then, on the way back, after retrieving the cold body of Lieutenant Makawa, who had become a casualty, Haruto hastily reunited with his subordinates waiting by the 73 type large truck. Damn, this is messed up. What the hell is going on? What's happened here? This is what on earth? Haruto, after joining his subordinates who had been guarding the 73 type large truck, began to retreat perplexed as the once plentiful demons had suddenly disappeared from view. However, passing by the vicinity of the headquarters, he witnessed the devastating destruction of the surrounding buildings and countless demon corpses strewn about. It seems like there was intense fighting to buy time for the troops to retreat, remarked Second Lieutenant Suzumiya, her right arm wrapped in bandages, as she observed the scene outside. Yeah, seems like it. What's this feeling? While nodding in agreement with Second Lieutenant Suzumiya's words, Haruto couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling as he gazed at the bullet-riddled and dismembered corpses of the demons. I have a bad feeling about this. I hope it's just a misunderstanding. Amidst the heavy scent of gunpowder, charred remains, and the pungent smell of blood assaulting his senses, Haruto departed from the fortress city of Ballard, his heart filled with an inexplicable sense of foreboding. Haruto, accompanied by sub-lieutenant Suzumiya and private first-class Vermeer, successfully escaped from the fortress city of Ballard, rescuing a girl in armor as dusk approached, and finally arrived at the base of the Parabem army, which was establishing the second line of defense there. Despite his exhaustion from the shock of losing acquaintances and seeing sub-lieutenant Suzumiya injured, Haruto handed over the girl, who had become lifeless and hollowed out, to the medics accompanied by Private First Class Vermeer. He then tried to rest the rest of his subordinates until the next battle began. However, a piece of news changed everything. Colonel Kotaka has become a prisoner of the enemy. What's going on? Gar. See choking. Can't breathe. Haruto grabbed Sergeant Kanbayashi, who brought the news and was involved in transporting the Snake People clan, struggling to convey the information. Captain, please calm down. Let go of him. Let go. Ugh, sorry. I lost it. Finally released by other squad members. Haruto regained his composure. My apologies. Please continue. Cough. N no problem. I'll continue. As ordered by the captain. When I handed over that paper to that person and handed over everyone from the Snake People clan, I overheard something. 
It seems Colonel Kotaka stayed behind in Ballard with mercenaries, those damn mercenaries, waiting for the return of some idiot who defied the retreat order. And as a result, he seems to have become a prisoner of the enemy. However, the information is confused, so it might not be accurate. Also, I don't know the details, but it's certain that some of Colonel Kotaka and those mercenaries have been taken to a castle under enemy control! Exclamation mark is it because of me? What's wrong? W wait, don't tell me, did you mess up, idiot? As soon as the report ended, seeing the squad members and Haruto pale, Sergeant Kanbayashi realized everything rests somewhere. Huh? Where's the captain going? I'm going to headquarters to inquire about Colonel Kotaka's rescue. So that's what that feeling was at that time. Feeling restless. Haruto rushed to headquarters after telling his subordinates to rest somewhere. He's gone. What do we do? What can we do? All we can do is rest somewhere as instructed. Left behind, the members of the squad stood around, looking lost. Hey! Listen everyone, I've been thinking, will Colonel Kotaka's rescue operation be carried out in this situation? The highest ranking member left in the squad, Junior Officer Kobayashi, voiced his doubts. Probably not possible. The behemoth is approaching, and there's no guarantee there won't be another monster attack. The units that marched into the Empire are currently focusing all their efforts on eliminating the behemoth. So there's no spare capacity. Then. What action would the captain take knowing the rescue operation won't happen? Ah, in response to junior officer Kobayashi's question, the soldiers of the 5th squad looked at each other, then nodded. That's right, let's get ready. Understood. The absent captain's squad, the 5th squad, began to move with a sense of urgency. With a troubled expression etched on his face, Haruto staggered towards the room where his subordinates had been assigned, his steps unsteady like those of a sleepwalker. If it's come to this, I have no choice but to infiltrate enemy territory alone. He knew the location. If he could acquire a means of transportation, he could launch a direct assault on the castle. But, if he took the overland route, it would take too much time. He had to somehow obtain aerial transportation. Even as he pondered, the danger to Colonel Kotaka grew with each passing moment. Damn it, I can't seem to focus. Rushing into the base's headquarters. Haruto questioned the command about the rescue operation for Colonel Kotaka. However, he was informed by the base's command that no rescue operation would be conducted, nor could it be, leaving him with no choice but to resolve to rescue Colonel Kotaka and the other soldiers who were now prisoners on his own. Anyway, he had to get a plane and rescue Colonel Kotaka and the others. As a decision, should he keep it to himself, it wouldn't be right to involve his subordinates without consent, but if he said something, They'd probably follow him. He couldn't drag them into this mess. Yet. Would this be another instance of disobeying orders and acting on his own? Ha ha ha. If he survived this, it would surely mean facing a firing squad. Anticipating his own fate, Haruto let out a weary chuckle. Well then, I suppose I should bid farewell with a smile, at least for the last time. Thinking that this might be his final farewell with his subordinates. Haruto psyches himself up in front of the room where they await. He slaps his cheeks with both hands as if to brace himself, putting on a nonchalant expression, and opens the door as if nothing was amiss. Clatter, clatter, clatter. Huh? What greeted Haruto as he entered the room were the barrels of a 9mm submachine gun and an 89 type rifle pointed at him. Don't move. Oh, it's just you, Captain. Please don't startle me like that. Honestly, lower your guns. It's the captain. Understood. Back to work then. I thought we were busted by the MPs. Phew. W what? What on earth are you all doing? The room Haruto entered had turned into a den of chaos. Hacking attempts were being made against the base's security system on the computers lined up against the wall. Various firearms and ammunition were stacked throughout the room, and a detailed map of the base lay on a large table in the center, marked with several X's. What's going on? Rebellion preparations? Haruto was left speechless by his subordinate's answer. Or rather, Captain, you're going, right? To help. What? They're on to us. Silence implies consent. Yeah, that's right. There's no use trying to stop us. After all, we've already lent a hand this far, so we're just as guilty. We'll keep quiet about the details. Whether the captain likes it or not, we're sticking with him to the bitter end. We're all in this together. Good grief. Truly. 
surrounded by incorrigible fools. Hearing his subordinate's words, Haruto's expression turned unreadable, and he spoke quietly, keeping his face hidden. We are deeply honored by your praise. Rubbing his eyes with his arm and raising his head, Haruto looked at his smiling subordinates and felt a sense of relief. Fine, do as you please. So, is the plan already set? Yes, of course. When asked by Haruto, Lieutenant Kobayashi nodded with a broad smile. The plan is simple. Firstly, we'll split the squad into three teams. The first squad, mainly consisting of new recruits, will serve as a diversion. They'll cause a commotion at the edge of the base. Then, the second squad will take advantage of the distraction caused by the first squad and take control of the control tower and anti-air systems. Finally, the third squad, including the captain, will be responsible for rescuing Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka. What about transportation? The C-130J of the 11th Technical Test Unit is scheduled to take off in one hour, so we'll use that. Understood. Let's go with that. Haruto nodded in agreement with the plan proposed by Lieutenant Kobayashi. Not so fast. What? With a loud bang, the door was forcefully opened, and members of the guard corps stormed into the room. Don't move. Drop your weapons. Shut up. You drop yours first. In the tense atmosphere, soldiers aimed their guns at each other and shouted angrily. Adolf. Of all people, it had to be you. To thwart Haruto's scheme, the ones who burst into the room were Adolf Idel Trout, a colonel who was Haruto's contemporary, and the guard corps led by him. Seemingly dissatisfied. Did I disappoint you? With the barrel of a Luca P08 pointed at Haruto, Colonel Idel Trout wore a cynical smile. Can Bayashi? Was it this one who handed over the documents to the guard corps? Yes. Was it not to your liking? Worst choice. My apologies. With a sigh, Sergeant Kanbayashi apologized to Haruto, who shook his head with a hand on his forehead. Hey, ignoring me takes some guts. Colonel Adil Trout, feeling ignored, had a vein bulging on his forehead. My bad. So, what's this about? Haruto deliberately asked to buy time knowing full well what was going on. HMPH, never mind. Both you and your squad are suspected of insubordination and treason. There's an arrest warrant out. Will you cooperate quietly? Sorry, but I can't let you know that. As much as we don't want to resort to force, don't lie. It's written all over your face that you're dying to use it. Ha ha. I see. My apologies. Seems like I'm the type whose emotions are written all over my face. Colonel Adil Trout's demeanor was smug, reveling in the sense of superiority that came from holding Haruto's fate in his hands. Despite their strained relationship, this isn't good. Impeccable, just as expected of the SS, Haruto was frantic, his nerves on edge, as Colonel Adil Trout smirked, completely unaware of the danger. With a G36K, a carbine variant of the G36 rifle designed for improved mobility and specialized missions, in the hands of the SS. There was no room for error. If things continued like this, Haruto would be captured by the SS, unable to go to the aid of Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka and the others. Is there any way to turn this situation around? Haruto racked his brain for a miracle solution, but nothing conveniently presented itself. Now then, I'm getting tired of your pointless stalling. Surrender quietly. Arg, this bastard, he's doing it on purpose. Just when Haruto felt like all hope was lost at Colonel Adil Trout's final warning, a savior arrived unexpectedly. Well, well, it seems I've arrived at quite the crucial moment. With a sharp click, a sword was pointed at Colonel Adil Trout's neck. Who? Who are you? Don't move, or you'll die. Sneaking up from behind, the girl from the fortress city of Ballard whom Haruto and the others had brought along, saved Haruto from his predicament by holding a sword to Colonel Adil Trout's neck. You, I've heard most of it from Tina. Times of the essence, right? I'll lend a hand. Now, hurry up and drop your weapons. Oh, you guys too. Damn it. Dot. Drop your weapons, everyone. Prompted by the girl, Colonel Adil Trout reluctantly disarmed himself. As Colonel Adil Trout discarded his Luger P-08 onto the floor, his SS subordinates followed suit. Then, with the SS disarmed, soldiers from the 5th platoon quickly bound Colonel Adil Trout and his men. Why are you here? As he watched the neutralized SS, Haruto questioned the girl. And nothing special. I just heard that my benefactor was in trouble, so I came to help. Blushing slightly, the girl glanced at Haruto as she spoke. I see. Well, 
Regardless, I appreciate the help. We'll take it from here. Huh. So you don't need directions? Directions? Haruto furrowed his brows at the girl's cryptic words and asked again. Your superior is imprisoned in the Corsicuf castle, and I am well acquainted with its internal structure. What? How do you know such a thing? Why? Well, because Corsicuf castle is the castle where I spent my childhood. Oh, I haven't properly introduced myself yet. My name is Lemonus Coltrane Gelirius. I am the first princess of the now defunct Coltrane kingdom. Please. Call me Lemonus. Lemonus revealed the shocking truth. Wow. Everyone present was speechless at Lemonus's words. Is that true? Well, there's no one left in this world who knows my origins. So there's no way to verify it. In response to Haruto's stunned words, Lemonus briefly displayed a deep sadness on her face but then answered in a nonchalant tone. But, more importantly, do you need a guide or not? Which is it? Ah. Uh, honestly. We do need a collaborator who knows the internal structure of the castle. But taking a civilian, a princess from a fallen kingdom, to a dangerous place, Captain, to rescue Colonel and the others, will need her help. Seeing through Haruto's hesitation, Lieutenant Kobayashi interjected. Yeah. You're right. We can't afford to hesitate. Lemonus, sorry to ask, but please lend us your hand. After much deliberation, Haruto accepted Lemonus's proposal. Yes. Of course, it's for the sake of my future husband, after all. Once again, everyone was left speechless. Husband? Haruto cautiously questioned Lemonus, who seemed to have just dropped a bombshell. Yes, didn't you propose to me? Propose? When? As the conversation took an unexpected turn, Haruto frowned, while the soldiers from the 5th squad and the royal guards started laughing, thoroughly enjoying the spectacle. Come on, I won't let you forget it. When we were fleeing from the ballad, you held me. Ark Captain. Doing such things in secret. Pervert. Despicable. Monster. Rot in hell. Die. Not just die, but rot in hell. The soldiers from the 5th squad, who had suddenly changed their attitude, began hurling insults at Haruto. W wait a minute. I didn't. I mean. Hold Lemonus. Did you mean carrying her like a princess? Yes. Exactly. Remember? That was a proposal ceremony passed down among the royal family of the Coltrane Kingdom. But I never expected to be proposed to in such a situation. As Lemonus's words reached everyone's ears, the soldiers from the 5th squad changed their attitude once again. I always believed in you, Captain. Captain wouldn't do such a thing, right? I thought so. I knew it. These guys. Haruto glared at his subordinates, who had made a blatant turnaround. Question mark. Meanwhile, Lemonus, who didn't understand the situation, tilted her head in confusion. By the way, before the rescue operation for Lieutenant Falcon and the others, Haruto struggled to dispel Lemonus's misunderstanding, but he ended up remaining engaged to her with unrequited love. Volume 04 Chapter 17 Under the cover of dusk, soldiers of the 5th squad under Haruto's command were stealthily moving through the base in full gear. Haruto and his squad weren't engaging in any rebellious acts yet, but they avoided drawing attention, as they didn't want to waste time bumping into acquaintances along the way. Still 15 minutes until the operation begins, as Haruto murmured while continuing to move from shadow to shadow, a deafening explosion echoed through the air, followed by blaring alarm sirens filling the base. What? Over there, hurry, an explosion? Is it an enemy attack? What's happening? Immediately after the explosion, military police and firefighters rushed to the site while soldiers in the base grabbed their weapons and sprinted out upon hearing gunfire. This is too much and it's way too early for the operation to start. What's the first squad doing? Concerned about the excessively timed explosion that seemed more like an overreaction. Haruto hurriedly contacted the first squad. First squad, respond. This is overkill. What are you doing? Th this is the first squad. We didn't cause the explosion earlier. It seems enemy operatives were mixed among the evacuees. And they did it. What? What's your situation then? We're currently engaged in combat with the enemy operatives. They're quite skilled and aren't going down easily. Damn, they're flanking from the right. Fire. Fama, get your head down. I it grazed me. From the voices leaking through the radio. It was evident that Haruto's subordinates were struggling in the fight. Damn it. Of all times, as Haruto pondered whether to abandon the prison rescue and assist the first squad, comprised mainly of new recruits, he was tapped on the shoulder by Lieutenant Kobayashi. 
Captain, the base's troops should be assisting the first squad. We should focus on our objective. Isn't she right? If we go now, it'll be too late like last time. So, let's move ahead. You're right. Receiving counsel from Lieutenant Kobayashi and Remenez, Haruto redirected their path towards the airfield, opposite to the explosion site. Hey, what is it? As Haruto's subordinates approached a soldier near the C-130J owned by the 11th Technical Testing Squad, engaged in loading tasks in the hangar adjacent to the airfield, they waved and casually approached. Do you know about the explosion earlier, huh? Oh, the enemy operative thing, right? That's MMPH. While one of Haruto's subordinates distracted a crew member at the rear hatch, Haruto and nine others stormed into the C-130J, restraining the technicians, soldiers, and crew inside one after another. Don't move, hands on your head. Hey, what's this supposed to be? A joke. A man in a lab coat, with a rifle aimed at him, uttered in bewilderment as he raised both hands. Shut it, Lieutenant. What about over there? As expected, we're ready any time. While Lieutenant Kobayashi, who was responsible for taking control of the cockpit, responded to Haruto's voice, aiming a 9mm submachine gun at the bewildered pilots. All right, let's go. Take off. Understood. Come on, let's get going. We're taking off. What the hell are you people doing? We'll explain later. For now, get the aircraft ready, or else. You know what happens next, right? Damn. Got it. Forced compliance under the barrel of Lieutenant Kobayashi's gun, the reluctant pilots reluctantly nodded. Thus, having seized control of the interior of the C-130J, Haruto's team embarked on an irreversible path. Don't say anything unnecessary. Got it. This is A9-2033. Control tower, requesting permission for takeoff. Inside the cockpit of the slowly moving C-130J. Now with all four Rolls-Royce Allison E2100 D3 engines roaring, tense conversations unfolded. Control tower to A9-2033. As I mentioned earlier, all takeoffs and landings are temporarily suspended due to the terrorist incident. Immediately stop where you are and stand by. So they say. After hearing the response from the control tower, the pilot turned to Lieutenant Kobayashi and then Haruto, seeking guidance. Just move towards the runway. But if we don't comply with the control tower's instructions, won't our presence be exposed? No problem. Brushing off the pilot's attempt to stall for time, Haruto ordered the aircraft to proceed to the runway. Control tower to A9-2033. Didn't you hear us? Stop what the? Stop. As the communication from the control tower became distorted, a familiar voice to Haruto and his team flowed through the radio. This is the second squad. We've taken over the control tower. Captain, get out now. Suzumiya, what are you doing there? Haruto was astonished to learn that second lieutenant Suzumiya, who was supposed to be hospitalized, had somehow joined the second squad. I don't like being left out. Wishing you good luck. Captain, understood. Seeing second lieutenant Suzumiya saluting from the control tower. Haruto returned the gesture with a wry smile. Takeoff clearance has been given. Let's go. Damn. With no further obstacles, the C-130J taxied to the runway and began its ascent. And so, without pursuit from the chaos-stricken base embroiled in terrorism and the rebellion of the 5th Squad, and with Lieutenant Suzumiya having changed the access codes to the communication equipment and locked them, delaying the transmission of information to neighboring bases, Haruto's team was able to focus on rescuing the prisoners without worrying about pursuers. The C-130J, snatched by Haruto and his team, flies through the night sky, its position lights extinguished, blending seamlessly into the darkness. Headings 135, maintain altitude of 4000. Understood. Now, it's about an hour to our target, Korsakoff Castle. Captain, please come over here. There's something I want to show you. As Haruto calculated the time until they reached the castle where Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka and the others were held captive, a voice from the cargo hold sounded frantic. R, got it. Kobayashi, I'm leaving this to you. And make sure to brief them on our situation. Understood. Haruto left the cockpit to Kobayashi, heading towards the source of the commotion. Captain, over here. While checking the cargo on this aircraft for anything useful. 
I found this inside one of the containers. Expedite the commanding officer and the technical supervisor of the technical test unit here. Roger. Haruto inspected the contents of the container in the C-130J's cargo hold and, after a moment of astonishment, gave instructions to his subordinates. Powered exoskeleton. No. Tactical assault light operator suit. Talos for tactical raids," muttered Haruto as he gazed at the powered suits lined up inside the container. Captain, I brought them here. As Haruto touched the Talo suit, his subordinates brought the commanding officer and the technical supervisor of the 11th technical test unit. We apologize for the earlier rough behavior. To be blunt, we'd like to borrow these. We've heard your circumstances earlier. Your determination to save your comrades is admirable, but... This constitutes a serious act of treason against the state, we cannot lend our support. As expected, it's a no-go. Upon hearing the response from the commanding officer, Haruto sighed, shoulders slumping. However, to his surprise, the man in the lab coat, bearing the title of technical supervisor, gave an unexpected reply. If you allow us to gather combat data, we can lend you three units. What? Dr. Blitz, what are you saying? Now now. Lieutenant, consider it. If we can gather combat data here, we should be able to significantly improve Talos's performance. Moreover, we'd be ahead of the other technical test units in doing so, but this constitutes a serious act of treason. We were held at gunpoint and couldn't resist. Isn't that right? And they aren't committing treason for personal gain, it's to save their comrades. There's still the possibility that their story is a lie. You can see it in their eyes. It's not a lie. Ha. Huh? I was unconscious, so I don't know anything. Yes, I didn't see anything or hear anything. That's fine. The decision is made. We'll lend you three units. We're grateful. Thank you for your cooperation. Oh, don't mention it. As long as we can gather combat data. Disregarding the indifferent attitude of the technical officer, the man in the lab coat waved cheerfully at Haruto, bowing slightly. Thus, in exchange for gathering combat data, Haruto secured the use of the Talos powered suits owned by the 11th Technical Test Unit. Directly above Gorsakov Castle, three masses descended, splitting into two groups. Captain, I've detected numerous objects approaching from below. Looks like they're here to welcome us. Leading the descent, one of the masses, equipped with the heavily armed and high powered Talos designed for assault and suppression, communicated caution to Haruto via radio. We've confirmed it here too. They're likely dragon knights or flying monsters. We'll intercept. Understood. I'll put on quite a show. Putting on a show is fine, but it don't forget the objective. Equipped with the high mobility Talos prioritizing close combat and maneuverability, Haruto cautioned the eager Corporal Higashi, we're good to go. Let's patty. Are we really okay? As Corporal Higashi's cry rang out, muzzle flashes flickered in the night sky. From the two M214 Gatling guns attached to the arms of the assault Talos, which had been downsized from the M134 miniguns to use 5.56x45 ammunition and were nicknamed microguns, a large number of bullets scattered, with every third round being a tracer, piercing through the dragon knights in the sky. And thus, the Dragon Knights were transformed into minced meat in midair, without question, and sent back to the ground. All obstacles cleared. Corporal Azuma, who had shot down all the Dragon Knights in an instant and gained air superiority, proudly reported to Haruto. Okay, we're going to land. Don't let your guard down. Learn! Exclamation mark. After eliminating the obstacles, Haruto and his friends finally entered Corsica Castle. I knew it but there are lots of enemies. There's a sense of violence. Haruto and his friends use the prototype flight booster to offset their falling speed and land in the courtyard of Corsica Castle. However, the three intruders who descended into the courtyard were surrounded by thousands of monsters and hundreds of Imperial soldiers. Then, Captain, please go and rescue the Lieutenant Colonels as planned. We'll do this ourselves, Corporal Azuma, a motivated man and Sergeant Nishiyama, who was equipped with an artillery support version of Talos, told Haruto this. Okay, let's go. Haruto is given radio directions from Reminis left in the C-130J to the dungeon where Commander Farutaka and his friends are likely to be held captive, and at the same time Haruto runs off. The Imperial Army also begins an attack. A fierce battle begins at Gorsakov Castle. Stay straight! Exclamation mark. Learn.
Remenez, who is watching the video from the camera attached to Taylor's inside the C-130J, gives instructions to Haruto. Haruto runs as per Remenez instructions, but numerous monsters approach him, trying to kill him. However, the monsters that were trying to tear Haruto to pieces were shot down one after another. This is your opponent! Exclamation mark. This is because compared to the M2 heavy machine gun, the firing rate is about half that of the M2, but the weight has been reduced to about half and the recoil of shooting has been reduced by about 60%. It is equipped with two M806 heavy machine guns. This was because Sergeant Nishiyama, who was in charge, was deploying a ferocious barrage. In addition, special 12.7 by 99 NATO bullets fired from two M806 heavy machine guns changed their trajectory while in flight, avoiding only Haruto and killing or wounding the target. This guy is fine! Exclamation mark it'll be interesting to hit! Exclamation mark. The reason why the 12.7 by 99 NATO bullet changed its trajectory while in flight is because Sergeant Nishiyama's Taylor's is equipped with the Exacto system a real-time guidance device that tracks the bullet and target location and informs the bullet. Enter abruptly. With the support of Corporal Azuma and Sergeant Nishiyama, who are using M214 and M806 to fight thousands of times more enemies, Haruto invades Corsica Castle. Turn right and go straight. There will be stairs on the left, go down them and go straight again! Exclamation mark. Reminas gives precise instructions to Haruto as he runs through the maze-like mess of Corsica Castle. Is the dungeon still a long way off? A little more, just turn left and you'll be right there. Learn. When Haruto was told that his destination was near, he turned the last corner with a sudden burst of excitement. Alright, we're here, Goha? Haruto? Question mark. Haruto was blown away by a huge arrow that came flying from around the corner and crashed into the wall. Hey, I did it. I killed it. Seeing Haruto stuck in the wall, Imperial soldiers appeared here and there from the passageway. Even a quick made item like this won't be useful. The soldiers, who were waiting in the narrow passageway by modifying the earth and rock into shapes using magic, created a makeshift ballista and approached Haruto with joy. You're wearing such strange armor. Let's see what kind of person he is. The Imperial soldier reaches for Taylor's full face helmet to see Haruto's face. It hurts, Konchai Kazu. However, Haruto, who was not dead, grabs the soldier's neck as he reaches for his helmet and snaps it. Why you're alive? It's a monster. It's so loud, you're a human. It's annoying. Haruto was able to avoid instant death due to Talos's liquid armor made from Kevlar and magnetic fluid, but the impact of the giant arrow's impact broke about four of his ribs. Damn it! Kill it! Kill this guy! <coughs> Soldiers rush towards Haruto with spears and swords ready to kill Haruto, who is not dead in the way. Haruto, who can't move as he wants due to a broken rib, picks up an M84 stun grenade, pulls out the safety pin and throws it away. Instantly, the narrow passageway was filled with a flash of light of more than one million candle and an explosive sound of 160 to 180 decibels. By the way, 120 decibels near an airplane jet engine. After the momentary flash and explosion disappeared, all the Imperial soldiers were lying on the floor, suffering from symptoms such as blindness, dizziness, hearing loss, ringing in the ears, and the accompanying panic and disorientation. Yakura.se. Overcoming the half dead soldiers, Haruto smashes through the door to his destination, the dungeon. Having secured the entrance, Haruto slowly entered the room lined with dungeons. Ark. As soon as Haruto entered the room, he saw the gruesome corpses of Parabem soldiers scattered in the dungeons on both sides, but it wasn't too late. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Lieutenant Colonel Ferutaka, you're a little late. You're barely safe, Lieutenant Colonel Ferutaka, who was stripped naked and had his hands chained in the deepest part of the dungeon, said this in dissatisfaction, even though he looked immoral. Why you? How did you get here? The fat man next to Lieutenant Colonel Ferutaka, who was unable to move, was spitting and barking. I was planning to come earlier, but there was a problem. Haruto approaches Commander Farutaka while ignoring the man's questions. Hush, don't come. That's right, 3M. 
do it. A man with a fat body wearing nothing gave orders to a monster full of tentacles behind him. Team, shut up and fuck. However, the straight sword thrown by Haruto pierces the man and the monster together. Gubjaya. The man who was pierced by a straight sword along with a monster had the misfortune of being covered in the demon's solution as the sword pierced the bag that had stored the monster's solution and was melted into a mush, suffering the torments of hell. Died inside. Ha. Huh. Is Commander Farutaku okay? I. Everyone else died from torture. Is that so? There are a lot of things I want to say, but I'll do it after I get back to the base. Yes. Haruto broke the chain that was holding Commander Farutaka and rescued him. Then he picked up Commander Farutaka and headed back the way he came. Mission accomplished. Let's run away. Captain, we're in a bit of a pickle here. Enemy reinforcements at the point of ammo depletion. Upon returning to the ground with Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka in tow, Haruto was informed of the fierce struggle by Corporal Azuma who had built a mountain of demon carcasses, and Sergeant Nishiyama used the flight boosters to escape. They've been destroyed by demons, so we had to purge them. The same goes for the right side. What in the world? Haruto, realizing that his flight boosters had been destroyed by a ballista arrow he had taken, widened his eyes as he considered entrusting Lieutenant Colonel Kotaka to his subordinates and becoming a decoy himself. How are we supposed to escape from here? With means of escape lost and Haruto turning pale inside his helmet, a sharp, jet engine like wine approached Corsicuf Castle, followed by cannon shells landing around Haruto and his comrades, who were backed against the wall. The demons and enemy soldiers surrounding Haruto and the others were blown apart. W what's going on? Reinforcements? No way. Is it? Before the dumbfounded eyes of Haruto and his companions appeared the YF-24 piloted by a doppelganger of Chioda. It's you again. And thus, Haruto found himself once again saved by Chioda. Volume 04 Chapter 17A Extra Chapter, Catherine's Diary March 1st I was summoned by my master and obtained the position of vice captain. I am overwhelmed with gratitude. However, I regret letting my nerves get the best of me and speaking rudely. I worry if I have become disliked. I must be careful not to make such mistakes in the future. In the event that I make a mistake and cannot be by my master's side. If my master dislikes me, I would not be able to live. Moreover, I will not let anyone else take this position to serve my master. The spot next to my master belongs to me. I will not yield it to anyone those who attempt to take it. March 2nd, several hours after being summoned. It was dangerous. My master was almost captured by demons. I should never have left my master's side. I must never leave even for a moment from now on. My master seems exhilarated after completing the first battle. This is an opportunity. I am lucky to receive favor so quickly. I must do everything in my power to calm my master's excitement. However, since this is the first time I have done such a thing, I will involve some others. March 4th. It was intense. At first, we, with our numbers, had the advantage, but when my master, freed from restraint, went on the offensive, we were each thoroughly tormented and made to faint one by one. I am ashamed of my own incompetence. I must respond to my master's favor next time. However, whether it's because both my heart and body belong to my master, my condition is remarkably good. Could it be because I have replenished myself with plenty of my master's essence? I can't wait for the next time. March 5th, we have designated an island as our main base and begun fortifying it. But today, something unbelievable happened. As my master summoned additional soldiers, he also attempted to remove me from the position of vice captain. I am grateful for his concern for my well-being, but I absolutely cannot agree to be relieved of my duties as vice captain just because of that. Avoiding this required sincere persuasion. But I suppose I'll have to have a thorough conversation with him tonight. March 8th, the fortification of our main base is progressing smoothly. However, the shortage of soldiers is a concern. I wonder if there's anything we can do about it. My master also seems troubled by the lack of soldiers. I must heal him with my body. March 9th. I fainted again. Next time, for sure. March 17th. The production line for weapons has started operating. Now, we won't have to worry about a shortage of weapons even in emergencies. It seems my master is tired from overusing his summoning ability. I must do something about it. For now. 
I have mixed some energy supplements into his meals. March 19th just when I thought I had endured to the end. He told me, I'm going to make it a little harder, and ended up making me pass out. Disappointing. Month 29th. I was finally able to endure my master's affection to the end. I think I'm growing too, but why does it feel like my power increases every time I receive my master's favor? When I asked my master to check my level, he was surprised to find that my level was twice that of the other soldiers. I don't understand. Month first. It was finally time to get involved in this world in earnest. Since I don't know what awaits me from now on, I renew my determination to serve my master selflessly. Immediately after departing, he rescued those who were being attacked by monsters. He said he was from some kingdom, but it smells weird. I don't mind lending a hand, but if by any chance he starts to ogle my master, I'll ask him to disappear. Month second. It's the worst. My hunch was correct. I got into trouble. And worst of all, insects started to gather around my master. I have to do something about that little girl. However, being loved in a tent surrounded by nature was a different feeling than usual, and it was nice. I was unaware that several female knights had noticed me. Month third. Arriving at the first city in another world. All the soldiers, including me, were so excited that they didn't notice that the master had secretly run away. I looked for it in a hurry and was able to find it right away so that's a good thing. When I learned that there was no news of my husband, I thought my heart would stop. However, what was your husband doing during the three to four hours that he was missing? Although he said he was going sightseeing, I could smell the scent of a woman I didn't know from his body. I'll try to find out more about it tonight. Month fourth. When I tried to ask him about what happened yesterday, he forced himself on me and I couldn't ask him. But, it's okay to be forced. Month fifth. Traveling to the capital of the Canary Kingdom, insects that gather around masters, that little girl's attitude is flagrant. It seems that the kind master listens to the little girl's situation and tries to treat her kindly. But I wonder if he notices the color of lust is seeping in the little girl's eyes, that you are conscious of your husband as a man. I have to do something to get that little girl away. Month 6. Just as we were about to resume our journey after our lunch break, a young girl suddenly tried to get into the jeep. Moreover, it was next to my husband, which was my reserved seat. Can't believe it. I immediately called the maid and get her thrown into the carriage. Month 7th. When I finished preparing lunch, I went to get the master's meal and when I returned, the little girl was about to sit on the master's lap. How envious. That's outrageous. I immediately called the maid and get her retrieve the little girl. Month 8th. Here, the little girl is always by her master's side. Because of that, we can't be alone together. Shall we make it look like the work of a monster? Month 9th. I've reached the limit of my patience. As expected, the little girl came into my tent with her husband in the middle of the night. I immediately kicked him out, but he was no longer in the mood to receive favor. This grudge, I'll definitely clear it up. Month 10th. Arrived at the capital of the Canary Kingdom. It seems like your master is interested in women from other races. I'll arrange it later. I cause another commotion at the Adventurer's Guild, and my master warns me. However, it's the trash who tried to touch this body that is meant for master's use, and it's not my fault. I took my husband to a mansion I had acquired under a fictitious name. He presented the slave women he had arranged at that time. The owner also seems happy. It bothered me that it was a bit of a strained laugh, but it's okay. In order to please my master, I will continue to offer my woman to him. If I do that, my stock will go up and my husband will be happy too. I'm doing all I can to do good things. The diary ends here. Extra edition, Iris's diary 15th of times month suddenly, a messenger from Prime Minister Ibn came to me. It seems they want me to go meet an important guest for the Canary Kingdom. But why entrust the task of welcoming an important guest to someone as cursed as I am? Nevertheless. Since I have no right to refuse, I simply nodded obediently. Twentieth of times month departed from the capital. No one came to see me off, though expected. It's still saddening. However, having Phyllis and Beretta from the newly formed Second Royal Guards worrying about me makes being alone in the dim underground chamber better than before. Thirtieth of times month we've come close to the forest of no return. Is it really safe for such an important guest to be in such a dangerous place? Even when I asked Phyllis and Barrett about the guest, 
They evaded the question. I'm anxious. First of month today is such a wonderful day. I'll never forget this joy because I've had a faithful encounter. My destined partner is Mr. Kent Nagato. Though I currently call him brother, soon that name will change. No, I intend to change it. I digress, but never before has someone treated me, cursed as I am, without disgust or pity. Moreover, moreover, he let me sit on his lap, despite my cursed nature, the warmth of human touch for the first time. Ah, I can't believe such sweetness exists in this world. Once I've tasted it, I won't be able to let go of Mr. Nagato, not that I have any intention of doing so. Even as I write this diary, I crave Mr. Nagato greedily. Speaking of which, there's something that bothers me. Who was that woman clinging to Mr. Nagato? She said she was his aide, but she doesn't seem like just an ordinary aide. Still, even if Mr. Nagato and that woman were in a romantic relationship, it wouldn't be a problem. After all, as long as I become Mr. Nagato's number one, that's all that matters, right? Even if I have to resort to any means. Second of month in the morning, unable to wait. I went to see Mr. Nagato, but his attitude was completely different from last night. He was citing issues of status, but he quickly rectified them. He changes quickly once persuaded. I haven't done anything forcefully, it's true. I haven't applied any pressure, you know? Arrival at the fortress city of Narcisto. I wanted to go on a date with my brother, but I ended up staying behind in the carriage to avoid being found out. Side A3 on our way to the capital city. I wish we didn't have to arrive at the capital at all. And seriously, that female lieutenant is getting way too clingy with my brother. Sure, my brother is kind and treats everyone properly, but I still think it's better to keep her at a distance. Day 4 before going to bed. My brother told me a story. I felt like I would have sweet dreams, but that lieutenant had to come and ruin it by calling my brother away. And lately, I've been hearing strange noises at night. Maybe it's just my imagination. Phyllis and Beretta seem sleep deprived too. Day 5 during the break for lunch, just as we were about to resume our journey, I tried to steal the seat next to my brother from that woman, but failed. She's always sticking to him like glue, so you'd think she could let him have the seat for once. If she did, I wouldn't hold back from taking it. Day 6 I tried to replenish my brother's presence while the nuisance was away, but she came back and disrupted me. She's always clinging to him. It's not fair, crafty. Day 8 Lately, I haven't been able to replenish my brother's presence properly. It's all because of that nuisance. I wish she'd get eaten by an orc or something. Day 9 I've had enough. I'm going to replenish my brother's presence but I was interrupted by that nuisance again. Since we'll be reaching the capital tomorrow, couldn't she just let me cuddle up to my brother today? I'll make sure to repay this debt someday. Day 10 Why? Where is he? Hey, brother. Where are you? Hey. Hey. The diary ends here. Extra chapter. Karen's diary. Third of the month. What on earth just happened? While I inspecting the city incognito, I collided with a stranger and ended up having my lips stolen. It was an impudent act, and I was ready to sever his head right then and there. However, he sincerely apologized, and I also acknowledged my own fault for not paying attention to my surroundings. Still, letting the man who stole my lips go unpunished didn't sit well with me, so I made him work as my servant for a good three to four hours. Strangely enough, I almost found it enjoyable, which is frustrating in itself. Thinking of meeting him again, no, it's nothing. 10th of the month, today turned out to be the worst day of my life, the forces of the Ilsa's magic empire attacked without any warning, their number, 600,000, there's no way we can win, I immediately dispatched a messenger to the capital requesting reinforcements, but I don't know if we can hold out until they arrive, will reinforcements even come, well, even if they do, it seems unlikely that we'll have a chance at victory, oh well, we'll do what we can. Perhaps I've become pessimistic. Just the other day, the face of the man who stole my lips kept flashing in my mind. It annoys me that I'm not bothered by it. I guess I'm more of a romantic than I thought. 11th of the month. The beginning of this awful day was the report that my citadel city was surrounded by the 600,000 strong enemy forces. Before the battle began, a messenger from the Empire arrived offering surrender. Surrender and they won't harm us? Then stop looking at me with those lustful eyes. I send the messenger back with just his head. Twelfth of the month. Intense fighting continues. I can't let my guard down. Thirteenth of the month. The morale of our soldiers is dwindling. 
It's only natural, considering it's 60,000 against 20,000, a desperate disparity in forces. Just holding out now feels like a miracle. Well, to be honest, it's probably because they're not giving it their all. 14th of the month. As soon as the Empire got serious, the outlying gates that we had managed to hold fell. Today might be our last. But then something unbelievable happened. The man who stole my lips arrived with a small band to aid me. Can you believe it? He came to me, risking his life. The surprise on my face when I saw him for the first time. Then, later, during a modest celebration of our victory, just Kent, the man who stole my lips, and I had a chance to talk, while my annoying aide was absent, and there, Kent surprised me again. Because, as a repayment for stealing my lips, he said he came to help me. He came all this way because he didn't want me to die. At that moment, I completely fell for him. But, but, you know, that idiot wasn't trying to woo me. It made me so angry, I punched him as hard as I could. Humphrey, serves him right. 15th of the month. The citadel city that we've defended for so long had its walls and gates blown away by the Empire. It's over. But just as we were despairing, Kent and his group managed to repel the Imperial Army again. Though, Kent seemed a bit down because he lost a few of his men in battle. He's too kind. That Kent. I guess I have to support him both personally and professionally. 16th of the month. We received a report that reinforcements from the Kingdom are on their way, but our joy was short-lived. The enemy's aerial fleet and air fortresses appeared before us. It's clear we can't hold out any longer. That's why I decided to sacrifice myself to save the people. But even here, Kent surprised me again. The moment Kent muttered something toward a box-like object, the enemy was engulfed in flames. Furthermore, a force never seen before attacked the Empire. I tried to press Kent for an explanation of what he did, but he deftly avoided it. Oh well, but I won't let him slip away next time. I'll make him explain everything properly. Most likely, judging by Kent's actions and words, he's either leading or commanding that mysterious force. I was worried about how to bridge the gap in our status but it seems like it'll be taken care of. I can't wait for us to be together. The diary ends here. Volume 04 Chapter 18 Descending from the F-23 housed in Hangar 0, Kent cautiously stepped down using the ladder, his forehead lined with veins as Catherine greeted him with a smile so terrifyingly wide. It could rival a nightmare. First and foremost, I'm relieved to see you return safely, Master. Removing his helmet to reveal his face, Kent was quick to respond as Catherine took the lead. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. He replied with a strained smile, feeling the aura of anger emanating from Catherine despite her words of relief. She's still mad, huh? As Catherine approached with a smile so captivating yet devoid of any trace of mirth, Kent felt a sense of dread akin to a convict facing the guillotine. He kept his gaze fixed on the ground, waiting for the inevitable. However, Contrary to his expectations of reprimand, Catherine approached from behind Kent, enveloping him with her entire being. I'm truly relieved that you're safe. Embracing Kent with her entire body as he stood stiffly, Catherine's words were laced with genuine concern. T thanks. Caught off guard by Catherine's unexpected behavior, Kent awkwardly returned the embrace, his arms trembling slightly as he held onto Catherine's quivering form. Please, huh? I'm begging you, please. Refrain from such actions in the future. If something were to happen to you, Master. Gently releasing the embrace, Catherine looked up at Kent with teary eyes, pleading earnestly. Ah, I see. My apologies. If you understand, then it's okay. Perhaps I worried too much. I should exercise more restraint from now on. Kent couldn't help but deeply regret his actions, stirred by Catherine's heartfelt concern. He gently stroked her head once again as she embraced him. Indeed. Stimulating master's conscience seems more effective in such situations than resorting to direct methods. Well, I would have used this approach if she hadn't understood. Unaware that Catherine, who was being caressed, was harboring a slight regret for not utilizing what was in her pocket, a leash attached to a collar. With only one handcuff, Kent continued to console her. Now then, shall we, master? Shall we head to my room? Amidst the onlookers, Catherine chose her timing carefully as she uttered those words while Kent was still caressing her head. Hey, Catherine, are you still mad by any chance? Noticing the lingering flames of anger in Catherine's eyes despite her enchanting smile, 
and sensing something off about her words, Kent couldn't help but break into a sweat. Yes, isn't this supposed to be settled already? The previous matter is separate, Master. You will still receive your punishment. As a reminder, grasping Kent's right arm as he attempted to escape, Catherine restrained him with her arms and ample bosom. Delighting in her playful actions, as she led him towards her room with light footsteps. And thus, despite his futile resistance, resigning himself to the inevitable, Kent was dragged along mercilessly. His entire body limp. P please wait. Vice President. Although it seemed that no one would interrupt the pair's path, Ibuki stepped in, still needing to address the lingering issue. What is it, Ibuki? R. Don't worry. I'll include you in the punishment later. T. Thank you. No, that's not it. The issue has yet to be resolved. Therefore, all punishments will be postponed until all matters are settled. Almost swayed by Catherine's bribery, Ibuki regained her composure and confronted Catherine once more. TCH, fine. Although it merely postponed the issue, Kent let out a small sigh of relief. Catherine, still holding on to Kent's right arm, clicked her tongue in dissatisfaction and redirected her course from her room to the command headquarters. Now then, what should we do about the remaining behemoth? As darkness enveloped the surroundings with the setting sun, Kent convened a strategy meeting in the conference room, summoning the generals remaining on the Parabem mainland and heads of various departments to discuss a plan to annihilate the behemoth. But man, this is such a pain. The source of Kent's distress stemmed from two emergency reports that had just arrived at the start of the strategy meeting. One report indicated that a massive amount of volcanic smoke had begun spewing from the volcano on the behemoth's back, showering the surrounding area with a tremendous amount of volcanic ash, a far cry from its initial appearance upon emergence. The other report warned of excessive shock, specifically, the potential for a catastrophic eruption should nuclear or Cyrano's, God's rod, weapons be used on the volcano. And what these two reports implied was that the use of Aeropower and Parabem's trump cards, Cyrano's and nuclear weapons, was off the table. Well, this is just the worst case scenario. Although it would be easy to defeat the behemoth using Cyrano's or nuclear weapons, the aftermath would be catastrophic. Thank goodness. We didn't use Cyrano's right after the behemoth appeared. Reflecting on this fact, Kent breathed a sigh of relief. What will you do, Master? What to do? Initially, I plan to rely on concentrated air power to defeat it, then Cyrano's if that failed, and if that didn't work either. Well, I was planning to use nuclear weapons. But since we only have 10 rounds of MA bullets in production, and honestly, we're at a loss. The sight of Kent raising his hand in surrender prompted laughter in the conference room. Well, jokes aside, given the current situation, our options are limited. So, we just have to do our best with what we have. Yes, you're right. Well, it's still quite a risky gamble, Kent remarked. That can't be helped. There are simply too many uncertainties, Chioda replied. Well, we'll do what we can. Chioda, bring out the map and explanation. Kent instructed. Yes, Master, Chiodo acknowledged, projecting the operational map onto the conference room's LCD screen and commencing the briefing on the operations outline. This is deemed the most successful among several operational plans devised by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In broad strokes, it entails luring the behemoth into the Neral River, a one-kilometer-wide river behind the abandoned fortress city of Ballard. Once the behemoth enters the Neral River and its movements slow down, ground forces will concentrate all firepower and strike at once. It's a straightforward plan. Additionally, units participating in the behemoth's extermination include the Marine Corps 5th Division and the Army 4th Division. Originally tasked with offensive operations in this area, along with the Russian-equipped Army 12th Division from the neighboring area providing support. Furthermore, frontline command headquarters, railguns, and nearby deployed assault armors are all slated for deployment, Chiodo explained. In other words, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and sheer quantity against sheer quantity, Kent summarized. Following Chioda's explanation, Kent added, the operation will commence in 24 hours. Let's all do our best. Understood, echoed throughout the room. After discussions on the operation's details, Kent distributed the operational plans, announced the adjournment, 
and the generals who had filled the conference room returned to their respective departments. Now then, master, huh? Following the general's departure, Catherine, who had left the conference room with Kent, tapped him on the shoulder as they briskly walked in silence. Startled, Kent jumped slightly, looking pitiful. Um, what is it, Catherine? We have 24 hours until the operation starts. So, don't you think we have at least 4 to 5 hours of free time? Well, there are still various things that need to be done, right? Isn't that so, Ibuki? Looking to Ibuki behind him as if seeking help, Kent found Ibuki awkwardly avoiding his gaze. Why are you avoiding eye contact, Ibuki? You're the only one I can rely on. Wait could it be? Were you bribed with punishment participation rights? Ibuki's remark confirming Kent's suspicions only added to his dismay. I've been neglecting you lately. Oh my. Shall we go, master? I apologize, Kent Sama. With Catherine firmly grasping his right arm and Ibuki reluctantly holding his left with a strong determination, Kent was dragged away. It's not over yet. There must be a way out. Though being dragged along by Catherine and Ibuki, Kent was not ready to give up knowing that enduring the punishment would significantly affect his mobility for some time. Oh, Kent Sama, TCH, unnecessary addition, Kent grumbled as another person joined them. I've been eagerly awaiting the end of the meeting, master. So, um, I know it may be forward of me, but I came to request a reward befitting our achievements, Sarisha said, suddenly appearing and kneeling in the middle of the hallway, bowing her head. Perplexed, Kent stared at Sarisha who had appeared out of nowhere and was now rolling on the ground like a caterpillar, whimpering, is that, all right, well, there's no problem with the reward, but, before that, I have some questions, firstly, why is Adele gagged, bound, and rolling around like a caterpillar, mew you oo you tilde, mew you oo you tilde, ahead of Kent's gaze, Adele, bound in ropes and making muffled noises, was rolling beside the corridor, ha, huh. during the recent battle, Adele defeated a considerable number of monsters, so I thought I'd bring her along. Otherwise, she wouldn't come out in front of you, master, being shy and all, Sarisha explained. Isn't she more angry than shy? Master Kent, that's just her way of hiding her embarrassment. Muk no, he's just upset. Watching Adele furrow her brows and continue growling, Kent shot a glance at Sarisha, silently urging her to release her in a roundabout way. It's all right. Kent Sama, please don't worry. Right now, she's just not herself because the switch isn't flipped. The switch? Yes. Normally, she adopts a disrespectful attitude like before, but when the switch flips, Adele becomes the most obedient woman, devoted to Kent Sama above all. I've trained her that way. Ah. Uh, educated her, I should say. I see. Unable to respond to Sarisha's words that seemed to be praising him, Kent replied with a dry laugh. Now, Kent Sama, about the reward. I would be delighted if you could show affection to both me and Sarisha together, master, let's move on. Interrupting the conversation between Sarisha and Kent, Catherine interjected, please wait, I haven't finished my, save it for later, the master is busy. Understood, I'll yield the floor for now. With an air of triumph, Catherine brushed off Sarisha's protest with a single glare, smiling victoriously as she attempted to leave the scene. Anasan, Ga, Master, like a bullet. The tiny Yandir princess, Iris, leapt into Kent's chest. Uck. Are you okay, Anasan? Uck. Not really. Okay. Unable to deflect the impact of Iris's charge due to being held by both Catherine and Ibuki, Kent grimaced in pain. Iris, what are you doing to the Master? Ha, huh? were you here? Well, it doesn't matter, Anasan. Let's leave this person behind. I'll take care of you in my room. HMPH, you have the nerve to mock me, despite receiving favor from the master. I can't believe it. He he. You lack the confidence to keep Hanasan to yourself, so you're trying to monopolize him. I don't want to hear that from someone like you, who had no value except as a pawn for the Canary Kingdom's annexation. You wouldn't even receive the master's favor without my help. Maybe you should try being more submissive? TCH, nonsense. Sooner or later, I'll become Anisan's possession. And Anisan prefers my fresh, ripe fruit over your rotten one, which is already withered. What? What? The silence between Iris and Catherine was filled with tension, sparks flying in the air. The silence between Iris and Catherine was broken only by the sparks flying in the air as their gazes met. What?
is going on here? Iris inquired. Seems like a battle of women vying for Kent, Catherine replied. Having taken refuge in the underground shelter of the command headquarters during the onslaught of Jizz and the Demons, Fine and Line, who were ahead of Iris, reunited with Kent and the others as they emerged outside. It seems quite chaotic, should we postpone this? Kent suggested. Oh, come on, big sister. You're being too passive. If you're too passive, you might lose Kent's favor. Is that okay with you? Iris protested. What? Well, that would be troublesome, Iris replied hesitantly. Then let's go. Iris exclaimed. W what? Fine and Lion were taken aback. With Iris leading the charge and Fine and Lion joining the fray, chaos ensued in a corridor of the command headquarters. Hey, how many times do we have to tell you? We were here first. You guys should step aside. One voice demanded. The vice president is right. Clear the way for us. Another voice insisted. No way. I want to be loved by Anasan first. Yet another voice argued. Just wait a moment. We've been patiently waiting for Kensama's affection as well. It's fine if you're being selfish, but please let us go next. Right, Adele? You think the same, don't you? One voice reasoned. Uck, uck. Don't involve me. Comma Adele grumbled. Uck. It's unfair to have a cue. Besides, if we go in order, Big Sis and I will be last. And we haven't had much time with him lately, right? So, I think it's okay for us to take our turn. Another voice pleaded. Why yeah, that's right. Another voice chimed in. This is Kent sighed to himself, watching the competition for his affection unfold. It was both amusing and exasperating. Or rather, he was glad he had sent Karen and Amira as governors to the former Canary Kingdom and the former Demon Union territory. If they were here, the chaos would have been even more intense. Amidst the four factions vying for his attention, Kent couldn't help but feel a mix of happiness and concern as he silently sighed. Master, may I have a moment of your time? Chioda, who had been the only one not participating in the fray in the chaotic corridor, whispered to Kent. What is it, Chioda? Kent asked. My duplicate, backup bioterminal, has successfully protected those soldiers, as per your earlier instructions, Chioda reported. I see. That's a relief, Kent nodded. However, there's a slight complication. Chioda hesitated. A complication? What happened? Kent inquired. What happened, Master? Catherine added. Huh? Kent was taken aback as he turned around, only to find Catherine, who had been in the midst of the struggle just moments ago. Moreover, Upon closer inspection, he realized that the chaos had subsided, and everyone's anxious gaze was fixed on him. Ch, Catherine? When did you? Kent trailed off. Well, Chioda seemed suspicious, so I took advantage of the situation, Catherine explained. I see, Kent nodded, trying to piece together the situation. Sister, please don't worry. I'll be with you, Catherine reassured Iris. Ah, I see. My apologies, Chioda for doubting. So, what's the troublesome issue, Master? Iris asked. Well, it's... Kent hesitated. It's what? Iris pressed, sensing Kent's hesitation and feeling the pressure from Catherine. And so, five minutes later, Kent finally revealed the full extent of the situation. The disgrace of the royal guards. Catherine exclaimed angrily after hearing the explanation from Kent and Chioda. Not only have they betrayed your trust, but they've also acted recklessly turning our forces into private militias, and they even attacked our own base and stole transport aircraft. Chioda, execute those fools immediately, along with anyone who aided them. Catherine's anger was palpable. Kent, feeling flustered by Catherine's fury, intervened. W wait, Catherine. Please calm down. How can I calm down, master? If word gets out that members of the Royal Guards caused such a crisis, it will tarnish the reputation of the Royal Guards. No. Forget about reputation. What's more important is that members of the Royal Guards, who are supposed to protect you, have caused such a problem. I understand, I understand. So, let's wait for things to settle down and then summon Haruto and the others for a military tribunal to determine their punishment. Is that acceptable? Kent proposed, if that's what you say, Master. But even if we hold a military tribunal, it will only change immediate execution to later hanging. Won't it? Catherine begrudgingly agreed. Nevertheless, we must do it. We need to establish the facts first, Kent insisted. Understood, Catherine reluctantly agreed with Kent's final decision. Volume 04 Chapter 19
a night had passed since the sudden appearance of three gigantic monsters, provisionally dubbed Behemoth, Leviathan, and Jizz, by Kent, in the time that should have been bathed in the warm morning sun of spring. The surroundings were dimly lit and visibility was poor, resembling dusk due to the continuous eruption of volcanic ash from the volcano carried by Behemoth. Despite such unfavorable conditions, the Purabem army was in the midst of constructing formidable defensive positions on both banks of the Neral River, the site of the second defense line, to annihilate Behemoth and its accompanying monsters. However, it was certain that the size of the assembled forces was at best equivalent to one division plus a bit extra, far fewer than the initially planned three divisions. The reason for this was the paralysis of the surrounding railway network laid by Parabem due to the extensive accumulation of volcanic ash, causing delays in the gathering of reinforcements from neighboring areas, such as the Army's 12th Division, which was scheduled to arrive by railway transport. Furthermore, the paralysis of the railway network in the area naturally led to delays in the arrival of trains equipped with large caliber cannons essential for sweeping away the large number of monsters in one blow. As a result of the delayed assembly of forces, the construction of defensive positions was also delayed by about 30% from the original schedule. In other words, from the outset, the Parabem army was stumbling before the start of the operation. This is not good. If we continue like this, the forces won't be able to gather in time for Behemoth to reach the Neral River, muttered Kent with a slightly worn out expression as he listened to the unfavorable report at the Parabem mainland headquarters. We're doing everything we can at the moment, but there's just nothing we can do about this, said Catherine, contrasting Kent with her glossy complexion and satisfied demeanor, as she lowered her eyes and shook her head. Um, with air and land routes both restricted, we're running out of options. It's a dead end, sighed Kent heavily. Master, there's a report that the engines and tracks of Lart have malfunctioned, halting the march again said Ibuki. Bad luck seemed to pile on top of bad timing. Just as the delay in the assembly of forces made the progress of the operation doubtful, there was a report from Chioda, whose skin was as glossy as Catherine's, that Lart was stuck blocking one of the main highways. Any estimate on when the movement will resume? asked Kent. The field commander says they'll try to get it sorted within one to two hours, reported Ibuki. Sigh. It was something they had anticipated from the start. But now the weakness of Lart, with its heavy armament and armor at the expense of mobility, was clearly revealed, causing Kent to let out a deep sigh. Despite the support of a salt armor accompanying Lart to assist in its movement, the staggering weight of 900 tons posed a significant obstacle. With the forces still struggling to assemble, things aren't looking good from the start. Anyway, Chioda, has Behemoth's course changed at all? asked Kent. No. Behemoth is still heading towards the former Canary Kingdom, towards the capital city of Brunz, replied Chioda. The enemies aimed at used by Parabem from Behemoth's trajectory. While it was still within the realm of prediction, it was likely the destruction of the densely populated capital city of Brunz, mass slaughter of civilians living there, and the neutralization of Parabem military bases scattered throughout the former Canary Kingdom territory due to volcanic ash. Allowing Behemoth to invade the former Canary Kingdom territory would undoubtedly result in unprecedented damage, and with the enemy's intentions now clear, Kent found it increasingly difficult to opt for a retreat as he had done before. Understood. Based on the latest information, it seems that some units of the 12th Division have given up on railway transport and switched to movement by river and roadway, said Kent with a hint of relief in response to Ibuki's report though the problems were far from over. Master, said Catherine, reports are coming in from the front lines about frequent issues caused by volcanic ash. Specifically, inquired Kent. Ah, along with communication disruptions, there are reports of electronic devices, vehicles, and weaponry malfunctioning due to volcanic ash intrusion, as well as health issues among the soldiers on site. Catherine listed. There's nothing we can do about communication disruptions. Dealing with electronic devices, vehicles, and weaponry malfunctions amidst volcanic ash is futile. As for the soldiers' health issues, weren't they equipped with NBC gear, MCU 2-P protective masks? Recalled Kent. Yes, initially, each soldier was issued with the MCU 2-P protective masks. 
and we're currently managing with N95 masks and goggles since the MCU2 slash P masks are nearing their usage limit, explained Catherine. I want to push for a short decisive battle for the sake of the soldiers, but if we rush into it, the forces won't gather in time, sighed Kent, empathizing with the soldiers toiling amidst volcanic ash on the front lines, knowing his options were limited. We can only hope to find a winning opportunity amidst these unfavorable conditions, concluded Kent, as approximately three hours passed agonizingly slowly for him and his comrades in a world dyed gray, where even the vegetation, soil, and sky have turned ashen, the behemoth, having refused evacuation orders from the Parabem army, crushed the fortress city of Ballard, leaving nothing but the corpses of its residents devoured by demons finally faces off against the Parabem army. Looks like we didn't make it in time after all. Kent murmured regretfully as he sat in the command room chair, gazing at the display showing the behemoth slowly advancing, its massive six legs gouging and collapsing the earth as it moved forward. Catherine, what's our current force? At present, the 5th Marine Division and the 4th Army Division have been deployed to the 2nd Defense Line, along with 30 assault armors, 20 cannon panzers, and 60 special mechanized infantry equipped with Taros and its derivatives. Additionally, we have around 20 river patrol boats and gunboats. Chioda, what are our odds of winning against the Behemoth and its entourage of demons with our current forces? If the number of surrounding demons is within our expected range, at best 25%. Even with reinforcements, it may only reach around 45%. So, what you're saying is that with our current situation, our chances of winning are slim to none, and at best, we can only delay. Sealing off our air power is really tough. Kent pondered, his head in his hands, as none of his relied upon forces like Rolt, train guns, or the 12th Division seemed to be reaching them. In four more units deployed at the second defense line, hold the line until reinforcements arrive, no matter what. Understood. And Catherine, concentrate our forces at the final defense line as well. Roger that. Immediately. At this point, Kent instructed the gathering of forces at the final defense line, laid out along the former border of the old Canary Kingdom, intensifying their preparations for the worst case scenario. Alert. Massive life readings moving away from the behemoth detected. A horde of demons is heading toward the second defense line, approximately 30,000, and increasing. We've compared the images of the advancing demons with our database, but found no matches. They seem to be a new species, no sightings of flying types. No flying types is a relief, but... A new species? Display it on the screen. Roger. At Kent's command, the operator displayed the image of the newly discovered demon captured by surveillance cameras deployed at the front line. A giant lizard? No. Could it be a mole? But what's with the cylindrical object on its back? Kent tilted his head as he watched the display showing a lizard-like demon about four to five meters long, covered in what seemed to be sturdy purple scales, with sharp teeth protruding from its mouth, and two cylindrical objects growing from its mid-back, dashing through the ash-covered ground like a lizard. Ceresia, just to be sure, have you seen these demons before? Wait, Adele, what's wrong? Turning away from the display, intending to ask Ceresia about the unfamiliar demon, Kent's attention was caught by Adele who was standing beside her, eyes widened in shock and trembling. This can't be true. Adele, what's wrong with Adele? Ceresia, without waiting for Adele's response to Kent's question, questioned her in a scolding tone, but Adele seemed oblivious to even that. These demons, they're the ones from my world. What? The enemy has made contact with the first defense line. Combat has begun. Just as Kent reacted to Adele's words, soil moles, waiting on both sides of the narrow river, effortlessly broke through the multiple layers of barbed wire fences installed 15 kilometers ahead of them by the Parabem army and entered the Mar area, where volcanic ash had accumulated and turned into mud by sprinkling water. Then, as the soil moles, hindered by the muddy ground, slowed down their movements, the next trap was triggered, the aerial bombs planted in the Mar area. MK.84 general purpose bombs carried and installed from the Sprout base. The base where Hoko and others caused trouble exploded simultaneously. Countless pillars of fire erupted like barriers, preventing the soil moles from entering, and blew away the soil moles stumbling in the Maya area without a trace. Moreover, 
after the calculated and installed Mk.84 general purpose bombs detonated, giant craters with a width of 15 meters and a depth of 11 meters were evenly formed, serving as makeshift trenches and successfully further delaying the soil mole's invasion speed and manipulating their invasion routes. Adele, tell me more about this. Ah, uh, ah, uh, okay, got it. In the brief moment between burying hundreds of soil moles with bombs and before the next trap was activated, Kent extracted information from Adele that was a mid-level demon called a cannon's dragon, which was commanded by the demon lord in my world. But I've never seen such a large number of them at once because they have a strong territorial consciousness. They should never gather in a group. Also, there seem to be some minor differences. We'll address those details later. What should we watch out for when fighting? Ah, uh, well, those cylindrical things on their backs, the types vary by individual. But they shoot magical bullets or fireballs. The range is usually about 200 to 300 meters. Otherwise, just watch out for body slams, front paw claws, bites, and tail attacks like regular soil moles. Adele involuntarily shrank back at Kent's stern command but quickly regained her composure and began to relay the information Kent sought from her own memory. Thank you, Adele. Catherine, transmit the current information to all units, and instruct them to maintain distance from the mole people and engage in combat, Kent ordered. Understood. Despite the slow transmission of information due to volcano cache interference, the information about the Moa people was gradually reaching the frontline units. Advancing was planned by the Parabellum forces. The mole people moved from the containment area to a minefield densely packed with M19 anti-tank mines. As the mole people stepped on the M19 anti-tank mines, they detonated one after another. Without attempting to halt their charge like fools, the pitiful mole people continued to march into the minefield, sacrificing their lives. However, the expressions on Kent and his companions' faces soured as they watched the scene. Chioda, what's the current enemy count? Ha, huh, currently. The estimated number of enemies far exceeds our expectations, reaching 60,000. Moreover, the number of enemies is still increasing. 60,000. That's a number our two divisions plus Alpha can't handle. The reason for Kent and his companions' grim expressions was that the number of mole people increasing outnumbered those they managed to kill. The enemy is breaching the minefield. They will breach the second defensive line in 20 seconds. After Kent muttered with a grimace resembling one who had swallowed a bitter pill. The operators began reporting one after another. All artillery units, commence bombardment. Impact in approximately 25 seconds. As the Moa people breached the second defensive line, they were met with a concentrated artillery barrage from all artillery units belonging to the two divisions, targeting a designated area set 12 kilometers from the Nile River. 3, 2, 1. Impact. Countless shells rained down upon the mole people who forcefully breached the minefield, courtesy of various artillery pieces such as the Marine Corps M777 155mm howitzer, RAP shells, 120mm mortars RT, Kamaz, and the Army's FH-70 155mm howitzer, Type 96 self-propelled 120mm mortar. Type 99 self-propelled 155mm howitzer, 203mm self-propelled howitzer, and MLRS. The enemy's attrition rate has exceeded 18% and is still rising. As the Moa people entered the second defensive line, they were obliterated by a barrage of shells akin to a meteor shower. Yet, undeterred, they continued to advance. Master, at this rate, I know, are reinforcements still not here? It'll be a little longer. Master, damn, we're in a tight spot like this. Kent and his companions, understanding that the relentless artillery barrage wouldn't last forever, grew more anxious with each passing moment. And finally, the moment arrived. Alert communication from the artillery unit. All rocket artillery is out of ammunition. They're reloading. Damn it. At this rate, their defensive line would be breached, as the assault from the rocket artillery, proficient in area suppression, ceased. Dire news arrived at Kent's location. The second defensive line has been breached. With the concentrated artillery barrage noticeably dwindling, the horde of mole people took advantage of the opportunity and surged forward. The artillery barrage from the 1st Armored Battalion, deployed in the third defensive line, has commenced. The horde of mole people, 
having bypassed the traps and counterattacks set by the artillery barrage, advanced towards the vanguard position, established as a delaying tactic before the Nile River, by the 1st Armoured Battalion of the Army's 4th Division. However, the 1st Armoured Battalion unleashed an overwhelming barrage to counter them. Leading the assault were 50 Type 10 tanks belonging to the 1st Armoured Battalion. With their 44 caliber 120mm smoothbore guns equipped with FCS featuring automatic detection and tracking capabilities, the Type 10 tanks delivered pinpoint accurate fire. Additionally, the 90 caliber 35mm automatic guns and 79 type anti ship slash anti tank guided missiles of the Type 89 armored fighting vehicles provided continuous support. While this managed to somewhat diminish the momentum of the Moa people's onslaught, it wasn't enough to halt their advance completely. Therefore, Additional countermeasures using new weapons such as assault armors and cannon panzers were implemented. All units, stay focused. This is a critical moment. The future of the assault armor depends on our performance here. Achieve results at all costs. Commence the attack. Understood. Accompanied by the commanding officer's rallying cry, a new wind swept through the battlefield as units equipped with assault armor undergoing trial operation showed remarkable prowess. This was because the assault armor, born from the fusion of magic and science, utilized prototype weapons such as the 30mm assault rifle, 57mm light machine gun, 88mm heavy machine gun, and 120mm sniper rifle, which were deployed in extremely limited numbers. In addition to the assault armor, the cannon panzer, carrying two Gore 8 Avengers and a 105mm howitzer, bravely advanced sweeping away the earthworms with a barrage from the Go-8 Avengers and horizontal fire from the 105mm howitzer. However, the momentum of the advancing earthworms remained relentless. This was primarily due to the fact that when gunfire was unleashed, volcanic ash in the vicinity was stirred up by the shockwaves and explosions from various projectiles, obscuring the approaching earthworms from view and causing a slight deviation in aim. In other words, there's nothing more wasteful than missing shots. With a vast number of earthworms covering the ground, even stray shots that missed their targets yielded some form of result. Enemy approaching further towards the 1st Armoured Battalion. The 1st Armoured Battalion and accompanying units deployed at the 3rd Interception Line have begun to retreat from their forward positions, considering the advancing speed of the earthworms. The division headquarters generals decided that further combat would be reckless, thus shifting tactics from frontline attrition to inner defense. Incidentally, frontline attrition and inner defense involve wearing down enemy forces on the front line, enticing them into the interior by temporarily retreating and launching a counterattack to ultimately annihilate them, a method of defensive strategy. Hence, the 1st Armoured Battalion and its accompanying units were ordered to retreat to the main camp across the Neryl River. We've received the retreat order. Relay it to all units from the command vehicle. All vehicles, retreat according to plan. Don't falter. 1st Platoon, Roger. Will support the retreat of friendly units. 2nd Platoon, Roger. Preparing to retreat. 3rd Platoon. Roger. Initiating retreat now. Upon receiving the retreat order, units deployed at the third interception line commenced a systematic retreat in the predetermined order while conducting suppressive fire. However, due to the repeated artillery bombardments stirring up volcanic ash, the earthworms were no longer visible. Thus, it became a blind fire situation while retreating with support from units deployed at the main camp. Fifteen minutes until the completion of the retreat of the 1st Armoured Battalion and accompanying units. If we cross the river, we can buy ourselves some time, as Kent voiced a sigh of relief while watching the units retreat across the two temporary bridges, an unexpected event unfolded. Huh? What's that? Earthworms appearing behind the retreating 1st Armoured Battalion. They've emerged from underground. The number of emerged earthworms is approximately 5,000. Still increasing. The retreat path of the 1st Armoured Battalion has been blocked. They're completely isolated, facing total annihilation at this rate. A group of earthworms that had silently tunneled underground suddenly appeared inside the defensive line. What's more, due to the unfortunate timing of the earthworms' emergence behind the retreating units, the 26 Type 10 tanks and 10 Type 89 armored combat vehicles of the 1st Armored Battalion, 
along with a platoon of infantry and twenty mechanized infantry, found themselves trapped and isolated between the advancing earthworms and those emerging from underground. Enemies behind us? This is bad. Halt the retreat. Halt the retreat. Halt the retreat. They're coming from the front too, you know? There's no way out. What should we do? We're surrounded. Damn it. Engage all vehicles. Engage. R. As the commanding tank of the coordinating unit attempted to rally the confused troops, it was struck by earthworm artillery in the rear, exploding into flames. Witnessing such a sight only added to the chaos among the isolated units. What? The captain's tank got hit. Wah. Enemy rounds penetrated the armor. Don't let the earthworms shoot. We'll be killed. Even if you say don't let them shoot, with this damn volcanic ash, we can't tell where the enemy is. Ooh just shoot anyway. If we shoot randomly, we'll hit our allies, from HQ of the first platoon. We're under enemy ambush and isolated. Urgently requesting reinforcements. Enemy attacks, mole artillery, are penetrating our rear armor. I repeat. Mole artillery is penetrating our rear armor. Even as Kent and his comrades in Parabem heard reports filled with chaos and fear from the isolated unit, they could only watch from their distant location. Adele, turning away from the display that depicted scenes too gruesome to bear, Kent addressed Adele. What is it? Despite being at close range, did these monsters have enough firepower to penetrate the Type 10 tank's rear armor? No, it's hard to say without a comparison. But at least their power wasn't this significant. I see. Then, could it be that these monsters are being assisted by the enemy? As Kent voiced his thoughts almost as a soliloquy, the operator chimed in, seemingly confirming his suspicions. Supreme Commander, it's urgent. Upon analyzing footage from the isolated unit, it's been determined that the moles aren't firing magical projectiles but rather spear-like objects. Dot that settles it. The enemy strikes back. Behind his expressionless mask, Kent concealed his fury, and returned his gaze to the display showing the front-line situation. There, they witnessed the 1st armored battalion, on the brink of annihilation due to the mole's pincer attack, along with the efforts of the Marine 5th Division and the Army 4th Division attempting to rescue them. However, Apart from the Marine 5th Division and the isolated units, the Army 4th Division struggled to hold back the moles emerging from underground at the Neraru River, focusing all their firepower to prevent their crossing. The moles that breached the 3rd interception line from underground have begun crossing the Neraru River. They've entered the minefield. The first to greet the moles reaching the Neraru River were two types of mines, land mines laid out by the 94-type amphibious mine laying system mounted on the cargo bed of amphibious vehicles. One type was a 45cm diameter, 40kg disc-shaped, bottom-set mine that leapt into the air with a splash, along with the moles it intercepted, while the other, a 65cm long, 45kg cylindrical, moored mine, launched into the air with a column of water as it began to swim across the Neraru River. Simultaneously, the Marine 5th Division and the Army 4th Division defending the 2nd Defense Line concentrated all available firepower to repel the mole's advance. Thus, the Neraru River continued to spout water columns resembling a porcupine due to detonating mines and the barrage of bullets and shells. T the enemy has crossed the Neraru River. However, despite such intense attacks attempting to cover the moles with sheer numbers, they succeeded in crossing the Neraru River, as if mocking the struggles of both divisions. Firing spears from their two cannons, they intensified their assault, aiming to break through the second defense line and bombard the Parabem forces. Had the 5th Division and the 4th Division said anything? Seeing his own forces falling into dire straits, Kent, unable to contain his restlessness, deliberately calmed himself as he inquired of the operator. Yes, until reinforcements arrive. They're determined to defend the second defense line at all costs and fulfill the Supreme Commander's orders. What about the isolated unit? They're still fighting. In the midst of despair with no hope of reinforcements, Kent watched the soldiers who refused to give up, burned into his memory, and then, in the next moment, the horde of moles approaching from the front of the 1st Armored Battalion vanished. What? Perplexed by what had happened, Kent watched as the mole horde disappeared once again. Furthermore, an enormous water column, unlike anything seen before, rose from the Neraru River, sweeping away the moles. What's happening? This explosion. Teetherel guns and Lart. Gustav, Dora, 
and other trains and LUTs have arrived within range and begun firing. In Kent's days, Catherine questioned the operator, receiving such words in response. And thus, Brabham's counterattack began from this point onward. Portions of the 12th Division have arrived at the second defence line, abandoning rail transport and transporting infantry by road. Around 40 T 80 U and T 90 tanks disembarked infantry, who immediately launched 9 M 119 reflex anti tank missiles from the 125 mm smoothbore guns instead of shells aimed at the moles emerging from tunnels. They succeeded in their destruction. Furthermore, as part of the tank descent, Infantry from the 12th Division that arrived at the 2nd Defence Line, infantrymen wielding RPO rocket launchers embarked and fired, incinerating the moles on the opposite bank. At the same time, 20 BMP-3 infantry fighting vehicles and 30 BTR-90 wheeled amphibious armoured personnel carriers descending the Neraru River began an amphibious assault to rescue the isolated Allied unit, firing the main armaments of 100mm low-pressure guns. 30mm machine guns, and coaxial PKT 7.62mm machine guns, and as the mechanized units that began the amphibious assault eliminated the moles assaulting the 1st Armored Battalion with 100mm low-pressure guns, 30mm machine guns, PKT 7.62mm machine guns, and RPKS 5.45mm light machine guns mounted on turret tops. Infantry disembarked from BMP-3 and BTR-90, deploying. Even those unfamiliar with military affairs recognize the AK-12, the latest model in the AK-47 lineage, and the RPK light machine gun equipped with a 75-round drum magazine. They used these to kill the moles near the 1st Armored Battalion, successfully rescuing them. We've rescued our allies. Requesting support for withdrawal, understood, 3rd Artillery Regiment. The heavy hitters are coming, be careful, the mechanized unit that rescued the survivors of the 1st Armored Battalion, consisting of 12 Type 10 tanks, 3 Type 89 armored combat vehicles, a squad of accompanying infantry, and 3 special mechanized infantry, requested artillery support for withdrawal. In response, the 2S7M 203mm self-propelled cannon, which had self-deployed behind the second defense line after abandoning rail transport, began artillery fire first, with over 1,000 units produced worldwide and actively used in various countries. This self-propelled cannon boasted a maximum range of 37 kilometers when using conventional shells, soft 40 shells, and a range of 47 to 55 kilometers when using RAP shells, rocket-assisted projectiles, making it among the longest-ranged field artillery. Additionally equipped with a pressurized NBC protection system, it could operate even in NBC contaminated environments. However, since the gunnery preparation had to be conducted Volume 04 Chapter 20, unable to achieve their tactical objectives, Purabem concluded their skirmish with the behemoth in a form reminiscent of a defeat by decision. They proceeded to redeploy all their units stationed at the second defense line to the Sprout base located behind the Nala River, aiming to regroup and reassess their strategy. Amidst this, the leadership of Purabem gathered in a chamber at the command headquarters, engaging in vigorous discussions to determine the future course of action. At present, the forces gathered at Sprout base include the 12th Army Division, along with the 5th Marine Division and the 4th Army Division, both of which suffered significant losses in the previous battle. Additionally, there are 40 assault armors, 25 cannon panzers, and 52 special mechanized infantry, along with the base's defense units and the ground battleship Laerte. Furthermore, 13 railway guns, including Gustav and Dora, are deployed 15 kilometers behind the base, reported. It's a decent assembly, but with this level of force, I don't feel confident about winning yet, Your Excellency. In that case, perhaps we should consider a complete retreat from the former Canary Kingdom territory. Ah. Uh. Kent interjected with a sigh as Catherine read out the contents of the report, showing his discontent with the situation. In response, one of the generals present in the meeting room made a thoughtless remark, drawing sharp and cold glares from the others, leaving him sweating profusely and regretting his words. Well, retreating is an option, but considering there's no way to evacuate all civilians from the former Canary Kingdom territory, we can't simply withdraw, Kent said, 
providing a lifeline to the struggling man. Yes, sir, the man, desperately clinging to Kent's lifeline, let out a relieved laugh, nodded several times, and refrained from speaking for the rest of the meeting, avoiding eye contact with Catherine and Chioda. Now, let's get back on track. We have only three hours left until Behemoth and Mole attack Sprout Base. We need to come up with a last-minute plan to turn the tide. Any good ideas? Kent inquired, scanning the assembled generals. Well, it's not like a brilliant idea will suddenly come up. Kent glanced around at the generals, but they all remained silent. Master, we've received a secure video communication from Karen at the governor's office in Barlins, an aide announced. Got it. Connect me to the other room. Everyone, sorry, but I'll be stepping out for a bit. Kent said, excusing himself from the meeting. Amidst the somber atmosphere enveloping the meeting room, a secret video communication from Karen, stationed as an envoy in the governor's office in Barlins, reached Kent. Kent left the meeting to answer the video call, informing the generals and moving to an adjacent room where he activated the communication button. Hello? Can you hear me? Kent asked. Yes, I can see and hear you clearly. What's the situation? Karen replied. It's a very difficult situation, Kent admitted. I see, Karen. On the other side of the display, looked awkwardly downcast at Kent's response. Anyway, Karen, there's a bit of an issue aside from Behemoth. We need someone with knowledge of the Canary Kingdom's territory to resolve it. So, sorry to ask, but could you return to Parabem's mainland immediately? Kent requested. Oh, you're such a... That consideration as a husband and, above all, as a woman, is heartwarming. But personally, I'd be happier if my beloved husband came to pick me up in person. So, I'll wait here until you do, Karen replied. Although Kent had voiced a false pretext, intending to evacuate Karen from the dangerous Barlins first, Karen saw through his intentions and politely declined with a wry smile. Are you sure? Kent asked. Yes, I'm sure. It's just not like me to leave everyone behind and run away alone. Karen replied, understood. Then I'll definitely come to pick you up. So, please wait for me, Kent promised. Yes, I'll be waiting. But don't keep me waiting too long, Karen said. Got it, bye for now. Oh, before I forget. Once things settle down, let's go somewhere together, just the two of us. Like when we first met, Karen suggested. Sure, let's do that. I'm looking forward to it, Kent agreed. Hee <laughs> hee, me too. Well then, bye for now. Karen said with a cheerful smile before ending the video call. Okay, time to go back, Kent said to himself, giving himself a firm pat on the cheek to psych himself up before returning to the meeting room. So, Master, shall we proceed with a plan to continue interception using our regular forces? Catherine asked. In the end, it seemed they had no choice but to rely on this less promising method. Although Kent had confidently declared that he would definitely go to pick up Karen with flair. In reality, no brilliant ideas emerged during the meeting. Despite their apprehensions, they opted for a less than ideal but better strategy of continuing interception with their regular forces. All right, understood. Let's go with it. Ah, uh, um, um, may I speak? Someone suddenly interrupted as Kent was about to nod in agreement to Catherine's final confirmation. Just as Kent was about to nod in response to Catherine's last confirmation. A figure sitting in a corner of the meeting room suddenly stood up, causing a commotion and drawing everyone's attention. Who are you? I don't recognize you. What's your affiliation? Catherine inquired, narrowing her eyes suspiciously at the person who spoke up. Why yes, I am 2nd Lieutenant Eunice Florence of the 2nd Technical Department. W wait, Eunice, stop it. It's not good. Ignoring her colleague's cautionary advice. The female soldier who identified herself as 2nd Lieutenant Florence nervously but firmly responded to Catherine's intimidating question. Um, today, as acting head of the 2nd Technical Department, both I, Technical 2nd Lieutenant Lumere Conley, have come here together. Even though she stumbled over her words, Lieutenant Florence, with an air of intimidation, responded to Catherine's question while her colleague tried to dissuade her not looking away from Catherine's piercing gaze. Is there something you want to say? Why you, stop it, Eunice, don't reveal my name. Furthermore, dragging along her colleague, Ensign Conley, and, you wanted permission to speak. Do you understand that this is before His Excellency, the Supreme Commander? Why yes, I understand. Then did you think you, such as you are, 
would be granted permission to speak? Um, well, I I silence you, Amir Ensign, think you can speak so lightly in this setting. Eek, I am terribly sorry. I didn't mean to. Receiving Catherine's reprimand, Ensign Florence bowed while streams of cold sweat began to flow down her face. Um, you said your name is Ensign Florence. Permission to speak granted. Go ahead. Your Excellency. Unexpectedly. Despite the hiccup that seemed to have been taken care of by Catherine, Kent suddenly granted Ensign Florence permission to speak. Is it alright? Allowing someone like that to speak? There must be some reason for it. Besides, letting her speak won't cost us anything. Well, if it's a trivial matter, we'll leave it to Catherine. Understood. Ensign Florence, His Excellency has granted permission, speak. Why yes. Having already given up hope, Ensign Florence, upon receiving permission to speak, raised her head and desperately voiced her thoughts. W what I want to say is, why not repurpose the special assault armor's magic reactor into pseudo MA shells? Is that even possible? W well, if we deliberately breach the critical point of the special assault armor's large magic reactor, it is possible to induce a large-scale explosion. Directly addressed by Kent, Ensign Florence, even more flustered, spun her words while her face turned red with nervousness. Ensign Florence, I have one question for you. How much magical runaway can be induced by deliberately breaching the critical point of a large magic reactor? Moreover, isn't the concept of M.A. shells simply applying the theory of magical runaway, not the magical runaway itself causing the disappearance of matter? Why yes, that is the problem. But we won't know until we actually breach the critical point of the magic reactor. Since there is no precedent, that's not convincing. Although the conference room was slightly stirred by Ensign Florence's proposal, it quickly fell silent as Ensign Florence couldn't provide a clear answer to Catherine's question. Well, if it can cause a massive explosion without necessarily causing matter to disappear, it might work. However, Kent's words, uttered quietly amidst the silence of the conference room, drew everyone's attention. Your Excellency, don't you remember, Catherine, about when we tried to build Sprout Base? About building Sprout Base. Yeah, what was underground at the originally planned site for Sprout Base? Sprout Base. Construction. Underground. Ah, the underground lake. Thanks to Kent's words, Catherine recalled events and things long forgotten. Her eyes widening in surprise. Yeah, that's right. Because there was a huge underground lake. We specifically avoided it and built Sprout Base elsewhere. Let's make use of that. Could it be? You intend to blow up the base with a magic reactor explosion and drop the behemoth into the underground lake? Exactly. Since there's an underground lake, around where Sprout Base is located, if we destroy the underground facilities of the base with a magic reactor explosion when the behemoth comes directly above the base, the behemoth will fall underground, and then the vast amount of water from the underground lake will flow in. That way, we can prevent an eruption. And since we're not using a nuclear weapon, there's no worry about contaminating the underground lake or aquifers with radiation. B but, is that plan really going to work so well? Chioda, which has a higher chance of success, continuing to intercept with conventional forces or sinking the behemoth into the water with a magic reactor explosion. It's a slight difference, but I would say the latter. Then it's settled. Kent settled Catherine's doubts with Chioda's statement slamming the table and raising his voice. Everyone, have you heard? We'll now proceed to exterminate the behemoth using a composite plan combining Ensign Florence's proposal and mine. Understood. With Kent's declaration, the generals all stood up simultaneously and saluted. Each went out of the room to fulfill their respective duties. Ensign Florence. Um. Why yes. What is it? Seeing Ensign Florence staring blankly, Kent called out to her. I'll temporarily grant you the rank of colonel. So take responsibility as the proposer and turn the special assault armor's magic reactor into a proper bomb. A eh? me. A colonel? Can't do it? You um, I I'll do it. I'll do my best. Good. Ibuki. Why yes, what is it? I'm counting on you to support her. Understood. Kent ordered Ibuki, who remained in the conference room, to back up Henson Florence, now Colonel Florence. Then, he himself left the conference room with Catherine and Chioda to take command of the whole operation. Despite it being midday, 
The Sprout base was engulfed in darkness due to the relentless volcanic ash fall, with only a handful of personnel remaining after the evacuation of fleeing refugees, non-combatants, and the majority of assembled forces. Yet, amidst this gloom, lights blazed brightly as if drawn to them, revealing the looming presence of the behemoth before the Sprout base. Alert, behemoth has breached the first line of defense. It's within the range of the train cannons and Rati, echoed the voice of the operator in the operations command room, notifying the arrival of the behemoth's assault. It's here. What about the moles and other monsters? inquired Kent, his voice cutting through the tension in the command room. At present, we haven't been able to confirm their presence, replied the operator. Gone, are they? Where could they have disappeared to? Well, it matters not. If they're not here, it works in our favor. But, Remain vigilant, commence the attack, commanded Kent, despite his puzzlement over the absence of the moles that had so effectively manipulated the Paribam army in previous battles. In an instant, thirteen train cannons and Rati's main gun unleashed their firepower simultaneously. With a deafening roar, eighty centimeters and twenty-eight centimeters shells, launched into the ash-filled sky, found their target in the behemoth's head after seconds of flight with six to seven large caliber shells hitting their mark. However, despite the Parabem army's aim to avoid triggering the volcano's eruption by targeting the behemoth's head, the damage inflicted by the bombardment was negligible, and as the smoke from the explosions cleared, the behemoth's eyes seemed to glare angrily. Roar. No, it was unmistakably enraged. If only it could forget its anger. Ibuki. What's the status of Colonel Florence's technical team? Kent inquired, his gaze fixed on the display showing the behemoth, which had slightly increased its pace. Fortunately, the magic reactors of the special assault armor were transported to the Sprout bases underground instead of the mainland, specifically to the former outpost, now doubling base. Colonel Florence and the other technicians are also on site. All that's left is to time the breakthrough of the magic reactors, Ibuki replied. Understood. What about the backup plan, Catherine? At present, approximately 50% of the explosives have been set up in the underground facility. We will ensure their completion before the behemoth reaches the base, Catherine reported. Good. Then, all we can do is wait. Kent said as he and his team watched the battlefield from the operations command room, quietly awaiting the moment when all preparations would be in place. What? A group of moles has emerged from the behemoth's volcano. The number of moles is approximately 20,000. What? The moles have split into groups of tens and are individually heading towards the sprout base. Just as the distance between the sprout base and the behemoth fell below 5 kilometers, a swarm of moles emerged from the volcano on the behemoth's back. Furthermore, whether they had learned from the previous battle or not, the moles had formed small groups, maintaining a certain distance between their clusters as they approached the sprout base. For monsters, they seemed unusually intelligent. Kent felt a slight sense of admiration mixed with unease at the unnaturally coordinated actions of the mole men. It's time, Colonel Florence and the engineers, retreat. Yes, understood, as the behemoth and mole men drew near, retreat orders were issued to Colonel Florence and the engineers who had been diligently carrying out their respective duties underground at the Sprout base. Now then, are you all ready? Ready. And so, in response to the retreat order, Haruto Kairishima, a former lieutenant, and his subordinates, who had been assigned to provide support to the Allies, climbed aboard the STRV.103 D tanks. Having received only three hours of training, Haruto, who was reluctantly assigned as the leader, manned the STRV.103 D equipped with a 105mm rifle gun fixed directly onto its wedge shaped hull. With its reduced height and frontal profile achieved through the absence of a turret and the inclusion of an autoloader, the STRV.103 D was an ideal tank for engaging the enemy. However, despite being a legitimate tank, its unique design, lacking a turret, often led it to be mistaken for a tank destroyer, self propelled gun or assault gun. All tanks, prepare to fire, fire away. Haruto, commanding from the STRV.103 D, aimed the L-74 105mm rifle gun through the sight, giving attack orders to all ten tanks at his disposal. All tanks, 
reverse fire while withdrawing. Understood. As shells were fired from the 10L74 105mm rifle guns, blowing away the mole men. Haruto and his team utilized the STRV.103D's ability to retreat at nearly the same speed as advancing, while providing suppressive fire with two KSP.58 7.62mm machine guns. Incidentally, controlling the tank's movement during retreat fell to the communications officer doubling as the rear-facing co-driver seated in the rear driver's seat. Loading complete, Suzumiya. Halt. Understood. With the shells loaded by the autoloader, Haruto signaled Suzumiya, the junior officer in the rear driver's seat, to stop. Take this. As the STRV.103D came to a halt and the vehicle's shaking subsided, Haruto peered through the sight once again, firing the gun and blowing away more mole men. You're quite skilled, Kent, observing Haruto and his team's efforts from the command room, unexpectedly murmured. Indeed, Chio who had hoped to dispose of Haruto and his team in this battle, felt a slight frustration at her plan failing. Confirm the evacuation of all units from the Sprout base, the behemoth is directly above the Sprout base. Fifteen minutes after Haruto and his team managed to fulfill their role as rear guard and successfully evade the mole men's pursuit, the behemoth finally arrived directly above the Sprout base. However, at this point, the magical reactor had not yet reached its critical point. Master. Shall we proceed to the backup plan? No, wait. How many minutes until the magical reactor reaches criticality? Approximately five minutes. Then, it's fine. Let's wait a bit longer. Understood. Upon hearing the operator's response, Kent ordered Chio to stand by to ensure everything was prepared, enduring the agonizingly slow passage of time. However, the waiting time allowed Kent and his team to witness the Sprout base being ruthlessly ravaged by the behemoth much to their frustration. 3, 2, 1, 0. The magical reactor has reached criticality, and then, five minutes later, the moment Kent and his team had been waiting for arrived. The magical reactor of the special assault armor breached its critical point, triggering a massive explosion comparable to a nuclear blast underground at the Sprout base. As a result, the surrounding area was rocked by tremors akin to a massive earthquake. Furthermore, with the underground facilities of the Sprout base completely obliterated, the surface began to collapse. The behemoth, intending to destroy the base utterly and depart unscathed, was ensnared by the collapsing earth, dragged into a massive vertical pit. Unfortunately for the behemoth, it fell into the pit upside down from its hind legs, rendering it unable to rise again. Thus, at this point, the behemoth was already incapacitated. However, to add insult to injury, the cold waters of an underground lake rushed into the pit like a torrent upon the collapsed behemoth. As a result of the behemoth's contact with both the magma flowing from the volcano, its own weapon, and the water from the underground lake, a massive steam explosion occurred, tearing the behemoth apart into smithereens. It's over. Kent, quietly witnessing the anticlimactic demise of their formidable foe, closed his eyes and exhaled deeply. Volume 04 Chapter 21 Despite paying numerous precious sacrifices, Brabham succeeded in the destruction of the three entities, Jizz, Leviathan, and Behemoth. However, due to the magnitude of the damage incurred, a temporary suspension of the Vermilion operation was decided. Replenishing the lost forces became the top priority, and the resumption of the operation was postponed until the depleted forces returned to at least their previous scale. As a result, with Brabham halting its offensive and the Ilsa's magic empire lacking the surplus forces necessary to launch an offensive, the war between the two nations naturally settled into a stalemate, with fronts across various regions. A few days of respite were about to descend upon the bloody battlefield. So, the imperial subcapital Gloria fell? Ha! Although the expedition fleet suffered significant damage to the battleship group conducting naval gunfire due to combat with the Leviathans, there were no other casualties. Marine Divisions 1, 2, and 3, after preparing for landing, landed in Gloria under the firepower support of vessels such as the Eyes, Hyuga, obsolete battleships, LSMR-401 class, and aircraft. They merged with the somewhat isolated 75th Ranger Regiment and completely seized Gloria. Seated in the office chair, Kent flipped through the report as he questioned, while Catherine 
glancing at the report in her hand, responded. While Kent and others were locked in combat with the behemoths, the expedition fleet that eliminated the Leviathans returned to Gloria, which had temporarily retreated for evacuation, and resumed the campaign for its conquest. As the returning expedition fleet assumed their positions, dozens of assault amphibious vehicles docked along Gloria's coast were flooded with seawater, and Lukak 1 class air cushion landing craft and AF 7A1 amphibious assault vehicles stood on board simultaneously launched, racing across the sea alongside tank landing ships carrying three M182 Abrams each and landing craft filled with infantry, they bypassed the remnants of Gloria's fortifications, gates, and coastal fortresses, which the 75th Ranger Regiment had secured, and landed on the coast to expand their foothold. Meanwhile, firepower support was provided to the landing forces, however, due to the significant losses suffered by the battleship group, which primarily engaged in direct confrontations with the Leviathans, the firepower support shifted mainly to the aircraft from the expedition fleet including the Eyes and Hyuga of the 1st Independent Strike Fleet that joined Midway, as well as the LSMR-401 class, heavily laden with MK.105 dual-mount rocket launchers utilizing automatic loading and power drive mechanisms, which were not incorporated into the special mission fleet due to issues of speed and armament. Additionally, on the first day of the landing, there were reports of civilians remaining in the urban areas turning into militias and launching attacks. Hence, the expedition fleet headquarters authorized indiscriminate shelling of the urban areas. As a result, the firepower support conducted by the expedition fleet resembled the Iron Storm reminiscent of what the United States did during the Battle of Okinawa. No, it was even more intense. Despite enduring such intense firepower support, the Marine Divisions, comprising three divisions, expanded the footholds secured by the 75th Ranger Regiment, ruthlessly crushing enemy combatants engaging in guerrilla warfare in the urban areas with overwhelming firepower and forces. Furthermore, they systematically executed zombie soldiers intoxicated with drugs using expanding bullets specially distributed to the infantry. Thus, the three Marine Divisions swiftly conquered the entirety of Gloria covering vast areas in a mere eight hours without suffering any significant losses, making the initial struggle on the first day of the operation seem like a lie. What are the casualties for the expedition fleet? In total, we have 18 ships severely damaged, 19 moderately damaged, 22 lightly damaged, and 28 sunk. Fortunately, most of the sunken vessels were destroyers or light cruisers. However, although the heavy cruisers and battleships didn't sink, they all suffered significant damage, and it may take some time for them to return to the front lines, if at all. Also, among the three submarines of the 7th Submarine Squadron, which encountered the Leviathans first, the survival of Virginia was confirmed on the seabed at a depth of 230 meters, and all crew members were rescued using deep submergence rescue vehicles, DSRVs, and personnel transfer capsules, PTCs. I see. That's good to hear. However, with the expedition fleet sustaining such losses, it might affect the next campaign to capture the Imperial capital. That's likely. Currently, emergency repairs are being carried out on the damaged vessels by construction ships, but we've received reports that particularly heavily damaged vessels, including the Kairoshima and others, require comprehensive repairs in well-equipped docks. In other words, Returning them to the homeland for full repairs is necessary for them to return to the front lines. Returning damaged ships to the mainland would incur additional downtime, prolonging their return to service. Alright, I'll go to Gloria and summon factories and docks. That way, we can expedite the return of damaged ships without the need to transport them back to the mainland and save time on moving troops to the war zone. Master, while I think that's a good idea, as you know. It hasn't been long since Gloria was captured. So, even if you decide to execute it, please wait until the security situation stabilizes, despite Catherine's suggestion to consider safety concerns and wait. Ultimately, shortly after this conversation, Kent, along with Catherine, headed to Gloria, traversing through airplanes, and summoned factories, docks, and supplies. In just a few hours after the end of the battle, a major naval base was erected in the occupied territory, significantly expediting the return of damaged ships to the front lines. 
after completing the summoning in Gloria and returning to the mainland, Kent, during a break, conducted a check on his own abilities. Summoning of weapons. Weapons manufactured or developed until 2015 are summonable. Summonable quantity and unit composition. Current level, 72. Infantry, 500,000 personnel. Artillery, 65,000 units. Vehicles, 65,000 units. Aircraft, 40,000 units. Warships, 25,000 units. Personnel required to operate artillery, vehicles, aircraft, warships, etc., are summoned together with these weapons. Rear support personnel, engineers, maintenance personnel, communication personnel, supply personnel, medical personnel, etc., are not included in the infantry and can be summoned separately. Currently, the number of rear support personnel that can be summoned is up to the scale of the total army. There are no restrictions on summoning heavy weapons and firearms within the range that infantry can operate. Help. Attention to abilities. Summoning is possible even without using the menu screen, through voice or thought. Once summoned, weapons, resources, and facilities can be dismissed, but people, soldiers, cannot be dismissed. It is not possible to erase the corpses of deceased soldiers. Also, the same person who died cannot be summoned again. Summoning abilities cannot be used during combat. Active self-defense combat is now possible for rear support personnel. Notice. By killing Triperota Masahito, I acquired a new ability. Benefits, Mental Strengthening, Strong, Physical Strengthening, Strong, Common Language Average Luck, Abilities, Complete Healing Ability, Can Heal Any Illness or Injury as Long as Their Target Is Not Deceased. This does not affect the user. Endurance, Stamina Increases to 10 times its current level, Can Subdue Those With Whom One Has Had Intimate Relations, New appraisal I can discern the value and abilities of various objects. I've defeated quite a number of enemies, but my leveling up speed seems to have slowed down. Well, with the significantly increased limit on summonable infantry and weaponry, it shouldn't pose a problem. So, what's this about killing Otama Masahito? Ah, it's about that migrant who sought asylum in Gloria. I remember seeing a report on this. Third eradication target report. The following information was obtained from an operative who protected the target seeking asylum. His name was Ota Masahito, the third eradication target, familiar with Mu Torchi Rinya, the first target. They were both summoned to this world through the Empire's summoning ritual. After being summoned, he agreed to become a subordinate of the Empire in exchange for the rewards offered. The third eradication target possessed creative abilities and was involved in the development of new imperial weapons. He developed magical weapons and automatons, among other things. However, as the war situation worsened, his position became precarious, and due to harassment and betrayal from the first target, whose personality had changed since before, he decided to defect from the Empire. He hoped to defect to our country but died before he could. The remains of the third eradication target were completely incinerated on site and the ashes mixed with concrete and dumped into the deep sea. This guy seems to have been through quite a tragic ordeal. Knock knock excuse me, master. It's almost time for the meeting, so I've come to fetch you. Ah, uh, why yeah, understood. I'll be there soon. Responding to Catherine's call from outside the door, Kent hastily placed the report he was reading on his desk and shivered. Then. He stood up and accepted the coat handed to him respectfully by Raina and Lena, who were standing behind him. After putting on the coat handed to him and adjusting his attire, Kent stroked Tell's head as if to comfort him, who had crawled out from under the desk, and then headed towards Catherine waiting in the corridor. As the meeting concluded, focusing mainly on the final report of the damages suffered by Paribem, and the discussion regarding the deployment of the newly produced weapons and reinforcements summoned by Kent, the members gathered in the meeting room were about to leave their seats. Ah, everyone, please wait a moment. Kent interjected. The members, who were about to get up from their seats, puzzled by Kent's call, sat back down with questioning expressions. And as he looked around at the faces of the members who had sat back down, Kent, who had called for the halt, opened his mouth with a heavy tone. We have an issue akin to internal factions within the military that needs to be resolved, given the agenda regarding the deployment of forces. A, eh? the one who wore the most bitter expression among the faces in the meeting room at Kent's words was Catherine. 
So, yeah, from what I've heard, there have been numerous problems arising due to differences in race, nationality, religion, and ideology, etc. Catherine, how are things on that front? Ah, uh, why yes, about that, as per your instructions, Master. We have been trying to unify the military personnel formations as much as possible to address this issue. However, it is also a fact that problems have risen anew due to the ease of forming factions as a result of this unification. Well, I anticipated such problems from the outset, but more than anything, I was prepared for issues to arise inevitably upon incorporating humans from this world as well as beastmen and demons into the military. However, well, I've also been hearing about some glaring issues, so I can't just ignore them. Receiving a warning-filled glance from Kent, Catherine broke into a cold sweat because there was too much truth in what Kent was implying. Specifically, it was about the numerous problems that had arisen from the intense internal struggles, also known as the struggle for favor, within Parabim. She never imagined that the numerous problems stemming from the fierce internal struggles within Parabim would reach Kent's ears. At this point, we're still in the observation phase, but if these issues continue to escalate and become more apparent, we'll have to take action. Everyone, keep that in mind. Understood. With Kent driving the point home, the members saluted before leaving the meeting room. With this, will the underlying issues simmer down a bit? Come to think of it, I need to address this with Serizia too. It seems that the cult group consisting mainly of prisoners, the captured nuns, on prison island is expanding. While thinking about such matters, Kent, accompanied by Chioda, who wore an awkward expression, began to move towards a certain location. In the solemn atmosphere permeating the room, the voice of the judge reading out the charges echoed resoundingly. Indeed, at this moment, a court martial was underway in this room. Defendant Haruto Kairishima, former first lieutenant, stands accused of multiple instances of insubordination and acting independently of orders in this case, as well as assaulting Sprout Base with his subordinates and hijacking a transport plane for personal purposes. Any objections? None. Stripped of his guard status by Catherine, Haruto sat in the defendant's seat at the court-martial, now just a mere lieutenant. Any final words? Well, just one. Facing the judge's gaze from the elevated podium. Haruto responded firmly, as the origin of this incident stems from my own dereliction of duty, I believe it is only fair for me to bear all suspicions and charges directed at Lieutenant Commander Ijazuko Tobuki and 2nd Lieutenant Asahina Akari. Furthermore, I explicitly state that all actions of my subordinates were carried out under my orders, absolving them of any responsibility. You are aware of the consequences of your words aren't you? I am fully aware. The gazes of the judge, speaking from the highest podium, and Haruto at the defendant's seat, locked in a silent confrontation. Very well. Haruto Kairishima will assume all suspicions and charges against Lieutenant Commander Ijazuko Tobuki and 2nd Lieutenant Asahina Akari. Wait, hold on. Interrupting the judge's words and bursting into the room from the adjacent waiting area were Lieutenant Commander Ijazuko Tobuki and 2nd Lieutenant Asahina Akari, who were to face the court-martial. After Haruto, Captain, what are you saying on your own? Yeah, Haruto, we don't want that. You two, behave. Uck, don't resist. Come on, let go. Captain. The two desperately shouted at Haruto until they were restrained by military police and dragged back to the waiting room. However, Haruto never once looked at the two. Is this acceptable? Proceed. After a moment of hesitation at the question regarding the two, Haruto closed his eyes briefly and then urged the judge to continue with the trial. Understood. Then I shall deliver the verdict. Haruto Kairishima is sentenced to death for insubordination. Court adjourned. With a swift motion of the judge's hand, the small gavel came down, sealing Haruto's fate with a death sentence. Let's go. And thus, escorted by the military police, Haruto left the courtroom. Stay put. What's going on? As they rounded a corner leading to a long straight hallway and the exit of the courthouse, Haruto, still bewildered, had his handcuffs suddenly removed by the accompanying military police. Keep moving, there's a guard waiting for you outside. Got it. With no apparent answers forthcoming to his questions, Haruto followed the instructions of the military police, carrying his doubts with him, and then, as they followed the hallway and turned the corner as instructed. So, that's how it is. 
It's been a while since we last met directly. Yes, it has, Your Excellency, the Supreme Leader. As Haruto caught sight of Kent sitting alone on a chair placed midway down the straight hallway past the corner, he understood all of the mysterious actions of the military police without casualties. If only they hadn't occurred, I could have defended our position a bit more, Kent, breaking the tension palpable in the air, lamented as if filled with regret. No, Your Excellency, it's not something you should worry about. If I had handled things a little more skillfully, it would have been better. Haruto responded, sensing Kent's significant remorse over losing valuable subordinates due to his unilateral actions. Ah, uh, yes, remember to thank the vice-captain. Kent abruptly changed the subject. If she hadn't tampered with the base's communication equipment to broadcast your communications on all frequencies, the rescue of Chioda wouldn't have been possible, and we wouldn't have received pleas for clemency or requests for leniency from other soldiers who overheard your communications. Although, ultimately, you ended up with a death sentence due to bearing the blame for others' crimes. Kent muttered to himself, lamenting how things could have just resulted in a demotion due to balancing merits and demerits. Oh, and. Did Assistant President Chioda rush to the scene? Haruto nodded in understanding as a long-standing question dissolved. Oops, it's about time. After exchanging discussions regarding the treatment of Princess Remina's Coltrane Gerelius, as well as the engagement between her and Haruto, Kent checked the time and stood up. I apologize for not being able to spend more time, he said as he rose. No, it was an honor to speak with you one last time, Haruto replied respectfully. Well, leave the rest to me. I'll take care of the snake people's affairs properly, Kent said. Thank you very much, Haruto replied, bowing his head instead of saluting. Oh, before I forget, take this. Just be sure to use it wisely, Kent handed over something familiar, accompanied by cryptic words, leaving Haruto bewildered but nodding in agreement. Well then, farewell. Oh, by the way, Lieutenant Commander Kotobuki Ishizu and 2nd Lieutenant Suzumi Iwakari will serve as guards on Prison Island for two months. As punishment for their involvement in this matter, Kent announced casually. Eh? Your Excellency, is that? Haruto began, astonished. Just your last two months. I made sure you could spend them without regrets. My own battlefield tastes like blood, while others tastes like honey. Kent sang jovially walking away. Wait, Your Excellency? Your Excellency? Haruto called out in disbelief, as Haruto watched Kent, emitting an unmistakably cheerful tone, disappear, he resignedly passed through the courthouse exit, only to find there his familiar former subordinates and superiors awaiting him.